Section 60 of Remarks. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Remarks by Bill Nye. Section 60. Reverend Mr. Hallelujah's Hoss. There are a good many difficult things to ride, I find beside the bicycle and the bucking Mexican plug. Those who have tried to mount and successfully ride a wheelbarrow in the darkness of the stilly night will agree with me. You come on a wheelbarrow suddenly, when it is in a brown study, and you undertake to straddle it, so to speak, and all at once you find the wheelbarrow on top. I may say, I think safely, that the wheelbarrow is, as a rule, phlegmatic and cool, but when a total stranger startles it, it spreads desolation and destruction on every hand. This is also true of the perambulator or baby carriage. I undertook to evade a child's phaeton three years ago last spring, as it stood in the entrance to a hall in Main Street. The child was not injured, because it was not in the carriage at the time, but I was not so fortunate. I pulled pieces of perambulator out of myself for two weeks with the hand that was not disabled. How a sedentary man could fall through a child's carriage in such a manner as to stab himself with the awning and knock every spoke out of three wheels is still a mystery to me. But I did it. I can show you the doctor's bill now. The other day, however, I discovered a new style of riding animal. The Reverend Mr. Hallelujah was at the depot when I arrived, and was evidently waiting for the same Chicago train that I was in search of. Reverend Mr. Hallelujah had put his valise down near an ordinary baggage truck, which leaned up against the wall of the station building. He strolled along the platform for a few moments, communing with himself and agitating his mind over the subject of divine retribution, and then he went up and leaned against the truck. Finally, he somehow got his arms under the handles of the truck as it stood up between his back and the wall. He still continued to think of the plan of divine retribution, and you could have seen his lips move had you been there. Pretty soon some young ladies came along, rosy in the winter air, beautiful beyond compare, frosty crystals in their hair, smiled they on the preacher there. He returned the smile and bowed low. As he did so, as near as I can figure out, he stepped back on the iron edge of the truck that the baggage man generally jabs under the rim of an iron-bound sample trunk when he goes to load it. Anyhow, a uh, Mr. Hallelujah's feet flew toward next spring. The truck started across the platform with him and spilled him over the edge of the track ten feet below. So rapid was the movement that the eye with difficulty followed his evolutions. His valise was carried onward by the same wild avalanche and busted open before it struck the track below. I was surprised to see some of the articles that shot forth in the broad light of day. Among the rest there was a brand-fired new set of ready-made teeth to be used in case of accident. Up to that moment, I didn't know that Mr. Hallelujah used the common tooth of commerce. These teeth slipped out of the valise with a Sabbath smile and vulcanized rubber gums. In striking the iron track below, the everyday set which Mr. Reverend Hallelujah had in use became loosened and smiled across the road bed and right-of-way at the brand-fired new array of incisored cuspids, bicuspids, and molars that flew out of the valise. Mr. Hallelujah got up and tried to look merry, but he could not smile without his teeth. The back seams of his new market coat were more successful, however. Mr. Hallelujah's wardrobe and a small boy were the only objects that dared to smile. Somnambulism and Crime A recent article in the London Post on the subject of somnambulism calls to my mind several little incidents with somnambulistic tendencies in my own experience. The subject has, indeed, attracted my attention for some years, and it has afforded me great pleasure to investigate it carefully. Regarding the causes of dreams and somnambulism, there are many theories, all of which are more or less untenable. My own idea, given of course in a plain, crude way, is that thoughts originate on the inside of the brain, and then go at once to the surface where they have their photographs taken with the understanding that the negatives are to be preserved. In this way, the thought may afterwards be duplicated back to the thinker in the form of a dream, and if the impulse be strong enough, muscular action and somnambulism may result. 
On the banks of Bitter Creek, some years ago, lived an open-mouthed man who had risen from affluence by his unaided effort until he was entirely free from any encumbrance in the way of property. His mind dwelt on this matter a great deal during the day. Thoughts of manual labor flitted through his mind but were cast aside as impractical. Then other means of acquiring property suggested themselves. These thoughts were photographed on the delicate negative of the brain, where it is a rule to preserve all negatives. At night, these thoughts were reversed within the think resort, if I may be allowed that term, and muscular action resulted. Yielding at last to the great desire for possessions and property, the somnambulist groped his way to the corral of a total stranger, and, selecting a choice mule, with great dewy eyes and real camel's hair tail, he fled. On and on he pressed toward the dark, uncertain west, till at last rosy morn clomb the low, outlying hills, and glided the gray outlines of the sagebrush. The coyote slunk back to his home, but the somnambulist did not. He awoke as day dawned, and, when he found himself astride the mule of another, a slight shudder passed the entire length of his frame. He then fully realized that he had made his debut as a somnambulist. He seemed to think that he who starts out to be a somnambulist should never turn back, so he pressed on, while the red sun stepped out into the awful quiet of the dusty waste and gradually moved up into the sky, and slowly added another day to those already filed away in the dark maw of ages. Night came again at last, and with it other somnambulists similar to the first, only that they were riding their own beasts. Some somnambulists ride their own animals while others are content to bestride the steeds of strangers. The man on the anonymous mule halted at last at the mouth of a deep cannon. He did so at the request of other somnambulists. Mechanically, he got down from the back of the mule and stood under a stunted mountain pine. After a while, he began to ascend the tree by means of his neck. When he had reached the lower branch of the tree, he made a few gestures with his feet by a lateral movement of the legs. He made several ineffectual efforts to kick some pieces out of the horizon, and then... After he had gently oscillated a few times, he assumed a pendant and perpendicular position at right angles with the limb of the tree. The other somnambulists then took the mule safely back to his corral, and the tragedy of a night was over. The London Post very truly says that where somnambulism can be proved, it is a good defense in a criminal action. It was so held in this case. Various methods are suggested for rousing the somnambulist, such as tickling the feet, for instance. But, in all my own experience, I never knew of a more radical or permanent cure than the one so imperfectly given above. It might do, in some cases, to tickle the feet of a somnambulist discovered in the act of riding away on an anonymous mule. But how could you successfully tickle the soles of his feet while he is standing on them? In such cases, the only true way would be to suspend the somnambulist in such a way as to give free access to the feet from below and, at the same time, give him a good wide horizon to kick at. End of section 60. Section 61 of Remarks. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Remarks by Bill Nye. Section 61. Modern Architecture. It may be premature, perhaps, but I desire to suggest to anyone who may be contemplating the erection of a summer residence for me, as a slight testimonial of his high regard for my sterling worth and symmetrical escutcheon, a testimonial, more suggestive of earnest admiration and warm personal friendship than of great intrinsic value, etc., 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 that I hope he will not construct it on the modern plan of mental hallucination and morbid delirium tremens peculiar to recent architecture. Of course, a man ought not to look a gift house in the gable end, but if my friends don't know me any better than to build me a summer cottage and throw in odd windows that nobody else wanted, and then daub it up with colors that they have bought at auction, and applied it to the house after dark with a shotgun, I think it is time that we had a better understanding. 
such a structure does not come within either of the three classes of Renaissance. It is neither Florentine, Roman, nor Venetian. Any man can originate such a style if he will only drink the right kind of whiskey long enough, and then describe the feelings to an amanuensis. Imagine the sensation that one of these modern, sawed-off cottages would create a hundred years from now, if it should survive. But that is impossible. The only cheering feature of the whole matter is that these creatures of a disordered imagination must soon pass away, and the bright sunlight of hard horse sense shining through the shattered dormers and gables and gnawed-off architecture of the average summer resort. A friend of mine a few days ago showed me his new house with much pride. He asked me what I thought of it. I told him I liked it first rate. Then I went home and wept all night. It was my first falsehood. The house, taken as a whole, looked to me like a skating rink that had started out to make money and then suddenly changed its mind and resolved to become a tannery. Then ten feet higher... It lost all self-respect and blossomed into a full-blown drunk and disorderly. Surrounded by the smokestack of a foundry and the bright future of thirty days ahead with the chain gang. That's the way it looked to me. The roofs were made of little odds and ends of misfit rafters and distorted shingles that somebody had purchased at a sheriff's sale. And the rooms and stairs were giddy in the extreme. I went in and rambled around among the cross-eyed staircases and other nightmares till reason tottered on her throne. Then I came out and stood on the architectural wart called the side porch to get fresh air. This porch was painted a dull red, and it had wooden rosettes at the corners that looked like new carbuncle on the nose of a social wreck. Farther up on the demoralized lumber pile, I saw now and then places where the workman's mind had wandered, and he had nailed on his clapboards wrong side up, and then painted them with Paris green that he had intended to use on something else. It was an odd-looking structure indeed. If my friend got all the material for nothing, from people who had fragments of paint and lumber left over after they failed, and then if the workman constructed it of night for mental relaxation and intellectual repose without charge, of course the scheme was a financial success, but architecturally the house is a gross violation of the statutes, in such cases made and provided and against the peace and dignity of the state. There is a look of extreme poverty about the structure, which a man might struggle for years to acquire, and then fail. No one could look upon it without a feeling of heartache for the man who built that house, and probably struggled on year after year, building a little at a time as he could steal the lumber, getting a new workman each year, building a knob here and a protuberance there, putting in a three-cornered window at one point, and a yellow tile or a wad of broken glass and other debris at another, patiently filling in around the ranch with any old rubbish that other people had got through with, painting it as he went along, taking what was left in the bottom of the pots after his neighbors had painted their bobsleds or their tree boxes, little favors thankfully received, and then surmounting the whole pile with a potpourri of roof, and grand farewell incubus of humps and hollows for the rain to wander through and seek out the different cells where the lunatics live who inhabit it. I did tell my friend one thing that I thought would improve the looks of his house. He asked me eagerly what it could be. I said it would take a man of great courage to do it for him. He said he didn't care for that. He would do it himself. If it only needed one thing, he would never rest till he had it, whatever that might be. Then I told him if he had a friend, one he could trust, who would steal in there some night while the family were away, and scratch a match on the leg of his breeches, or on the breeches of any other gentleman who happened to be present, and hold it where it would ignite the alleged house, and then remain there to see that the fire department did not meddle with it, he would confer a great favor on one who would cheerfully retaliate in kind 
on call. Letter to a Communist Dear Sir, Your courteous letter of the first instant in which you cordially consent to share my wealth and dwell together with me in fraternal sunshine is duly received. While I dislike to appear cold and distant to one who seems so yearnful and so clinging, and while I do not wish to be regarded as purse-proud or arrogant, I must decline your kind offer to whack up. You had not heard, very likely, that I am not now a communist. I used to be, I admit, and the society no doubt neglected to strike my name off the roll of active members. For a number of years I was quite active as a communist. I would have been more active, but I had conscientious scruples against being active in anything then. While you may be perfectly sincere in your belief that the great capitalists like Mr. Gould and Mr. Vanderbilt should divide with you, you will have great difficulty in making it perfectly clear to them. They will probably demur and delay, and hem and haw and procrastinate, till finally they will get out of it in some way. Still, I do not wish to throw cold water on your enterprise. If the other capitalists look favorably on the plan, I will cheerfully cooperate with them. You go and see what you can do with Mr. Vanderbilt, and then come to me. You go on at some length to tell me how the most of the wealth is in the hands of a few men, and then you attack those men and refer to them in a way that makes my blood run cold. You tell the millionaires of America to beware, for the hot breath of a bloody-handed nemesis is already in the air. You may say to nemesis, if you please, that I have a double-barreled shotgun standing at the head of my bed every night, and that I am in the nemesis business. You also refer to the fact that the sleuth-hounds of eternal justice are camped on the trail of the pampered millionaire, and you ask us to avaunt. If you see the other sleuth-hounds of your society within a week or two, I wish you would say to them that at a regular meeting of the millionaires of this country, after the minutes of the previous meeting had been read and approved, we voted almost unanimously to discourage any sleuth-hound that we found camped on our trail after 10 o'clock p.m. Sleuth-hounds who want to ramble over our trails during office hours may do so with the utmost impunity, but after ten o'clock we want to use our trails for other purposes. No man wants to get to the great expense of maintaining a trail winter and summer and then leave it out nights for other people to use and return it when they get ready. I do not censure you, however. If you could convince everyone of the utility of communism, it would certainly be a great boon to you to those who are now engaged in feeding themselves with flat beer out of a tomato can, such a change as you suggest would fall like a ray of sunshine in a rat hole. But, alas, it may never be. I tried it a while, but my efforts were futile. The effect of my great struggle seemed to be that men's hearts grow more and more stony, and my pantaloons got thinner and thinner on the seat, till it seemed to me that the world never was so cold. Then I made some experiments in manual labor. As I began to work harder and sit down less, I found that the world was not so cold. It was only when I sat down a long time that I felt how cold and how rough the world really was. Perhaps it is so with you. Sedentary habits and stale beer are apt to make us morbid. Sitting on the stone door sills of hallways and public buildings during cold weather is apt to give you an erroneous impression of life. Of course, I am willing to put my money into a common fund if I can be convinced that it is best. I was an inside passenger on a Leadville coach some years ago when a few of your friends suggested that we all put our money into a common fund, and I was almost the first one to see that they were right. They went away into the mountains to apportion the money. Section 62 of Remarks. This is a LibriVox recording. 
All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mary Maxwell. Remarks by Bill Nye. Section 62. The Warrior's Oration. Warriors, we are met here today to celebrate the white man's 4th of July. I do not know what the 4th of July has done for us that we should remember his birthday, but it matters not. Another summer is on the wane, and so are we. We are the wall-eyed waners from Wayne Town. We have monopolized the wane business of the whole world. Autumn is almost here, and we have not yet gone upon the war path. The pale face came among us with the corn planter and the desert land act, and we bow before him. What does the 4th of July signify to us? It is a hollow mockery. Where the flag of the white man now waves in the breeze, a few years ago the scalp of our foe was hanging in the air. Now my people are seldom. Some are dead and others drunk. Once we chased the deer and the buffalo across the plains and lived high. Now we eat the condemned corned beef of the oppressor and weep over the graves of our fallen braves. A few more moons and I too shall cross over to the happy reservation. Once I could hoop a couple of times and fill the gulch with warlike athletes. Now I may hoop till the cows come home and only my sickly howl comes back to me from the hillsides. I am as lonely as the greenback party. I haven't warriors enough to carry one precinct. Where are the proud chieftains of my tribe? Where are old weasel asleep and Orlando the he jacket promoter? Where are prickly ashberry and the avenging wart? Where are the Roman-nosed pelican and goggle-eyed Alec, the man who rides the blizzard bareback? They are extremely gone. They are extensively whence. Old Black Hawk, in whose veins flows the blood of many chiefs, is sawing wood for the Bell of the West deadfall for the whiskey. He once rode the war pony into the fray and buried his tomahawk in the phrenology of his foe. Now he straddles the sawbuck and yanks the wood saw athwart the bosom of the base wood chunk. My people once owned this broad land, but the pilgrim fathers, where are they, came and planted the baked bean and the dried apple, and my tribe vamoosed. Once we were a nation, now we are the tin can tied to the American eagle. Warriors, this should be a day of jubilee, but how can the man rejoice who has a boil on his nose? How can the chief of a once proud people shoot firecrackers and dance over the graves of his race? How can I be hilarious with the victor on whose hands are the blood of my children? If we had known more of the white man, we would have made it red hot for him 400 years ago when he came to our coast. We fed him and clothed him as a white-skinned curiosity then, but we didn't know there were so many of him. All he wanted then was a little smoking tobacco and love. Now he feeds us on antique pork and borrows our annuities to build a Queen Anne wigwam with a furnace in the bottom and a piano in the top. Warriors, my words are few. Tears are idle and unavailing. If I had scalding tears enough for a mill site, I would not shed a blamed one. The warrior suffers, but he never squeals. He accepts the position and says nothing. He wraps his royal horse blanket around his gothic bones and is silent. But the pale face cannot tickle us with a barley straw on the 4th of July and make us laugh. You can kill the red man, but you cannot make him hilarious over his own funeral. These are the words of truth, and my warriors will do well to paste them in their plug hats for future reference. The Holy Terror While in New England, trying in my poor, weak way to represent the rowdy West, I met a sad young man who asked me if I lived in Cheyenne. I told him that if he referred to Cheyenne, I had been there off and on a good deal. He said he was there not long ago, but did not remain. He bought some clothes in Chicago so that he could appear in Cheyenne as a holy terror when he landed there, and thus in a whole town of holy terrors he would not attract attention. I am not, he said, by birth or instinct, a holy terror, but I thought I would like to try it a little while anyhow. I got one of those Chicago sombreros with a gilt fried cake twisted around it for a band. Then I got a yellow silk handkerchief 
on the ten cent counter to tie around my neck. Then I got a suit of smoke tanned buckskin clothes and a pair of moccasins. I had never seen a bad, bad man from Cheyenne, but I had seen pictures of them and they all wore moccasins. The money that I had left I put into a large revolver and a butcher knife with a red Moroccan sheath to it. The revolver was too heavy for me to hold in one hand and shoot, but by resting it on a fence I could kill a cow easy enough if she wasn't too blame restless. I went out to the stockyards in Chicago one afternoon and practiced with my revolver. One of my thumbs is out there at the stockyards now. At Omaha, I put on my new suit and sent my human clothes home to my father. He told me when I came away that when I got out to Wyoming, probably I wouldn't want to attract attention by wearing clothes, and so I could send my clothes back to him and he would be glad to have them. At Sydney, I put on my revolver and went into the eating house to get my dinner. A tall man met me at the door and threw me about forty feet in an oblique manner. I asked him if he meant anything personal by that, and he said, not at all, not at all. I then asked him if he would not allow me to eat my dinner, and he said that depended on what I wanted for my dinner. If I would lay down my arms and come back to the reservation and remain neutral to the government and eat cooked food, it would be all right. But if I insisted on eating raw dining room girls and scalloped young ladies, he would bar me out. We landed at Cheyenne in the evening. They had hacks and buses and carriages till you couldn't rest, all standing there at the depot, and a large colored man in a loud tone of voice remarked, Inter-Ocean Hotel. I went there myself. It had doors and windows to it and carpets and gas. The young man who showed me to my room was very polite to me. He seemed to want to get acquainted. He said, You're from New Hampshire, are you not? I told him not to give it away, but I was from New Hampshire. Then I asked him how he knew. He said that several New Hampshire people had been out there that summer, and they had worn the same style of revolver and generally had one thumb done up in a rag. Then he said that if I came from New Hampshire, he would show me how to turn off the gas. He also took my revolver down to the office with him and put it in the safe, because he said someone might get into my room in the night and kill me with it if he left it here. He was a perfect gentleman. They have a big opera house there in Cheyenne, and while I was there, they had the Italian opera singers, Patty and Nevity there. The streets were lit up with electricity, and people seemed to kind of politely look down on me, I thought. Still, they acted as if they tried not to notice my clothes and dime museum hat. They seemed to look at me as if I wasn't to blame for it, and as if they felt sorry for me. If I'd had my United States clothes with me, I could have had a good deal of fun in Cheyenne, going to the opera and the lectures and concerts, etc. But finally I decided to return, so I wrote to my parents how I had been knocked down and garroted and left for dead with one thumb shot off, and they gladly sent the money to pay funeral expenses. With this, I got a cut-rate ticket home and surprised and horrified my parents by dropping in on them one morning just after prayers. I tried to get their... Section 63 of Remarks. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Diana Schmidt. Remarks by Bill Nye. Section 63. Boston Common and Environs. Strolling through the public garden and the famous Boston Common, the untutored savage from the raw and unpolished West is awed and his wild spirit tamed by the magnificent harmony of nature and art. Everywhere the eye rests upon all that is beautiful in nature, while art has heightened the pleasing effect without having introduced the artistic Jim jams of a lost and undone world it is a delightful place through which to stroll in the gray morning while the early worm is getting his just desserts there 
in the midst of a great city with the hum of industry and the low rumble of the throbbing boston brain dimly heard in the distance nature asserts herself and the weary sad-eyed stranger may ramble for hours and keep off the grass to his heart's content nearly every foot of boston common is hallowed by some historical incident it is filled with reminiscences of a time when liberty was not overdone in this new world and the tyrant's heel was resting calmly on the neck of our forefathers in the winter of seventeen seventy five to seventy six over one hundred ten years ago as the ready mathematician will perceive one thousand seven hundred redcoats swarmed over boston common later on the local antipathy to these tourists became so great that they went away they are still fled a few of their descendants were there when i visited the common but they seemed amicable and did not wear red coats their coats this season were made of a large check with sleeves in it their wardrobe generally stands a larger check than their bank account the fountains in the common and the public garden attract the eye of the stranger some of them being very beautiful the brewer fountain on flagstaff hill presented to the city by the late gardener brewer is very handsome it was cast in paris and is a bronze copy of a fountain designed by leonard of that city at the base there are figures representing neptune with his fabled pickerel stabber life-size also amphitrite asis and galadia surviving relatives of these parties may well feel pleased and gratified over the lifelike expression which the sculptor has so faithfully reproduced but the cogswell fountain is probably the most eccentric squirt and one which at once rivets the eye of the beholder i do not know who designed it but am told that it was modeled by a young man who attended the codfish autopsy at the market daytimes and gave his nights to art the fountain proper consists of two metallic bullheads rampart they stand on their bosoms with their tails tied together at the top their mouths are abnormally distended and the water gushes forth from their tonsils in a beautiful stream the pose of these classical codfish or bullheads is sublime in the spirited greco-roman tussle which they seem to be having with their tails abnormally elevated in their artistic catches catch can or can can scuffle the designer has certainly hit upon a unique and beautiful impossibility each bullhead also has a tin dipper chained to his gills and through the livelong day till far into the night he invites the cosmopolitan tramp to come and quench his never-dying thirst the frog pond is another celebrated watering place i saw it in the early part of may and if there had been any water in it it would have been a fine sight nothing contributes to the success of a pond like water i ventured to say to a boston man that i was a little surprised to find a little frog pond containing neither frogs or pond but he said i would find it all right if i could call around during office hours while sitting on one of the many seats which may be found on the common one morning i formed the acquaintance of a pale young man who asked if i resided in boston i told him that while i felt flattered to think that i could possibly fool any one i must admit that i was only a pilgrim and a stranger he said that he was an old resident and he had often noticed that the people of the hub always spoke to a fellow till he was tired i afterward learned that he was not an actual resident of boston but had just completed his junior year at the state asylum for the insane he was sent there it seems as a confirmed case of unjustifiable punist 
therefore the governor had punished him accordingly this is a specimen of our capitalized joke with queen anne do funny on the corners we are shipping a great many of them to england this season where they are greedily snapped up and devoured by the crowned heads it is a good hot weather joke devoid of mental strain perfectly simple and may be laughed at or not without giving the slightest offence drunk in a plug hat this world is filled with woe everywhere you go sorrow is piled up in the fence corners on every road unavailing regret and red-nosed remorse inhabit the cot of the tie chopper as well as the cut glass cage of the millionaire the woods are full of disappointment the earth is convulsed with a universal sob and the roads are muddy with tears but i do not call to mind a more touching picture of unavailing misery and ruin and hopeless chaos than the plug hat that has endeavored to keep sober and maintain self-respect while its owner was drunk a plug hat can stand prosperity and shine forth joyously while nature smiles that's the place where it seems to thrive a tall silk hat looks well on a thrifty man with a clean collar but it cannot stand dissipation i once knew a plug hat that had been respected by everyone and had won its way upward by steady endeavor no one knew aught against it till one evening in an evil hour it consented to attend a banquet and all at once its joyous career ended it met nothing but distrust and cold neglect everywhere after that drink seems to make a man temporarily unnaturally exhilarated during that temporary exhilaration he desires to attract attention by eating lobster salad out of his own hat and sitting down on his neighbors the demon rum is bad enough on the coatings of the stomach but it is even more disastrous to the tall hat a man may mix up in a crowd and carry off an overdose of valley tan in a soft hat or cap but the silk hat will proclaim it upon the housetops and advertise it to a gaping wondering world it has a way of getting back on the rear elevation of the head or over the bridge of the nose or of hanging coquettishly on one ear that says to the eagle-eyed public i am chock-full i cannot call to mind a more powerful lecture on temperance than the silent pantomime of a man trying to hang his plug hat on an invisible peg in his own hall after he had been watching the returns a few years ago i saw that he was excited and nervously unstrung when he came in but i did not fully realize it until he began to hang his hat on a smooth wall at first he laughed in a good-natured way at his awkwardness and hung it up again carefully but at last he became irritated about it and almost forgot himself enough to swear but controlled himself finding however that it refused to hang up and that it seemed rather restless anyhow he put it in the corner of the hall with the crown up pinned it to the floor with his umbrella and heaved a sigh of relief then he took off his overcoat and through a clerical error pulled off his dress coat also i showed him his mistake and offered to assist him back into his apparel but he said he hadn't got so old and feeble yet that he couldn't dress himself later on he came into the parlor wearing a linen ulster with a belt drooping behind him like the broken harness hanging to a shipwrecked and stranded mule his wife looked at him in a way that froze his blood this startled him so that he stepped back a pace or two tangled his feet in his surcingle clutched wildly at the empty gaslight but missed it and sat down in a tall majolica cuspidor there were three games of whist going on when he fell 
and there was a good deal of excitement over the playing but after he had been pulled out of the american tear jug and led away every one of the twelve whist players had forgotten what the trump was they say that he has abandoned politics since then and that now he don't care whether we have any more november elections or not i asked him once if he would be active during the next campaign as usual and he said he thought not he said a man couldn't afford to be too active in a political campaign his constitution wouldn't stand it at that time he didn't care much whether the american people had a president or not if every public-spirited voter had got to work himself up into a state of nervous excitability and prostration where reason tottered on its throne he thought that we needed a reform those who wished to furnish reasons to totter on their thrones for the national central committee at so much per tot could do so he for one didn't propose to farm out his immortal soul and plug hat to the party if sixty million people section sixty four of remarks this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mary Maxwell. Remarks by Bill Nye, Section 64. Spring. Spring is here now. It has been here before, but not so much so, perhaps, as it is this year. In spring, the buds swell up and bust. The violets bloom once more, and the hired girls take off the double windows and the storm door. The husband and father puts up the screen doors so as to fool the annual fly when he tries to make his spring debut. The husband and father finds the screen doors and windows in the gloaming of the garret. He finds them by feeling them in the dark with his hands. He finds the rafters also with his head. When he comes down, he brings the screens and three new intellectual faculties sticking out on his brow like the button on a barn door. Spring comes with joyous laugh and song and sunshine and the burnt sacrifice of the overripe boot and the hoary overshoe. The cowboy and the new milch cow carol their roundelay. So does the veteran hen. The common egg of commerce begins to come forth into the market at a price where it can be secured with a stepladder, and all nature seems tickled. There are four seasons, spring, summer, autumn, and winter. Spring is the most joyful season of the year. It is then that the green grass and the lavender pants come forth. The little robins twitter in the branches, and the horny-handed farmer goes joyously afield to till the soil till the cows come home. Virgil. We all love the moist and fragrant spring. It is then that the sunlight waves beat upon the sandy coast, and the handmaiden beats upon the sandy carpet. The man of the house pulls tacks out of himself and thinks of days gone by, when you and I were young, Maggie. Who does not leap and sing in his heart when the dandelion blossoms in the lowlands and the tremulous tail of the lambkin agitates the balmy air? The lawns begin to look like velvet, and the lawnmower begins to warm its joints and get ready for the approaching harvest. The blue jay fills the forest with his classical and extremely au revoir melody, and a curly cue crawls out of the plum tree and fills his bill. The plowboy puts on his father's boots and proceeds to plow up the cunning little angleworm. Anon, the blackbird alights on the swaying reeds, and the lightning rod man alights on the farmer with great joy, and a new rod that can gather up all the lightning in two states and put it in a two-gallon jug for future use. Who does not love spring, the most joyful season of the year? It is then that the spring bonnet of the workaday world crosses the earth's orbit and makes the bank account of the husband and father look fatigued. The low shoe and the low hum of the bumblebee are again with us. The little striped hornet heats his nose with a spirit lamp and goes forth searching for the man with the linen pantaloons. All nature is full of life and activity. So is the man with the linen pantaloons. 
Anon, the thrush will sing in the underbrush, and the prima donna will do up her voice in a red flannel rag and lay it away. I go now into my cellar to bring out the gladiola bulb and the homesick turnip of last year. Do you see the blue place on my shoulder? That is where I struck when I got to the foot of the cellar stairs. The gladiola bulbs are looking older than when I put them away last fall. I fear me they will never again bulge forth. They are wrinkled about the eyes, and there are lines of care upon them. I could squeeze along two years without the gladiola and the oleander in the large tub. If I should give my little boy a new hatchet, and he should cut down my beautiful oleander, I would give him a bicycle and a brass band and a gold-headed cane. Oh, spring, spring, you giddy young thing. Footnote 1. From Poems of Passion and One Other Thing by the author of this sketch. The Duke of Rawhide I believe I've got about the most instinct bulldog in the United States, said Coyote Van Gogh yesterday. Other pups may show cuteness and cunning, you know, but my dog, the Duke of Rawhide Buttes, is not only generally smart, but he keeps up with the times. He's not only a talented cuss, but his genius is always fresh and original. What are some of his specialties, Van, said I? Oh, there's a good many of them first and last. He never seems to be content with the achievements that please other dogs. You watch him and you'll see that his mind is active all the time. When he is still working up some scheme or another, that he will ripen and fructify later on. For three years I've had a watermelon patch and run it with more or less success, I reckon. The Duke has tended to him after they got ripe, and I was going to say that it kept his hands pretty busy to do it, but to be more accurate, I should say that it kept his mouth full. Hardly a night after the melons got ripe and in the dark of the moon, but the dude would sample a cowboy or a sheep herder from the lower padre. Watermelons were generally worth ten cents a pound along the Union Pacific for the first two weeks, and a fifty-pounder was worth five dollars. That made it an object to keep your melons, for in a good year you could grow enough on ten acres to pay off the national debt. Well, to return to my subject... Duke would sleep days during the season and gather fragments of the rear breadths of western pantaloons at night. One morning, Duke had a piece of fancy casimir in his teeth that I tried to pry out and preserve, so that I could identify the owner, perhaps, but he wouldn't give it up. I coaxed him and lammed him across the face and eyes with an old board, but he wouldn't give it to me. Then I watched him. I've been watching him ever since. He took all these fragments of goods I found over into the garret above the carriage shed. Yesterday I went in there and took a lantern with me. There on the floor the Duke of Rawhide had arranged all the samples of Rocky Mountain pantaloons with a good deal of taste, and I don't suppose you'd believe it, but that blame pup is collecting all these little scraps to make himself a crazy quilt. You can talk about instinct in animals, but so far as the Section 65 of Remarks. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Betty B. Remarks by Bill Nye. Section 65. Etiquette at Hotels. Etiquette at hotels is a subject that has been but lightly treated upon by our modern philosophy, and yet it is a subject that lies very near to every American heart. Had I not already more reforms on hand than I can possibly successfully operate, I would gladly use my strong social influence and trenchant pen in that direction. Etiquette at hotels both on the part of the proprietor and his hirelings and the guest is a matter that calls loudly for improvement the hotel waiter alone would well repay a close study from the tardy and polished loiterer of the effete east to the off-hand and social equal of the budding west all waiters are deserving of philosophical scrutiny 
i was thrown in contact with a waiter in new york last summer whose manners were far more polished than my own every time i saw him standing there with his immediate pantaloons and swallow-tail coat and the far-away chastened look of one who had been unfortunate but not crushed i felt that i was unworthy to be waited upon by such a blue-blooded thoroughbred and i often wished that we had more such men in congress and when he would take my order and go away with it and after the meridian of my life had softened into the mellow glory of the sere and yellow leaf when he came back still looking quite young and never having forgotten me recognizing me readily after the long dull desolate years i was glad and i felt that he deserved something more than mere empty thanks and i said to him ah sir you still remember me after years of privation and suffering when every one else in new york has forgotten me with the exception of the confidence man you came to me with the glad light of recognition in your clear eye would you be offended if i gave you this trifling testimonial of my regard at the same time giving him my note at thirty days i wanted him to have something by which to always remember me and i guess he has speaking of waiters reminds me of one at glendive montana we had to telegraph ahead in order to get a place to sleep and when we registered the landlord shoved out an old double-entry journal for us to record our names and post office address in the office was the bar and before we get our rooms assigned us we had to wait forty-five minutes for the landlord to collect pay for thirteen drinks and lick a personal friend finally when he got around to me he told me that i could sleep in the night bartender's bed as he would be up all night and might possibly get killed and never need it again anyhow it would cost me four dollars cash in advance to sleep one night in the bartender's bed he said and the house was so blame full that he and his wife had got to wait till things kind of quieted down and then they would have to put a mattress on the fifteen ball pool table and sleep there i called attention to my valuable valise that had been purchased at great cost and told him that he would be safe to keep that behind the bar till i paid but he said he wasn't in the second-hand valise business and so i paid in advance it was humiliating but he had the edge on me at the tea-table i noticed that the waiter was a young man who evidently had not always been thus he had the air of one who yearns to have some one tread on the tail of his coat meekness with me is one of my characteristics it is almost a passion it is the result of personal injuries received in former years at the hands of parties who excelled me in brute force and who succeeded in drawing me out in conversation as it were till i made remarks that were injudicious so i did not disagree with this waiter although i had grounds when he came around and snorted in my ear salt pork antelope and cold beans at the same time leaning his full weight on my back while he evaded the revenue laws by retailing his breath to the guests without a license i thought i would call for what he had the most of so i said if he didn't mind and it wouldn't be too much trouble i would take cold beans i will leave it to the calm impassionate and unpartisan reader to state whether that remark ought to create ill feeling i do not think it ought however he was irritable and life to him seemed to be cold and dark so he went to the general delivery window that led into the cold bean laboratory and remarked in a hoarse insolent and ironical tone of voice another damn suspicious-looking character wants cold beans fifteen years apart the american indian approximates near to what man should be manly physically perfect grand in character 
and true to the instincts of his conscience than any other race of beings civilized or uncivilized where do we hear such noble sentiments or meet with such examples of heroism and self-sacrifice as the history of the american indian furnishes where shall we go to hear again such oratory as that of black hawk and logan certainly the records of our so-called civilization do not furnish it and the present century is devoid of it they were the true children of the great spirit they lived nearer to the great heart of the creator than do their pale-faced conquerors of to-day who mourn over the lost and undone condition of the savage courageous brave and the soul of honor their cruel and awful destruction from the face of the earth is a sin of such magnitude that the relics and the people of america may well shrink from the just punishment which is sure to follow the assassination of as brave a race as ever breathed the air of heaven i wrote the above scathing rebuke of the american people when i was fifteen years of age i ran across the dissertation yesterday as a general rule it takes a youth fifteen years of age to arraign congress and jerk the administration bald-headed the less he knows about things generally the more cheerfully will he shed information right and left at the time i wrote the above crude attack upon the government i had not seen any indians but i had read much my blood boiled when i thought of the wrongs which our race had meted out to the red man it was at the time when my blood was just coming to a boil that i penned the above paragraph ten years later i had changed my views somewhat relative to the indian and frankly wrote to the government of the change when i am doing the administration an injustice and i find it out i go to the president candidly and say look here mr president i have been doing you a wrong you were right and i was erroneous i am not pig-headed and stubborn i just admit fairly that i have been hindering the administration and i do not propose to do so any more so i wrote to general grant and told him that when i was fifteen years of age i wrote a composition at school in which i had arraigned the people and the administration for the course taken toward the indians since that time i had seen some indians in the mountains at a distance and from what i had seen of them i was led to believe that i had misjudged the people and the executive i told him that so far as possible i would like to repair the great wrong so done in the ardor of youth and to once more sustain the arm of the government he wrote me kindly and said he was glad that i was friendly with the government again and that now he saw nothing in the way of continued national prosperity he said he would preserve my letter in the archives as a treaty of peace between myself and the nation he said only the day before he had observed to the cabinet that he didn't care two cents about a war with foreign nations but he would like to be on a peace footing with me the country could stand outside interference better than intestine hostility i do not know whether he meant anything personal by that or not probably not he said he remembered very well when he first heard that i had attacked the indian policy of the united states in one of my school essays he still called to mind the feeling of alarm and apprehension which at that time pervaded the whole country how the cheeks of strong men had blanched and the goddess of liberty felt for her back hair and exchanged her mother hubbard dress for a new cast-iron panoply of war and roman hay knife oh yes he said he remembered it as though it had been yesterday having at heart the welfare of the american people as he did he hoped that i would never attack the republic again and i never have i have been friendly not only personally but officially for a good while even if i didn't agree with some of the official acts of the president i would allow him to believe that i did rather than harass him 
with cold cruel and adverse criticism the abundant success of this section sixty six of remarks this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. recording by bruce kachuk remarks by bill nye section sixty six desiccated mule the red-eyed antagonist of truth is not found alone in the ranks of the newspaper phalanx you run up against him in all walks of life he flourishes in all professions and he is ready at all times to entertain there is quite a difference between a malicious falsehood and the different shades of parables fables with a moral sabbath school books newspaper sketches and anecdotes told to entertain a malicious lie is injurious personally a business lie is a falsehood for revenue only but the yarns that are spun around campfires in mining and logging camps to while away a dull evening are not within the jurisdiction of the criminal code or the home missionary on the train yesterday several old lumbermen were telling about hard roads and steep hills engineering skill and so forth finally they told about snubbing a loaded team down bad hills and one man said you might snub down a cheap hill but you couldn't do it on our road we tried it couldn't do a thing finally we got to building snow sheds and hauling sand you build a snow shed that covers the grade then fill the road in with two feet of loose sand and you're okay we did that last winter and when you drive a four-horse load of logs down through them long snow sheds on bare ground mind you and the bobs go plowing through the sand the sled shoes will make the fire fly so that you can read the president's message at midnight then an old man who went to pike's peak during the excitement and returned afterward woke up and yawned two or three times and said they used to have some trouble a good many years ago getting over the range where the south park road now goes from chalk creek cannon through alpine tunnel to the gunnison we tried snubbing and everything we could think of but it was n g finally we got hold of a new kind of snub that worked pretty well we had a long cable made of purpose that would reach to the foot of the hill from the top and we'd tie a three-ton load to the end at the top of the hill then we would hitch six mules to the end at the foot of the hill well the principle of the thing was that as the load went down on the gunnison side it would pull the mules up the opposite side tails first how did it work oh it worked all right if the mules and the load balanced but one day we put on a light mule named emma abbott and the load got a start down the gunnison side that made that old cable sing the wagon tipped over and concussed a keg of blasting powder and that obliterated the rest of the goods but the air on the other side was full of mules you ought to see em come up that hill it takes considerable of a crisis to affect the natural reserve of six mules but when they saw how it was they backed up that mountain with great enthusiasm they didn't touch the ground but once in three thousand feet but they struck the canopy of heaven several times when the sky cleared up we made a careful inventory of the stock we had a second-hand three-inch cable and some desiccated mule we never went to look for the wagon but when the weather got warm the coyotes helped us find emma abbott she was hanging by the ear in the crotch of an old hemlock tree life was extinct we found a few more of the mules but they were fractional emma abbott was the only complete mule we found times changes i fixed myself and went out trout fishing on the only original kinnick river last week it was a kind of rip van winkle picnic and farewell moonlight excursion home i believe that rip van winkle however confined himself to hunting mostly with an old musket that was on the retired list when rip took his sleepy drink on the catskills if he could have gone with me fishing last week over the old trail digging angle worms at the same old place where i left the spade sticking in the grim soil twenty years ago 
if we could have waded down the knick knick together with high rubber boots on and got nibbles and bites at the same places and found the same old farmers with nearly a quarter of a century added to their lives and glistening in their hair we would have had fun no doubt on that day and a headache on the day following this affords me an opportunity to say that trout may be caught successfully without a corkscrew i have tried it i have about decided that the main reason why so many large lies are told about the number of trout caught all over the country is that at the moment the sportsman pulls his game out of the water he labors under some kind of an optical illusion by reason of which he sees about nine trout where he ought to see only one i wish i had as many dollars as i have soaked deceased angle worms in that same beautiful kinnikinnick there was a little stream made into it that we called tid's creek it is still there the stream runs across tid's farm and tid twenty years ago wouldn't allow anybody to fish in the creek i can still remember how his large hand used to feel as he caught me by the nape of the neck and threw me over the fence with my amateur fishing tackle and a willow stringer with eleven dried stiff trout on it last week i thought i would try tid's creek again it was always a good place to fish and i felt the same old excitement with just enough vague forebodings in it to make it pleasant still i had grown a foot or so since i used to fish there and perhaps i could return the compliment by throwing the old gentleman over his own fence and then hiss in his ear revenge i had got pretty well across the lower forty and had about decided that tid had been gathered to his fathers when i saw him coming with his head up like a steer in the corn tid is a blacksmith by trade and he has an arm with hair on it that looks like jumbo's hind leg i felt the same old desire to climb the fence and be alone i didn't know exactly how to work it then i remembered how people had remarked that i had changed very much in twenty years and that for a homely boy i had grown to be a remarkably picturesque looking man i trusted to tid's failing eyesight and said how are you he said how are you that did not answer my question but i didn't mind a little thing like that then he said i suppose that every pesky fool in this country knew i don't allow fishing on my land that may be says i but i ain't fishing on your land i always fish in a damp place if i can moreover how do i know this is your land carrying the argument still further and admitting that every pesky fool knows that you didn't allow fishing here i am not going to be called a pesky fool with impunity unless you do it over my dead body he stopped about ten rods away and i became more fearless i don't know who you are said i as i took off my coat and vest and piled them up on my fish basket eager for the fray you claim to own this farm but it is my opinion that you are the hired man puffed up with a little authority you can't order me off this ground till you show me a duly certified abstract of title and then identify yourself what protection does a gentleman have if he is to be kicked and cuffed about by tom dick and harry claiming they own the whole state get out avaunt if you don't avaunt pretty quick i'll scrap you and sell you to a medical college he stood in dumb amazement a moment then he said he would go and get his deed and his shotgun i said shotguns suited me exactly and i told him to bring two of them loaded with giant powder and barbed wire i would not live all way i asked not to stay when he got behind the corn crib i climbed the fence and fled with my ill-gotten gains the blacksmith in his prime may lick the small boy but twenty years changes their relative positions possibly tid could tear up the ground with me now but in ten more years if i improve as fast as he fails section sixty seven of remarks this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit 
LibriVox.org. Recording by Bruce Kachuk. Remarks by Bill Nye. Section 67. Letter from New York. Dear friend, being Sunday, I take an hour to write you a letter in regard to this place. I came here yesterday without attracting undue attention from people who lived here. If they was surprised, they concealed it from me. I've camped out on the chug years ago, and went to sleep with no live thing near me except my own pony, and woke up with the early song of the coyote, and have been on the lonesome plain for days where it seemed to me that a hostile would be mighty welcome if he would only say something to me. But I was never so lonesome as I was here in this big town last night, although it is the most thick-settled place I was ever at. I was so kind of low and depressed that I strolled into the bar at last, allowing that I could pound on the counter and call up the boys and get acquainted a little with somebody, just as I would at Colonel Luke Murren's at Cheyenne. But when I waved to the other parties and told them to rally round the foaming beaker, they apologized and allowed they had just been to dinner. Just been to dinner, and there it was pretty blamed near dark. Then I asked them to take a cigar but they mostly calculated they had no occasion. I was mad, but what could I do? They was too many for me, and I couldn't coerce the white-livered aristocratic mob, for quicker and scat they could have hollered into a little cupboard they had there in the corner, and in less than two minutes they'd have had the whole police department and the hook-and-ladder company down there after me with a torchlight procession. So I swallowed my wrath on a tame drink of cultivated whiskey with Apollo Belvedere on the side, and went out into the auditorium of the hotel. Here I was very unhappy, being, as the editor of the Green River Gazette would say, the cynosure of all eyes. I would rather not be a cynosure, even at a good salary, so I thought I would ask the proprietor to build a fire in my room. I went up to the recorder's office where the big hotel autographed album is, and asked to see the proprietor. A good-looking young man came forward and asked me what he could do for me, I said if it wouldn't be too much trouble, I wished he would build a little fire in my room, and I would pay him for it, or if he would show me where the woodpile was, I would build the fire myself. I wasn't doing anything special at that time. He then whistled through his teeth and crooked his finger in a shrill tone of voice to a young party who was working for him, and told him to build a fire in four or two. I then sat down in the auditorium and read out of a railroad tract, which undertook to show that a party that undertook to ride over a rival road must do so because life was a burden to him, and facility and comfort and safety and such things no object whatever. But still I was very lonely, and felt as if I was far, far away from home. I couldn't have been more uncomfortable if I'd been a young man I saw twenty-five years ago on the old overland trail. He had gone out to study the Indian character and to win said Indian to the fold. When I next saw him, he was twenty miles farther on. He had been thrown in contact with said Indian in the meantime. I judged he had been making a collection of Indian arrows. He was extremely no more. He looked some like St. Sebastian, and some like a toothpick holder. I was never successfully lost on the plains, and so I started out after supper to find my room. I found a good many other rooms and tried to get into them, but I did not find four or two till a late hour. Then I subsidized the night patrol on the third floor to assist me. This is a nice place to stop, but it is a little too rich for my blood, I guess. Not so much as regards price, but I can see that I am beginning to excite curiosity among the boarders. People are coming here to board just because I am here, and it is disagreeable. I do not court notoriety. I have always lived in a plain way, and I would give a dollar if people would look the other way while I eat my pie. Yours truly, E.O.D. To E. William Nye, Esquire. P.S. This is not a dictated letter. I left my stenographer and revolver at Pumpkin Buttes. E.O.D. Crowns and Crowned Heads during the hot weather very few crowns are worn this season and a few hints as to the care of the crown itself may not be out of place the crown should not be carelessly hung on the hat-rack in the royal hall 
for the flies to roost upon but it should be thoroughly cleaned and put away as soon as the weather becomes too hot to wear it comfortably great care should be used in cleaning a gold-plated crown to avoid wearing out the plate take a good stiff toothbrush with a little soap suds and clean the crown thoroughly at first drying it on a clean towel and taking care not to drop it on the floor and thus knock the moss agate diadem loose next get a sleeve of the royal undershirt or in case you cannot procure one readily the sleeve of a duke or right bower may be used soak this in vinegar and with a coat of whiting polish the crown thoroughly wrap it in cotton flannel and put in the bureau sometimes the lining of the crown becomes saturated with hair oil from constant use and needs cleaning in such cases the lining may be removed boiled in concentrated lye two hours or until tender and then placed on the grass to bleach in the sun most crowns are size six and seven eighths and they are therefore frequently too large for the number six head of royalty in such cases a newspaper may be folded lengthwise and laid inside the sweatband of the crown thus reducing the size and preventing any accident by which his or her majesty might lose the crown in the coal bin while doing chores after the fourth of july and other royal holidays this newspaper may be removed and the crown will be found none too large for the imperial dome of thought sceptres may be cleaned and wrapped in woolen goods during the hot months the leg of an old pair of pantaloons makes a good retort to run a sceptre into while not in use never try to kill flies or drive carpet tacks with the sceptre it is an awkward tool at best and you might easily knock a thumbnail loose great care should also be taken of the royal robe do not use it for a lap robe while dining nor sleep in it at night nothing looks more repugnant than a king on the throne with little white feathers all over his robe it is equally bad taste to govern a kingdom in a maroon robe with white horse hairs all over it i once knew a king who invariably curried his horses in his royal robes and if the steeds didn't stand around to suit him he would ever and anon welt them in the pit of the stomach with his cast-iron sceptre it was greatly to the interest of his horses not to incur the royal displeasure as the reader has no doubt already surmised the robe of the king should only be worn while his majesty is on the throne when he comes down at night after his day's work and goes out after his coal and kindling wood he may take off his robe roll it up carefully and stick it under the throne where it will be out of sight nothing looks more untidy than a fat king milking a bobtail cat Section 68 of Remarks. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mary Maxwell. Remarks by Bill Nye. Section 68. My Physician. An Open Letter. Dear Sir, I have seen recently an open letter addressed to me and written by you in a vein of confidence and strictly sub rosa. What you said was so strictly confidential, in fact, that you published the letter in New York, and it was copied through the press of the country. I shall, therefore, endeavor to be equally careful in writing my reply. You refer in your kind and confidential note to your experience as an invalid and your rapid recovery after the use of red-hot Mexican pepper tea in a molten state. But you did not have such a physician as I did when I had spinal meningitis. He was a good doctor for horses and blind staggers, but he was out of his sphere when he strove to fool with a human frame. Change of scene and rest were favorite prescriptions of his. Most of his patients got both, especially eternal rest. He made a specialty of eternal rest. He did not know what the matter was with me, but he seemed to be willing to learn. My wife says that while he was attending me, I was as crazy as a loon, but that I was more lucid than the physician. 
even with my little shattered wreck of mind, tottering between a superficial knowledge of how to pound sand and a wide shoreless sea of mental vacuity, I still had the edge on my physician, from an intellectual point of view. He is still practicing medicine in a quiet kind of way, weary of life, and yet fearing to die and go where his patients are. He had a saber wound on one cheek that gave him a ferocious appearance. He frequently alluded to how he used to mix up in the carnage of battle, and how he used to roll up his pantaloons and wade in gore. He said that if the toxin of war should sound even now, or if he were to wake up in the night and hear war's rude alarm, he would spring to arms and make tyranny tremble till its suspender buttons fell off. Oh, he was a bad man from Bitter Creek. One day I learned from an old neighbor that this physician did not have anything to do with preserving the Union intact, but that he acquired the scar on his cheek while making some experiments as a drunk and disorderly. He would come and sit by my bedside for hours, waiting for this mortality to put on immortality, so that he could collect his bill from the estate. But one day I arose during a temporary delirium, and extracting a slat from my couch, I smote him across the pit of the stomach with it, while I hissed through my clenched teeth, Physician, heal thyself! I then tottered a few minutes, and fell back into the arms of my attendants. If you do not believe this, I can still show you the clenched teeth, also the attendants. I had a hard time with this physician, but I still live contrary to his earnest solicitations. I desire to state that should this letter creep into the press of the country, and thus become in a measure public, I hope that it will create no ill feeling on your part. Our folks are all well as I write, and should you happen to be on Lake Superior this winter, yachting, I hope you will drop in and see us. Our latch string is hanging out most all the time, and if you will pound on the fence, I will call off the dog. I frequently buy a copy of your paper on the streets. Do you get the money? Are you acquainted with the staff of the Century, published in New York? I was in the Century office several hours last spring, and the editors treated me very handsomely, but although I have bought the magazine ever since and read it thoroughly, I have not seen yet where they said that they had a pleasant call from the genial and urbane William Nye. I do not feel offended over this. I simply feel hurt. Before that, I had a good notion to write a brief epic on the warty toad and send it to the century for publication. But now it is quite doubtful. The century may be a good paper, but it does not take the press dispatches, and only last month I saw in it an account of a battle that to my certain knowledge occurred twenty years ago. All About Oratory Twenty centuries ago, last Christmas, there was born in Attica, near Athens, the father of oratory, the greatest orator of whom history has told us. His name was Demosthenes. Had he lived until this spring, he would have been 2,270 years old, but he did not live. Demosthenes has crossed the mysterious river. He has gone to that bourne whence no traveler returns. Most of you, no doubt, have heard about it. On those who may not have heard it, the announcement will fall with a sickening thud. This sketch is not intended to cast a gloom over your hearts. It was designed to cheer those who read it and make them glad they could read. Therefore, I would have been glad if I could have spared them the pain which this sudden breaking news of the death of Demosthenes will bring. But it could not be avoided. We should remember the transitory nature of life, and when we are tempted to boast of our health and strength and wealth, let us remember the sudden and early death of Demosthenes. Demosthenes was not born an orator. He struggled hard and failed many times. He was homely, and he stammered in his speech. But before his death, they came to him for hundreds of miles to get him to open their county fairs and jerk the bird of freedom bald-headed on the 4th of July. When Demosthenes' father died, he left 15 talents to be divided between Demosthenes and his sister. A talent is equal to about $1,000. I often wish I had been born a little more talented. Demosthenes had a short breath, a hesitating speech, and his manners were very ungraceful. To remedy his stammering, he filled his mouth full of pebbles and howled his sentiments at the angry sea. 
However, Plutarch says that Demosthenes made a gloomy fizzle of his first speech. This did not discourage him. He finally became the smoothest orator in that country, and it was no uncommon thing for him to fill the First Baptist Church of Athens full. There are now sixty of his orations extant, part of them written by Demosthenes and part of them written by his private secretary. When he started in, he was gentle, mild, and quiet in his manner, but later on, carrying his audience with him, he at last became enthusiastic. He thundered, he roared, he whooped, he howled, he jarred the windows, he sawed the air, he split the horizon with his clarion notes, he tipped over the table, kicked the lamps out of the chandeliers, and smashed the big bass viol over the chief fiddler's head. Oh, Demosthenes was business when he got started. It will be a long time before we see another offhand speaker like Demosthenes, and I, for one, have never been the same man since I learned of his death. Such was the first of orators, says Lord Brown. At the head of all the mighty masters of speech, the adoration of ages has consecrated his place, and the loss of the noble instrument with which he forged and launched his thunders is sure to maintain it unapproachable forever. I have always been a great admirer of the oratory of Demosthenes, and those who have heard both of us think there is a certain degree of similarity in our style. And not only did I admire Demosthenes as an orator, but as a man, and though I am no Vanderbilt, I feel as though I would be willing to head a subscription list for the purpose of doing the square thing by a sorrowing wife, if she is left in want, as I understand that she is. I must now leave Demosthenes and pass on rapidly to speak of Patrick Henry. Mr. Henry was a man who wanted liberty or death. He preferred liberty, though. If he couldn't have liberty, he wanted to die, but he was in no great rush about it. He would like liberty, if there was plenty of it, but if the British had no liberty to spare, he yearned for death. When the tyrant asked him what style of death he wanted, he said that he would rather die of extreme old age. He was willing to wait, he said. He didn't want to go unprepared, and he thought it would take him eighty or ninety years more to prepare, so that when he was ushered into another world, he wouldn't be ashamed of himself. One hundred and ten years ago, Patrick Henry said, Sir, our chains are forged. Their clanking may be heard on the plains of Boston. The war is inevitable, and let it come. I repeat it, sir, let it come. In the spring of 1860, I used almost the same language. So did Horace Greeley. There were four or five of us who got our heads together and decided that the war was inevitable and consented to let it come. Then it came. Whenever there is a large, inevitable conflict loafing around waiting for permission to come, it devolves on the great statesman and bald-headed literati of the nation to avoid all delay. It was so with Patrick Henry. He permitted the land to be deluged in gore, and then he retired. It is the duty of the great orator to howl Section 69 of Remarks. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mary Maxwell. Remarks by Bill Nye. Section 69. Strabusmus and Justice. Over in St. Paul, I met a man with eyes of cadet blue and a terracotta nose. His eyes were not only peculiar in shape, but while one seemed to constantly probe the future, the other was apparently ransacking the dreamy past. While one rambled among the glorious possibilities of the remote yet golden ultimately, the other sought the somber depths of the previously. He told me that years ago he had had a mild case of strabismus, and that both eyes seemed to glare down his nose till he got restless and had them operated on. Those were the days when they used to fasten a crochet hook under the internal rectus muscle and cut it a little with a pair of optical sheep shears. The effect of this course was to allow the eye to drift back to a direct line. 
but this man fell into the hands of a drunken surgeon who cut the muscle too much and thereby weakened it so that it gradually swung past the point it ought to have stopped at and he saw with horror that his eye was going to turn out and protrude as it were so that a man could hang his hat on it the other followed suit and the two orbs that had for years looked along the bridge of the terracotta nose gradually separated and while one looked toward next christmas with fond anticipations the other loved to linger over the remembrances of last fall this thing continued till he had to peer into the future with his off eye closed and vice versa it is needless to say that he hungered for the blood of that physician and surgeon he tried to lay violent hands on him and wipe up the ground with him and wear him out across a telegraph pole but the authorities always prevented the administration of swift and lawful justice Time passed on till one night the abnormal wall-eyed man loosened a board in the sidewalk uptown so that the physician and surgeon caught his foot in it and caused an oblique fracture of the scapula, pied his dura mater, busted his cornucopia, and wrecked his cerebellum. Perhaps I am in error as to some of these medical terms and their orthography, but that is about the way the man with the divergent orbs told it to me. The physician and surgeon was quite a ruin. He had to wear clapboards on himself for months, and there were other doctors, and laudable pus and threatened gangrene and doctor's bills, with the cemetery looming up in the near future. Day after day he took his own anti-febrile drinks, and rammed his busted system full of iron and strychnine and beef tea and Dover's powders and hypodermic squirt till he wished he could die. But death would not come. He pawed the air and howled. They fed him his own nux vomica, tincture of rhubarb and phosphates and gruel, and brought him back to life with a crooked collarbone, a shattered shoulder blade, and a look of woe. Then he sued the town for $50,000 damages because the sidewalk was imperfect, and the wild-eyed man with the inflamed nose got on the jury. I will not explain how it was done, but there was a verdict for the defendant with cost on the Escalapian wreck. The man with a crooked vision is not handsome, but he is very happy. He says the mills of the gods grind slowly, but they pulverize Midland fine. A Spencerian Ass After I had accumulated a handsome competence as city editor of the old Morning Sentinel at Laramie City, and had married and gone to housekeeping with a gas stove and other luxuries, my place on the Sentinel was taken by a newspaper man named Hopkins, who had just graduated from a business college, and who brought a nice glazed grip sack and a diploma with him that had never been used. Hopkins wrote a fine Spencerian hand and wore a black and tan dog wherever he went. The boys were willing to overlook his copper plate hand, but they drew the line at the dog. He not only wrote in beautiful style, but he copied his manuscript so that when it went to the printer it was as pretty as a wedding invitation. Illustration, he threw me out. Hopkins ran the city page nine days, and then he came into the city hall where I was trying a simple drunk and bade me adieu. I just say this to show how difficult it is for a fine penman to get ahead as a journalist. Of course, good, readable writers like Knox and John Hancock may become great, but they have to be men of sterling ability to start with. I have some of the most blood-curdling horrors preserved for the purpose of showing Hopkins' wonderful and vivid style. I will throw them in. A little son of our esteemed fellow townsman, J. H. Hayford, suffered greatly last evening with virulent colic, but this A.M., as we go to press, is sleeping easily. Think of shaking the social foundations of a mountain mining and stock town with such grim, nervous prostrators as that. The next day he startled southern Wyoming and northern Colorado and Utah with the maddening statement that our genial friend, Leopold Gustenhoffen's fine yellow dog, Florence Nightingale, had been seriously threatened with insomnia. That was the style of mental calisthenics he gave us in a town where death by opium and ropium was liable to occur, and where five men with their Mexican spurs on climbed one telegraph pole in one night and sauntered into the remote indefinitely. Hopkins told me that he had tried to do what was right, but that he had not succeeded very well. He wrung my hand and said, I have tried hard to make the sentinel feel a long want felt, but I have not been fortunate. 
The foreman over there is a harsh man. He used to come in and intimate in a frowning and erect tone of voice that if I did not produce that copy PDQ, or some other abbreviation or other, that he would bust my crust, or words of like import. Now that's no way to talk to a man of a nervous temperament who is engaged in copying a list of hotel arrivals and shading the capitals as I was. In the business college, it was not that way. Everything was quiet, and there was nothing to jar a man like that. Of course I'd like to stay on the Sentinel and draw the princely salary, but there are two hundred reasons why I cannot do it. So far as the physical effort is concerned, I could draw the salary with one hand tied behind me, but there's too much turmoil and mad haste in daily journalism to suit me. And another thing, the proprietor of the Sentinel this morning stole up behind me and struck me over the head with a wrought iron side stick weighing ten pounds. If I had not concealed a coil spring in my plug hat, the blow would have been deleterious to me. Then he threw me out of the door against a total stranger and flung pieces of coal at me and called me a copper-plate ass and said that if I ever came into the office again, he would assassinate me. That is the principal reason why I have severed my connection with the Sentinel. As he said this, Mr. Hopkins took out a polka-dot handkerchief, wiped away a pearly tear the size of a walnut, Section 70 of Remarks. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Remarks by Bill Nye. Section 70. Anecdotes of Justice. The justice of the peace is sometimes a peculiarity, and if someone does not watch him, he will exceed his jurisdiction. It took a constable a sheriff, a prosecuting attorney, and a club to convince a Wyoming justice of the peace that he had no right to send a man to the penitentiary for life. Another justice in Utah sentenced a criminal to be hung on the following Friday between twelve and one o'clock of said day, but he couldn't enforce the sentence. A Wisconsin justice of the peace granted a divorce and in two weeks married the couple over again. Ten dollars for the divorce and two dollars for the relapse. Another badger justice bound a young man over to appear and answer at the next term of the circuit court for the crime of chastity, and the evidence was entirely circumstantial, too. Another one, when his first case came up, jerked a candle box around behind the dining room table, put his hat on the back of his head, borrowed a chew of tobacco from the prisoner, and said, Now, boys, the court's open. The first fellow that says a word unless I speak to him will get paralyzed. Now tell your story. Then each witness and the defendant reeled off his yarn without being sworn. The justice fined the defendant ten dollars and made the complaining witness pay half the costs. The justice then took the fine and put it in his pocket adjourned court, and in an hour was so full that it took six men to hold his house still long enough for him to get into the doors. A North Park justice of the peace and undersheriff formed a partnership years ago for the purpose of supplying people with justice at New York prices, and by doing a strictly cash business they dispensed with a good deal of justice, such as it was. It was a misdemeanor to kill game and ship it out of the state, and as there was a good deal killed there, consisting of elk, antelope, and black-tailed deer especially, and as it could not be hauled out of the park at that season without going across the Wyoming line and back again into the state of Colorado, the undersheriff would load himself down with warrants, signed in blank, and station himself on horseback at the foot of the pass to the north. He would then arrest everybody indiscriminately who had any fraction of a deer, antelope, or elk on his wagon, try the case then and there, put a fine of twenty-five to seventy-five dollars, which if paid never reached the treasury, and then he would wait for another victim. 
the average man would rather pay the fine than go back a hundred miles through mountains to stand trial so the under-sheriff and justice thrived for some time but one day the under-sheriff served his patent automatic warrant on a young man who refused to come down the officer then drew one of those large baritone instruments that generally has a coward at one end and a corpse at the other he pointed this at the young man and assessed a fine of fifty dollars and costs instead of paying this fine the youth who was quite nimble but unarmed knocked the bogus officer down with the butt end of his six mule whip took his self-cocking credentials away and lit out in less than a week the justice and his copper were in the refrigerator i was once a justice of the peace and a good many funny little incidents occurred while I held that office. I do not allude to my official life here in order to call attention to my glowing career, for thousands of others, no doubt, could have administered the affairs of the office as well as I did, but rather to speak of one incident which took place while I was a J.P. One night I had retired and gone to sleep. A milkman called Bill Dunning rang the bell and got me out of bed. Then he told me that a man who owed him a milk bill of thirty-five dollars was all loaded up and prepared to slip across the line overland into Colorado, there to grow up with the country and acquire other indebtedness, no doubt. Bill desired an attachment for the entire wagon load of goods and said he had an officer at hand to serve the writ. But, said I, as I wrapped a welcome husk doormat around my glorious proportions, how do you know while we converse together he is not winging his way down the valley of the Padre? Never mind that, Judge, says William. You just fix the documents and I'll tend to the defendant. In an hour, Bill returned with thirty-five dollars cash for himself and the entire costs of the court. And as we settled up and fixed the docket, I asked Bill Dunning, how he detained the defendant while we made out the affidavit bond and writ of attachment. You recollect, Judge, says William, that the wagon wheel is held on to the axle with a big nut. No wagon can go any length of time without their nut in the axle. Well, then, I discovered that what's-his-name was packed up and the wagon loaded. I took the liberty to borrow one of them their nuts for a kind of memento, as it were. And I kept that in my pocket till we served the writ and he paid my bill and came to his milk if he will allow me that expression, and then I says to him, Partner, says I, you're going far, far away, where I may never see you again. Take this here nut, says I, and put it into the axle of the off-tine wheel of your wagon, and whenever you look at it hereafter, think of poor old Bill Dunning the milkman. THE CHINESE GOD I presume that I shall not be accused of sacrilege in referring to the Chinese god as an inferior piece of art. Viewed simply from an artistic and economical standpoint, it seems to me that the Chinaman should have less pride in his bow-legged and inefficient god than in any other national institution. I do not wish to be understood as interfering with any man's religious views, but when polygamy is made a divine decree, or a basewood deity is whittled out and painted red to look up to and to worship, I cannot treat that so-called religious belief with courtesy and reverence. I am quite liberal in all religious matters. People have noticed that and remarked it. But the Oriental God of Commerce seems to me to be greatly overrated. He seems to lack that genuine decision of character which should be a feature of an overruling power. I ask the phrenologist to come with me and examine the head of the alleged Josh, and to state whether or not he believes that the properly balanced head of a successful god should not have a more protuberant knob of spirituality and less pronounced alimentiveness. Should the bump of combativeness hang out over the year, while time, tune, and calculation are notably reticent? I certainly wot not. Again, how can the physiognomy of the celestial Josh be consistent with a moral and temperate God? The low brow would not indicate a pronounced omniscience, and the jumbo ears and the copious neck would not impress me with the idea of purity and spirituality. It is no doubt wrong to attack sacred matters for the purpose of gaining notoriety, 
but I believe I am right when I assert that the Chinese god must go. We should not be puritanical, but we might safely draw the line at the bow-legged and sedentary goddess of leprosy. If Confucius bowed the suppliant knee to that googly jim jam josh, I am grieved to know it. If such was the case, the friends of Confucius should keep the matter from me. I cannot believe that the great philosopher wallowed in the dust at the feet of such a polka dot caricature of a gorilla's horrid dream. I bought a Chinese god once for four bits. He was not successful in the profession which he aimed to follow. Whatever he may have been in China, he was not a very successful god in the English language. I put him upon the mantel, and the clock stopped. The servant girl sent in her resignation, and a large dog jumped through the parlor window. All this happened within two hours from the time I erected the lop-eared, knock-kneed, and club-footed oolong in my household. Perhaps this may have been largely due to my ignorance of his habits. Possibly if I had been more familiar with his eccentricities it would have been all right. But as it was, there was no book of instructions given with him, and I couldn't seem to make him work. During the week following, the prospect shaft of the New Jerusalem mine struck a subterranean gulf stream and waterlogged the stock. A tall yellow dog, under the weight of a great woe, picked out my cistern to suicide in. And I skated down the cellar stairs on my shoulder blades and the phrenological location known as Love of Home in such a terrible manner as to jar the foundations of the earth and kick a large hole out of the bosom of the night. I then met with a change of heart and overthrew the warty heathen god, and knocked him galley west. My hands at once began to watch the produce market, and noticing the high price of eggs commenced to orate with great zeal, instead of standing around with their hands in their pockets. I saw the new moon over my right shoulder, and all nature seemed gay once more. The above are a few of my reasons for believing that the Chinese god is either great Section 71 of Remarks. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mary Maxwell. Remarks by Bill Nye. Section 71. The Great Spiritualist. I have an uncle who is a physician, and a very busy one at that. He is a very active man and allows himself very little relaxation indeed. How many times he has said to me, well, I can't stand here and fool away my time with you. I've got a typhoid fever patient down in the lower end of town who will get well if I don't get over there this forenoon. He never allows himself any relaxation to speak of except to demonstrate the truth of spiritualism. He does love to monkey with the supernatural, and he delights in getting hold of some skeptical friend and convincing him of the presence of spirits beyond a doubt. I've known him to ignore two cases of croup and one case of twins to attend a seance and help convince a doubting Thomas on the spirit question. I believe that he and I, together with a little time in which to prepare, could convince the most skeptical. He says that with a friend to assist him who is en rapport, and who has a little practice, he can reach the stoniest heart. He is a very susceptible medium indeed, and created a great furor in his own town. He said it was a great comfort to him to converse with his former patients, and he felt kind of attached to them, so that he hated to be separated from them even in death. Spiritualism had quite a run in his neighborhood at one time, as I have said. Even his own family yielded to the convincing proof and the astounding phenomena. If his wife hadn't found some of his spiritual tracks down cellar, she would have remained firm, no doubt. But the doctor forgot and left his stepladder down there, and that showed where the hole in the floor opened into his mysterious cabinet. 
He said if he'd been a little more careful, no doubt he could have convinced anybody of the presence of spirits or anything else. He said he didn't intend to give up as long as there was anything left in the cellar. He had such unwavering confidence in the phenomena that all he asked of anybody was faith and a buckskin string about two feet long. He and his brother, a reformed member of Congress, read the inmost thoughts of a skeptical friend all one evening by the aid of supernatural powers and a tin tube. The reformed member of Congress acted as medium, and the doctor, who was unfortunately on and ostensibly called away into the country early in the evening, remained at the window outside, where he could read the queries written by the victim on a slip of paper. Then he would run around the house and murmur the same through a tin tube at another window by the medium's ear. It was astounding. The skeptical man would write some deep question on a slip of paper, and after the medium had felt of his brow and groaned a few hollow groans and rolled his eyes up, he would answer it without having been within twenty feet of the question or the questioner. The victim said he would never doubt again. What a comfort it was to know that immortality was an established fact. If he could have heard a man talking in a low tone of voice through an old tin dipper handle at the south window on the ground floor, and occasionally swearing at a mosquito on the back of his neck, he would have hesitated. An old-timer over there said that Woodworth would be a mighty good physician if he would let spiritualism alone. He claimed that no man could be a great physician and surgeon and still be a fanatic on spiritualism. General Sheridan's Horse I've always taken a great interest in war incidents, and more so, perhaps, because I wasn't old enough to put down the rebellion myself. I have been very eager to get hold of and hoard up in my memory all its gallant deeds of both sides, and to know the history of those who figured prominently in the great conflict has been one of my ambitions. I have also watched with interest the steady advancement of Phil Sheridan, the black-eyed warrior with the florid face and the Winchester record. I have also taken some pains to investigate the later history of the old Winchester war horse. Old Rienzi died in our stable a few years after the war, said a Chicago liveryman to me a short time ago. General Sheridan left him with us and instructed us to take good care of him, which we did, but he got old at last and his teeth failed upon him, and that busted his digestion, and he kind of died of old age, I reckon. How did General Sheridan take it? Oh, well, Phil Sheridan is no schoolgirl. He didn't turn away when old Rienzi died and weep the manger full of scalding regret. If you know Sheridan, you know that he didn't rip the blue dome of heaven wide open with unveiling wails. He just told us to take care of its remains, patted the old cuss on the head a little, and walked off. Phil Sheridan don't go around weeping softly into a pink-bordered wipe when a horse dies. He likes a good horse, but Rienzi was no J.I.C. for swiftness and he wasn't the prettiest horse you ever see, by no means. Did you read lately how General Sheridan don't ride on horseback since his old war horse died, and seems to have lost all interest in horses? No, I never did. He no doubt would rather ride in a cable car or a carriage than to jar himself up on a horse. That's all likely enough, but as I say, he's a matter-of-fact little fighter from Fight Town. He never stopped to snoot and paw up the ground and sob himself into bronchitis over old Rienzi. He went right on about his business, and like old King What's-His-Name, he hollered for another hoss, and the war department never slipped a cog. Later on, I read that the old war horse was called Winchester, and that he was still alive in a bluegrass pasture in Kentucky. The report said that old Winchester wasn't very coltish, and that he was evidently failing. I gathered the idea that he is wearing store teeth and that his memory was a little deficient, but he might live yet for years. After that, I met a New York livery stable prince, at whose palace General Sheridan's well-known Winchester war horse died of bots in 71. He told me all about it and how General Sheridan came on from Chicago at the time and held the horse's head in his lap while the fleet limbs that flew from Winchester down and saved the day stiffened in the great, mysterious repose of death. He said Sheridan wept like a child, and as he told the touching tale to me, I wept also. I say I wept. I wept about a quart, I would say. 
He said also that the horse's name wasn't Winchester nor Rienzi, it was Jim. I was sorry to know it. Jim is no name for a war horse who won a victory and a marble bust and a poem. You can't respect a horse much if his name was Jim. After that, I found out that General Sheridan's celebrated Winchester horse was raised in Kentucky, also in Pennsylvania and Michigan, that he went out as volunteer private, that he was in the regular service prior to the war, and that he was drafted, and that he died on the battlefield in a sorrel pasture in 73, in great pain on Governor's Island, that he was buried with Masonic honors by the Good Templars and the Grand Army of the Republic that he was resurrected by a medical college and dissected, that he was cremated in New Orleans and taxidermed for the Military Museum at New York. Every little while I run up against a new fact relative to this noted beast. He has died in nine different states and been buried in thirteen different styles, while his soul goes marching on. Evidently we live in an Section 72 of Remarks. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mary Maxwell. Remarks by Bill Nye. Section 72. A Circular. To my friends, regardless of party. Many friends, having solicited me to apply for a foreign mission under the present administration, I have finally consented to do so, and last week filled my application for such missions as might still remain vacant. To ensure my appointment, much will remain for you to do. I now call upon my friends to aid me by their united effort. I especially solicit the aid of my friends who have repeatedly heretofore promised it to me while drunk. You will see at a glance that I can only make the application. You must support it by your petitions and letters. It would be of little use for one man to write 5,000 letters to the president, but if 5,000 people each write him a letter in which casual reference is made to my social worth and seven and a third octave brain, it will make him pay attention. My idea would be for each of my friends to set aside one day in each week to write to the president opening it in a chatty way by asking him if he does not think we are having a rather backward spring, and what is he doing for his cutworms now, and how his folks are, etc., etc. Then gradually lead up to the statement that you think I would be an ornament to the administration if I should go abroad, and linger on a foreign strand at $2,000 per linger and stationery. This will keep the president properly stirred up and cause him to earn his salary, the effect will be to secure the appointment at last, as you will see if you persevere. I need not add that I will do what is right by my friends upon receiving my commission. Do not neglect this suggestion because it comes to you in the form of a circular, but remember it and act upon it. Remember that, although the president is stubborn as Sam Hill, he will at last yield to fatigue, and when tired nature can hold out no longer, the last letter will drop from his nerveless hand and he will surrender. Some of you will urge that I have been an offensive partisan, but when you come to think it over, I have not been so all-fired partisan. There have been days and days when it did not show itself very much. However, that is not the point. I want your hearty endorsement, and I want it to be entirely voluntary, and if you do not give it, and give it freely and voluntarily, you hadn't better ask me for any more favors. All the newspapers most heartily endorse me. The Rocky Mountain whoop! very truthfully says, Mr. Nye called at our office yesterday and subscribed for our paper. We are proud to add him to our list of paid-up subscribers, and should he renew his subscription next year, paying in advance, we will cheerfully refer to it among other startling news. I have a scrapbook full of such endorsements as this, and now, if my friends will peel their coats and write as they should, I can make this administration open its eyes. Several papers in Iowa have alluded to my being in town and referred to the fact that I had paid my bills while there, but press endorsements alone are not sufficient. What is needed is the written testimony of friends and neighbors. No matter how poor or humble or worthless you may be, 
write to mr cleveland and tell him how much confidence you have in me and if you can call to mind any little acts of kindness or any times when i have got up in the night to give you a dollar or nurse a colicky horse for you throw that in throw it in anyhow it will do no harm and may do much good i can solemnly promise all my friends that if they will secure my appointment to a foreign country for four years i will not return during that time what more can i offer i will stay longer if i am reappointed i would do anything for my friends do not throw this circular carelessly aside read it carefully over and act upon it some of you are poor spellers and will try to get out of it that way others are in the penitentiary and cannot spare the time but to one and all i say write and write regularly to the president do not wait for a reply from him because he is pretty busy now but he will be tickled to death to hear from you and anything you say about me will give him great pleasure. N.B. Please be careful not to enclose this circular in your letter to the President. The Photograph Habit No doubt the photograph habit, when once formed, is one of the most baneful and productive of the most intense suffering in after years, of any with which we are familiar. Sometimes it seems to me that my whole life has been one long abject apology for photographs that I have shed abroad throughout a distracted country. Man passes through seven distinct stages of being photographed, each one exceeding all previous efforts in that line. First, he is photographed as a prattling, bald-headed baby, absolutely destitute of eyes, but making up for this deficiency by a wealth of mouth that would make a Negro minstrel olive green with envy. We often wonder what has given the average photographer that wild, hunted look about the eyes and that joyless sag about the knees. The chemicals in the indoor life alone have not done all this. It is the great nerve tension and mental strain used in trying to photograph a squirming and dark red child with white eyes in such a manner as to please its parents. An old-fashioned dollar store album with cerebrospinal meningitis and filled with pictures of half-suffocated children in heavily starched white dresses is the first thing we seek on entering a home and the last thing from which we reluctantly part. The second stage on the downward road is the photograph of a boy with fresh cropped hair and in which the stiff and protuberant thumb takes a leading part. Then follows the portrait of the lad, with strongly marked freckles and a look of hopeless melancholy. With the aid of a detective agency, I have succeeded in running down and destroying several of these pictures which were attributed to me. Next comes the young man, 21 years of age, with his front hair plastered smoothly down over his tender, throbbing dome of thought. He does not care so much about the expression on the mobile features, so long as his left hand, with the new ring on it, shows distinctly, and the string of jingling, jangling charms on his watch chain, including the cute little basket cut out of a peach stone, stand out well in the foreground. If the young man would stop to think for a moment that some day he may become eminent and ashamed of himself, he would hesitate about doing this. Soon after, he has a tintype taken in which a young lady sits in the alleged grass, while he stands behind her with his hand lightly touching her shoulder as though he might be feeling the thrilling circumference of a buzz saw. He carries this picture in his pocket for months and looks at it whenever he may be unobserved. Then, all at once, he discovers that the young lady's hair is not done up that way any more, and that her hat doesn't seem to fit her. He then, in a fickle moment, has another tintype made, in which another young woman, with a more recent hat and later coiffure, is discovered holding his hat in her lap. This thing continues till one day he comes into the studio with his wife and tries to see how many children can be photographed on one negative by holding one on each knee and using the older ones as a background. The last stage in his eventful career, the old gentleman allows himself to be photographed because he is afraid that he may not live through another long, hard winter and the boys would like a picture of him while he is able to climb the dark, narrow stairs which lead to the artist's room. Sadly, the thought comes back to you in after years, when his grave is green in the quiet valley, and the worn and weary hands that have toiled for you are forever at rest, how patiently he submitted while his daughter pinned the clean, stiff, agonizing white collar about his neck, and brushed the velvet collar of his best coat. 
how he toiled up the long, dark, lonesome stairs, not with the egotism of a half century ago, but with the light of anticipated rest at last in his eyes, obediently, as he would have gone to the dingy law office to have his will drawn, and meekly left the outlines of his kind old face for those he loved and for whom he had so long labored. It is a picture at which the thoughtless may smile, but it is full of pathos and eloquent for those who knew him best. His attitude is stiff and his coat hunches up in the back, but his kind old heart asserts itself through the gentle eyes, and when he has gone away at last, we do not criticize the picture any more, but beyond the old coat that bunches up in the back and that lasted him so long, we read the history of a noble life. Silently, the old finger-marked album, lying so unostentatiously on the grouty center table, points out the milestones from infancy to age, and back of the mistakes of a struggling photographer is portrayed the laughter and the tears, the joy and the grief, Section 73 of Remarks. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Bruce Kachuk. Remarks by Bill Nye. Section 73. Rosalind. In answer to a former article relative to the dearth of woman here, we are now receiving two to five letters per day from all classes and styles of young, middle-aged, and old women who desire to come to Wyoming. Some of them would like to come here to work and obtain an honest livelihood, and some of them desire to come here and marry cattle kings. A recent letter from Michigan, written in lead pencil, and evidently during hours when the writer should have been learning her geography lesson, is very enthusiastic over the prospect of coming out here where one girl can have a lover for every day in the week. She signs herself Rosalind with a small R, and adds in a postscript that she means business. Yes, Rosalind, that's what we are afraid of. We had a kind of a vague fear that you meant business, so we did not reply to your letter. Wyoming already has women enough who write with a lead pencil. We are also pretty well provided with poor spellers, and we do not desire to ransack Michigan for affectionate but sap-headed girls. Stay in Michigan, Rosalind, until we write to you, and one of these days when you have been a mother eight or nine times, and as you stand in the golden haze in the backyard, hanging out damp shirts on an uncertain line, while your ripe and dewy mouth is stretched around a basswood clothespin, you will thank us for this advice. Michigan is the place for you. It is the home of the sweet singer, and the abiding place of the Detroit Free Press. We can't throw any such influences around you here as those you have at your own door. Do not despair, Rosalind. Some day a man with a great warm manly heart and a pair of red steers will see you and love you and he will take you in his strong arms and protect you from the Michigan climate just as devotedly as any of our people here can. We do not wish to be misunderstood in this matter. It is not as a lover that we have said so much on the girl question, but in the domestic aid department. And when we get a long letter from a young girl who eats slate pencils and reads Ouida behind her atlas, we feel like going over there to Michigan with a trunk strap and doing a little missionary work. THE CHURCH DEBT I have been thinking the matter over seriously, and I have decided that if I had my life to live over again, I would like to be an eccentric millionaire. I have eccentricity enough, but I cannot successfully push it without more means. I have a great many plans which I would like to carry out in case I could unite the two necessary elements for the production of the successful eccentric millionaire. Among other things, I would be willing to bind myself and give proper security to anyone who would put in money to offset my eccentricity. That I would ultimately die. We all know how seldom the eccentric millionaire now dies. 
i would be willing to inaugurate a reform in that direction i think now that i would endow a home for men whose wives are no longer able to support them in many cases the wife who was at first able to support her husband comfortably finally shoulders a church debt and in trying to lift that she overworks and impairs her health so that she becomes an invalid while her husband is left to pine away in solitude or dependent on the cold charities of the world my heart goes out toward those men even now and in case i should fill the grave of the eccentric millionaire i am sure that i would do the square thing by them the method by which our wives in america are knocking the church debt silly by working up their husbands groceries into angel food and selling them below actual cost is deserving of the attention of our national financiers the church debt itself is deserving of notice in this country it certainly thrives better under a republican form of government than any other feature of our boasted civilization western towns spring up everywhere and the first anxiety is to name the place the second to incur a church debt and establish a roller rink after that a general activity in trade is assured of course the general hostility of church and rink will prevent ennui and listlessness and the church debt will encourage a business boom naturally the church debt cannot be paid without what is generally known through the west as the festival and hoorah this festival is an open market where the ladies trade the groceries of their husbands to other ladies husbands and everybody has a perfectly lovely time the church clears two dollars thirty cents and thirteen ladies are sick all the next day this makes a boom for the physicians and later on for the undertaker and general tombist so it will be seen that the western town is right in establishing a church debt as soon as the survey is made and the town properly named after the first church debt has been properly started others will rapidly follow so that no anxiety need be felt if the church will come forward the first year and buy more than it can pay for the church debt is a comparatively modern appliance and yet it has been productive of many peculiar features for instance we call to mind the clergyman who makes a specialty of going from place to place as a successful debt demolisher he is part of the general system just as much as the ice cream freezer or the buttonhole bouquet then there is a row or social knockdown and drag out which goes along with the church debt all these things add to the general interest and to acquire interest in one way or another is the mission of the c d i once knew a most exemplary woman who became greatly interested in the wiping out of a church debt and who did finally succeed in wiping out the debt but in its last expiring death struggle it gave her a wipe from which she never recovered she had succeeded in begging the milk and the cream and the eggs and the sandwiches and the use of the dishes and the sugar and the loan of an oyster and the use of a freezer and fifty buttonhole bouquets to be sold to men who were not in the habit of wearing bouquets but she could not borrow a circular artist to revolve the crank of the freezer so she agitated it herself her husband had to go away prior to the festivities but he ordered her not to crank the freezer he had very little influence with her however and so to-day he is a widower the church debt was revived in the following year and now there isn't a more thriving church debt anywhere in the country only last week that church traded off seventy five dollars worth of groceries in the form of asbestos cake and celluloid angel food in such a way that if the original cost of the groceries and the work were not considered the clear profit was thirteen dollars after the whole rent was paid and why should the first cost of the groceries be reckoned when we stop to think that they were involuntarily furnished by the depraved husband and father i must add also that in the above Section 74 of Remarks. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. 
For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Remarks by Bill Nye Section 74 A Collection of Keys I'm getting to be quite a connoisseur of hotel keys as I get older. For ten years I have been collecting these mementos of travel and cording them away in my key cabinet. Some have square brass tags attached to them, others have round ones. Still others affect the octagonal, the fluted, the hexagonal, the scalloped, the plain, the polished, the decorated, the chaste, the etruscan, the metropolitan, the rural, the cosmopolitan, the sheared, the tucked, the biased, the high neck and long sleeve, or the decollette style of brass check. I have so far paid my bills, but I have not returned the keys to my room. Hotel proprietors will please take notice and govern themselves accordingly. When my visit to a pleasant city has become a beautiful memory only, I all at once sit down on something hard, and find that it is the key to my former room at the hotel. Sitting down on a key tag of corrugated brass, as big as a buckwheat pancake, would remind most any one of something or other. I generally leave my toothbrush in my room and carry off the key as a kind of involuntary swap, so far as the hotel proprietor is concerned, but I do not think it is a mutual benefit particularly. I cannot use the key to a hotel five hundred miles away, and so far as a toothbrush is concerned, it generally has pleasant associations only for the owner. A man is fond of his own toothbrush, but it takes years for him to love the toothbrush of a stranger. There are a good many associations attached to these keys, like the tags. They point backward to the rooms to which the keys belong. Here is a fat one that led to room number thirty-three and a half in the synagogue hotel. It was a cheerful room where the bell-boy said an old man had asphyxiated himself with gas the previous week. I had never met the old man before, but that night, about one o'clock a.m., I had the pleasure of his acquaintance. He came in a sad and reproachful way, and showed me how the post-mortem people had disfigured him. Of course, it was a little tough to be mutilated by an inquest, but that's no reason why he should come back there and occupy a room that I was paying for so that I could be alone. He showed me how he blew out the gas, and told me how a man could successfully blow down the muzzle of a shotgun or a gas jet, but both of these weapons had a way of blowing back. I have a key that brings back to me the memory of a room that I lived in two days at one time. I do not mean that I lived the two days at once, but that at one period I occupied that room partially for two days and two nights. I say I partially occupied it because I used to occupy it days and share it nights with others. That is, I tried to occupy it nights. I tried to get the clerk to throw off something because I didn't have the exclusive use of the room. He wouldn't throw off anything. He even wanted to fight me because I said that the room was occupied before I got it and after I left it. Finally, I told him that if he would throw a bedquilt over his diamond so I could see him, I would fight him with buckwheat cakes at five hundred miles. I took my position the next morning at the place appointed, but he did not appear. Extracts from a Queen's Diary January 1st I awoke late this forenoon with a pain through the head and a taste of ennui in the mouth, which I can hardly account for. Can it be a result of the party last evening? I ween it may be so. We had a lovely card party last evening. It was very enjoyable indeed. Whist was the game. January 3rd Yesterday all day I was unable to leave my room owing to a headache and nervous prostration, caused by late hours and too much company, the doctor said. It is too bad, and yet I do so much enjoy our card parties in the excitement of the game. Tonight I am to take part in a little quiet game of draw poker, I think they call it. I have not had any experience heretofore of the game, but trust I shall soon learn it. There has been some talk about one pound ante and five pound limit. I do not exactly understand the terms. I hope it does not mean anything wrong. January 4th Poker is an odd game indeed. I think it quite exciting, though at first the odd terms rather confused me. I had not been accustomed to such phrases as showdown, bobtail flush, and king full. I must ask Brown, as soon as his knees are able to be out, to explain the meaning of these terms a little more fully to me. 
"'If poor Brown's knees are not better soon, I shall be on uneasy about him.' Here the diary has the appearance of being blurred with tears. "'A bobtail flush, I learn, is something very disagreeable to have. One gentleman said last evening that another bobtail flush would certainly paralyze him. I gather from that that it is something like a hectic flush.' I can understand the game called Old Sledge, and have become quite familiar with such terms as Beg, Give Me One, I've Got the Thin One, How High Is That, One Horse On Me, Saw Off, etc., etc., but poker is full of surprises. It seems so odd to see a gentleman show out on a pair of deuces, and gather in upward of two pounds with great merriment, while the remainder of the party seem quite bored. One gentleman last evening showed out on a full hand with trays at the head, putting three pound twelve shillings in his purse with great glee, while another one of the party who had not shown up, but I am positive had a better hand, became so angered that he got up and kicked four front teeth out of the mouth of a favorite dog worth twenty pounds. I took part in a spade flush during the evening and was quite successful, so that I can easily pay my traveling expenses and have a few shillings to buy ointment for poor Brown. It was my first winning, and made me quiver all over with excitement. The game is already very fascinating to me, and I am becoming passionately fond of it. January 6th. I have just learned fully what a bobtail flush is. It cost me fifty pounds. I like information, but I do not like to buy it when it comes so high. I drew two to fill in a heart flush last evening, and advanced the money to back up my judgment, but one of the hearts I drew was a club which was entirely useless to me. I have sent out a sheriff with a bulldog to ascertain if he can find the whereabouts of the party who started this poker game. I do not know when I have felt so bored. After that I was so timid that I allowed a friend to walk off with two pounds on a pair of deuces. I said to him that I called that a deuced bore, and he laughed heartily. I find that you should not be too ready to show by your countenance whether you are bored or pleased in poker. To her opponent will take advantage of it and play accordingly. It cost me eight pound ten shillings to acquire a knowledge of this fact. If all the information I ever got had cost me as much as this poker wisdom, I would not now have two pennies to jingle together in my purse. Still, we have had a good time, take it all in all, and I shall not soon forget the evenings we have spent here together buying knowledge regardless of cost. I think I shall try to control my wild thirst for information a while, however, till I can get some more funds. Here the diary breaks off abruptly, and on turning the book over we find the royal signature at the foot of the Section 75 of Remarks. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Diana Schmidt. Remarks by Bill Nye. Section 75. Shorts. A Colorado burro has been shipped across the Atlantic and presented to the Prince of Wales. It is a matter of profound national sorrow that this was not the first American jackass presented to his tallness, the prince. At Omaha last week, a barrel of sauerkraut rolled out of a wagon and struck O'Leary H. Olson, who was trying to unload it with such force as to kill him instantly and to flatten him out like a kiln-dried codfish still after thousands of such instances on record there are many scientists who maintain that sauerkraut is conducive to longevity as an evidence of the healthfulness of mountain climate the people of denver point to a man who came there in seventy seven without flesh enough to bait a trap and now he puts sleeves in an ordinary feather bed and pulls it on over his head for a shirt people in poor health who wish to communicate with the writer in relation to the facts above stated are requested to enclose two unlicked postage stamps to ensure a reply at ube montana during the cold snap in january 
one of the most inhuman outrages known in the annals of crime was perpetrated upon a young man who went west in the fall hoping to make his pile in time to return in may and marry the new york heiress selected before he went while stopping at the hotel two frolicsome young women hired the porter to procure the young man's pantaloons at dead of night they then sewed up the bottoms of the legs threw the doctored garment back through the transom and squealed fire when he got into the hall he was vainly trying to stab one foot through the limb of his pantaloons while he danced around on the other and joined the general cry of fire the hall seemed filled with people who were running this way and that ostensibly seeking a mode of egress from the flames but in reality trying to dodge the mad efforts of the young man who was trying to insert himself in his obstinate pantaloons he did not tumble as it were until the night watchman got a babbock fire extinguisher and played on him i do not know what he played on him very likely it was sister what are the wild waves saying anyway he staggered into his room and although he could hear the audience outside in their wild tumultuous encore he refused to come before the curtain but unlocked his door and sobbed himself to sleep how often do we forget the finer feelings of others and ignore their sorrow while we revel in some great joy we the world is full of literary people to-day and they are divided into three classes viz those who have written for the press those who are writing for the press and those who want to write for the press of the first there are those who tried it and found that they could make more in half the time at something else and so quit the field and those who failed to touch the great heart and pocket-book of the public and therefore subsided those who are writing for the press now whether putting together copy by the mile within the sound of the rumbling engine and press or scattered through the country writing more at their leisure find that they have to lay aside every weight and throw off all encumbrances of the mossy past one thing however still clings to the editor like a dab of paste on a white vest or golden fleck of scrambled egg on a tawny moustache one relic of barbarism rears in gaunt form amid the clash and hurry and rush of civilization and in the dazzling light of science and smartness it is we the budding editor of the rural civilizer for the first time peels his coat and sharpens his pencil to begin the work of changing the great current of public opinion he is strong in his desire to knock error and wrong galley west he has buckled on his armor to paralyze monopoly and purify the ballot he has hitched up his pantaloons with a noble resolve and covered his table with virgin paper he is young and he is a little egotistical also he wants to say i believe so and so but he can't perspiration breaks out all over him he bites his pencil and looks up with his clenched hand in his hair the slimy demon of the editor's life is there sitting on the cloth-bound volume containing the report of the united states superintendent of swine diseases wherever you find a young man unloading a washington hand press to fill a long-felt want there you will find the ghastly and venomous we ready to look over the shoulder of the timid young mental athlete wherever you find a ring of printer's ink around the doorknob and the snowy towel on which the foreman wipes the pink tips of his alabaster fingers you will find the slimy scaly folds of we curled up in some neighboring corner from the huge metropolitan journal whose subscribers could make or bust a president or make a blooming king wish he had never been born down to the obscure and unknown dodger whose first page is mostly electrotype head whose second and third pages are patent whose news is eloquent of the dear dead past whose fourth page ushers in a new baby 
or heralds the coming of the circus or promulgates the fact that its giant editor has a felon on his thumb the trail of the serpent we is all over them it is all we have to remind us of royalty in america with the exception perhaps Section 76 of Remarks. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Bruce Kachuk. Remarks by Bill Nye. Section 76 A Mountain Snowstorm september does not always indicate golden sunshine and ripening corn and old gold pumpkin pies on the half shell we look upon it as the month of glorious perfection in the handiwork of the seasons and the time when the ripened fruits are falling when the red sun hides behind the bronze and misty evening and says good night with reluctance to the beautiful harvests and the approaching twilight of the year it was on a red-letter day of this kind years ago that wheeler and myself started out under the charge of judge blair and sheriff baswell to visit the mines at last chance and more especially the keystone a gold mine that the judge had recently become president of the soft air of second summer in the rocky mountains blew gently past our ears as we rode up the valley of the little laramie to camp the first night at the head of the valley behind sheep mountain the whole party was full of joy even judge blair with the frosts of over sixty winters in his hair broke forth into song that's the only thing i ever had against judge blair he would forget himself sometimes and burst forth into song the following day we crossed the divide and rode down the gulch into the camp on douglas creek where the musical thunder of the stamp mills seemed to jar the ground and the rapid stream below bore away on its turbid bosom the yellowish tinge of the golden quartz it was a perfect day and wheeler and i blessed our stars and instead of breathing the air of sour paste and hot presses in the newspaper offices away in the valley we were sprawling in the glorious sunshine of the hills playing draw poker with the miners in the evening and forgetful of the daily newspaper where one man does the work and the other draws the salary it was heaven it was such luxury that we wanted to swing our hats and yell like arapahoes the next morning we were surprised to find that it had snowed all night and was snowing still i never saw such flakes of snow in my life they came sauntering through the air like pure white turkish towels falling from celestial clotheslines we did not return that day we played a few games of chance but they were brief we finally made it five cent ante and as i was working then for an alleged newspaper man who paid me fifty dollars per month to edit his paper nights and take care of his children daytimes i couldn't keep abreast of the judge the sheriff and the superintendent of the keystone the next day we had to go home the snow lay ankle-deep everywhere and the air was chilly and raw wheeler and i tried to ride but the mountain road was so rough that the horses could barely move through the snow dragging the buggy after them so we got out and walked on ahead to keep warm we gained very fast on the team for we were both long-legged and measured off the miles like a hired man going to dinner i wore a pair of glove-fitting low shoes and lyle thread socks i can remember that yet i would advise anyone going into the mines not to wear lyle thread socks and low shoes you are liable to stick your foot into a snowbank or a mud hole and dip up too much water i remember that after we had walked through the pine woods down the mountain road a few miles i noticed that the bottoms of my pantaloons looked like those of a drowned tramp i saw many years ago in the morgue we gave out after a while waited for the team but decided that it had gone the other road all at once it flashed over us that we were alone in the woods and the storm 
wet nearly starved ignorant of the road and utterly worn out it was tough i never felt so blue so wet so hungry or so hopeless in my life we moved on a little farther all at once we came out of the timber there was no snow whatever at that moment the sun burst forth we struck a deserted supply wagon found a two-pound can of boston baked beans got an axe from the load chopped open the can and had just finished the tropical fruit of massachusetts when our own team drove up and joy and hope made their homes once more in our hearts we may learn from this a valuable lesson but at this moment i do not know exactly what it is lost money most anyone could collect and tell a good many incidents about lost money that has been found if he would try but these cases came under my own observation and i can vouch for their truth a farmer in the kinnick valley was paid one thousand dollars while he was loading hay he put it in his vest pocket and after he had unloaded the hay he discovered that he had lost it and no doubt had pitched the whole load into the mow on top of it he went to work and pitched it all out a handful at a time upon the barn floor and when the hired man's fork tine came up with a one hundred dollar bill on it he knew they had struck a lead he got it all a man gave me two five-dollar bills once to pay a balance on some store teeth and asked me to bring the teeth back with me the dentist was fifteen miles away and when i got there i found i had lost the money that was before i had amassed much of a fortune so i went to the tooth foundry and told the foreman that i had started with ten dollars to get a set of teeth for an intimate friend but had lost the funds he said that my intimate friend would no doubt have to gum it a while owing to the recent shrinkage in values he was obliged to sell teeth for cash as the goods were comparatively useless after they had been used one season i went back over the same road the next day and found the money by the side of the road although a hundred teams had passed by it a young man one spring ploughed a pocket-book and thirty dollars in greenbacks under and by a singular coincidence the next spring it was ploughed out and though rotten clear through was sent to the treasury where it was discovered that the bills were on a michigan national bank whither they were sent and redeemed i lost a roll of a hundred dollars the spring of eighty two and hunted my house and the office through in search for it in vain i went over the road between the office and the house twenty times but it was useless i then advertised the loss of the money giving the different denominations of the bills and stating as was the case that there was an elastic band around the roll when lost the paper had not been issued more than an hour before i got my money every dollar of it it was in the pocket of my other vest this should teach us first the value of advertising and secondly the utter folly of two vests at the same time apropos of recent bank failures i want to tell this one on james s kelly commonly called black jim he failed himself along in the fifties and by a big struggle had made out to pay everybody but low bartlett to whom he was indebted in the sum of eighteen dollars he got this money finally and as low wasn't in town black jim put it in a bank the name of which has long ago sunk into oblivion in fact it began the oblivion business about forty-eight hours after jim had put his funds in there meeting low on the street jim said your money is up in the wild old bank low i'll give you a check for it no use old man she's gone up no yes she's a total wreck jim went over to the president's room he knocked as easy as he could considering that his breath was coming so hard who's there it's jim kelly black jim and i'm in something of a hurry well i'm very busy mr kelly come again this afternoon that will be too remote i'm very busy myself now is the accepted time will you open the door or shall i open it the president opened it because it was a good door and he wanted to preserve it black jim turned the key in the door and sat down what did you want of me says the president i wanted to see you about a certificate of deposit i've got here on your bank for eighteen dollars we can't pay it everything is gone 
Well, I'm here to get eighteen dollars or to leave you looking like a giblet pie. Eighteen dollars will relieve you of this mental strain. But if you do not put up, I will pay for this wall with your classic features and ruin the carpet with what remains. The president hesitated a moment. Then he took a roll out of his boot and paid Jim eighteen dollars. You will not mention this on the street, of course, said the president. No, says Jim. Not till I get there. When the crowd got back, however, the president had fled, and he has remained fled ever since. The longer he remained away and thought it over, the more he became attached to Canada, and the more of a confirmed and incurable fugitive he became. I saw Black Jim last evening, and he said he had passed through two bank failures, but had always realized on his certificates of deposit. One cashier told Jim that he was the homeliest man that ever looked through the window of a busted bank. He said Kelly looked like a man who ate bank ca Section 77 of Remarks. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mary Maxwell. Remarks by Bill Nye. Section 77. Dr. Dysart's Dog. A man whose mother-in-law had been successfully treated by the doctor one day presented him with a beautiful Italian hound named Nemesis. When I say that the able physician had treated the mother-in-law successfully, I mean successfully from her son-in-law's standpoint and not from her own, for the doctor insisted on treating her for smallpox when she had nothing but an attack of agnostics. She is now sitting on the front stoop of the Golden Wentz. So after the last sad rites, the broken-hearted son-in-law presented the physician with a handsome hound with long, slender legs and a wire tail as a token of esteem and regard. The dog was young and playful, as all young dogs are, so he did many little tricks which amused almost everyone. One day, while the doctor was at way administering a subcutaneous injection of morphine to a hay fever patient, he left Nemesis in the office alone with a piece of rag carpet and his surging thoughts. At first, Nemesis closed his eyes and breathed hard. Then he arose and ate part of an ottoman. Then he got up and scratched the paper off the office wall and whined in a sad tone of voice. A young Italian hound has a peculiarly sad and depressing song. Then Nemesis got up on the desk and poured the ink and mucilage into one of the drawers on some bandages and condition powders that the doctor used in his horse practice. Nemesis then looked out of the window and wailed. He filled the room with robust wail and unavailing regret. After that, he tried to dispel his ennui with one of the doctor's old felt hats that hung on a chair, but the hair oil with which it was saturated changed his mind. The doctor had magenta hair, and to tone it down so that it would not raise the rate of fire insurance on his office, he used to execute some studies on it in oil, bear's oil. This gave his hair a rich mahogany shade, and his hat smelled and looked like an oil refinery. That is the reason Nemesis spared the hat, and ate a couple of porous plasters that his master was going to use on the case of croup. At that time the doctor came in, and the dog ran to him with a glad cry of pleasure, rubbing his cold nose against his master's hand. The able veterinarian spoke roughly to Nemesis, and throwing a cigar stub at him, broke two of the animal's delicate legs. After that, there was a low discordant murmur and the angry hum of medical works, lung testers, glass jars containing tumors and other bric-a-brac, paperweights, and Italian greyhound bisecting the orbit of a red-headed horse physician with dude shoes. When the police came in, it was found that Nemesis had jumped through a glass door and escaped on two legs in his ear. Out through the autumnal haze, across the intervening plateau, over the low foothills and up the Medicine Bow Range, on and ever onward sped the timid, grieved, and broken-hearted pup, 
accumulating with wonderful eagerness the intervening distance between himself and the cruel promoter of the fly blister and lingering death. How often do we thoughtlessly grieve the hearts of those who love us, and drive forth into the pitiless world those who would gladly lick our hands with their warm loving tongues, or warm their cold noses in the meshes of our neck. How prone are we to forget the devotion of a dumb brute that thoughtlessly eats our lace lambrequins, and ere we have stopped to consider our mad course, we have driven the loving heart and the warm wet tongue and the cold little black nose out of our home life, perhaps into the cold, cold grave or the bleak and relentless pound. Chinese Justice they do things differently in China. Here in America, when a man burgles your residence, you go and confide in a detective who keeps your secret and gets another detective to help him. Generally, that is the last of it. In China, not long ago, the house of a missionary was entered and valuables taken by the thieves. The missionary went to the authorities with his tale and told them whom he suspected. That's the last he heard of it for three weeks. Then he received a covered champagne basket from the Department of Justice. On opening it, he found the heads of the suspected burglars packed in tinfoil and in a good state of preservation. These heads were not sent necessarily for publication, but as an evidence of good faith on the part of the Department of Unimpeded Justice. Mind you, there was no postponement of the preliminary examination, no dilatory motions and changes of venue, no pleas to the jurisdiction of the court, no legal delays and final challenges of jurors until an idiotic jury had been procured who hadn't read the papers, no ruling out of damaging testimony, and finally filing of a bill of exceptions, no appeal and delay or appeal afterward to another court which returned the defendant to the court of the original jurisdiction for review, and years of waiting for the prosecuting witnesses to die of old age and thus release the defendant. There is nothing of that kind in China. You just hand in your orders to the judicial end of the administration, and then you retire. Later on, the delivery man brings in your package of heads, makes a salam, and goes away. Now this is swift and speedy justice for you. I don't know how the guilt of the defendants is arrived at, but there's nothing tedious about it. At least there's nothing tedious to the complainant, I presume they make it red-hot for the criminal. Still, this style of justice has its drawbacks. For instance, you are at dinner. You have a large and select company dining with you. You're about to carve the roast. There is a ring at the door. The servant announces that a judicial officer is at the drawbridge and desires to speak with you. You pull your napkin out of your bosom lay the carving knife down on the virgin tablecloth, and go to the door. There the minister of justice prevents you with a champagne basket and retires. You return to the dining hall, leaving your basket on the sideboard. After a while, you announce to your guests that you have just received a basket of mums extra dry with the compliments of the government, and that you will, with the permission of those present, open a bottle. You arm yourself with a corkscrew, open the basket, and thoughtlessly tip it over when two or three human heads, with a pained and grieved expression on the face, roll out on the table. When you are looking for a quart bottle of sparkling wine, and find instead the cold, sad features and reproachful stare of the extremely deceased and he yaket Chinaman, you naturally betray your chagrin. I like to see justice moderately swift, and in fact I've seen it pretty forthwith in its movements two or three times but I cannot say that I would be prepared for this style. Perhaps I am getting a little nervous in my old age, and a small matter jars my equilibrium, but I am sure a basket of heads handed in as I was seated at the table would startle me a little at first, and I might forget myself. A friend of mine, under such circumstances, made what the English would call a deuced clever remark in Shanghai. When he opened the basket, he was horrified, but he was cool, he was an old sang Freud from sang Freudville. He first took the basket and started for the back room with the remark, My friends, I guess you'll have to excuse me.
Section 78 of Remarks. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mary Maxwell. Remarks by Bill Nye. Section 78. Answers to Correspondence. Caller. Your calling cards should be modest as to size and neatly engraved, with an extra flourish. In calling, there are two important things to be considered. First, when to call, and second, when to rise and hang on the door handle. Some make one-third of the call before rising, and then complete the call while airing the house and holding the door open, while others consider this low and vulgar, making at least one-fourth of the call in the hall, and one-half between the front door and the gate. Different authorities differ as to the proper time for calling. Some think you should not call before 3 or after 5 p.m., but if you have had any experience and had ordinary sense to start with, you will know when to call as soon as you look at your hand. Amateur Prize Fighter The boxing glove is a large upholstered buckskin mitten with an abnormal thumb and a string by which it is attached to the wrist so that when you feed it to an adversary, he cannot swallow it and choke himself. There are two kinds of glove, viz. hard gloves and soft gloves. I once fought with soft gloves to a finish with a young man who was far my inferior intellectually, but he exceeded me in brute force and knowledge of the use of the gloves. He was not so tall, but he was wider than myself. Longitudinally, he was my inferior, but latitudinally, he outstripped me. We did not fight a regular prize fight. It was just done for pleasure. But I do not think we should abandon ourselves entirely to pleasure. It is enervating and makes one eye swell up and turn blue. I still think that a young man ought to have a knowledge of the manly art of self-defense. And if I could acquire such a knowledge without getting into a fight about it, I would surely learn how to defend myself. The boxing glove is worn on the hand of one party, and on the gory nose of the other party as the game progresses. Soft gloves very rarely kill anyone unless they work down into the bronchial tubes and shut off the respiration. Lecturer, New York City You need not worry so much about your costume until you have written your lecture, and it would be a good idea to test the public a little, if possible, before you do much expensive printing. Your idea seems to be that a man should get a fine lithograph of himself and a hundred dollar suit of clothes and then write his lecture to fit the lithograph and the clothes. That is erroneous. You say that you have written a part of your lecture, but do not feel satisfied with it. In this you will no doubt find many people will agree with you. You could wear a full dress suit of black with propriety or a Prince Albert coat with your hand thrust into the bosom of it. I once lectured on the subject of phrenology in the southern portion of Utah, being at that time temporarily busted, but still hoping to tide over the dull times by delivering a lecture on the subject of brains and how to detect their presence. I was not supplied with a phrenological bust at that time, and as such a thing is almost indispensable, I borrowed a young man from Provost and introduced him to act as bust for the evening. He did so with thrilling effect taking the entire gross receipts of the lecture course from my coat pocket while I was illustrating the effect of alcoholic stimulants on the raw brain of an adult in a state of health. You can remove spots of egg from your full dress suit with ammonia and water, applied by means of a common nail brush. You do not ask for this recipe, but, judging from your style, I hope that it may be of use to you. Martin F. Tupper, Texas the poem to which you allude was written by Julia A. Moore, better known as the Sweet Singer of Michigan. The last stanza was something like this. My childhood days are past and gone, and it fills my heart with pain to think that youth will never more return to me again. And now, kind friends, what I have wrote, I hope you will pass o'er, and not criticize as some has hitherto here before done. Miss Moore also wrote a volume of poems which the farmers of Michigan are still using on their potato bugs. She wrote a large number of poems, all more or less saturated with grief and damaged syntax. She is now said to be a fugitive from justice. We should learn from this that we cannot evade the responsibility of our acts, and those who write obituary poetry will one day be overtaken by a bobtail sleuth hound 
or a Siberian nemesis with two rows of teeth. Alonzo G. Smithville. Yes, you can learn three-card Monty without a master. It is very easy. The book will cost you 25 cents, and then you can practice on various people. The book is a very small item you will find after you've been practicing a while. Three-card Monty and justifiable homicide go hand in hand. Two, you can turn a jack from the bottom of the pack in the old sledge if you live in some states, but west of the Missouri the air is so light that men who have tried it have frequently waked up on the shore of eternity with a half-turned jack in their hand and a hole in the cerebellum the size of an English walnut. You can get poker in three-card money without a master for 60 cents with a coroner's verdict thrown in. If you contemplate a career as a Monty man, you should wear a pair of low, loose shoes that you can kick off easily unless you want to die with your boots on. Henry Ubit, Montana. No, you are mistaken in your assumption that Socrates was the author of the maxim to which you allude. It is of more modern origin, and, in fact, the sentence of which you speak, viz., what a combination of conflicting and paradoxical assertions is life, of what use are logic and argument when we find the true inwardness of the bologna sausage on the outside, were written by a philosopher who is still living. I am willing to give Socrates credit for what he has said and done, but when I think of a sentiment that is worthy to be graven on a monolith and passed on down to prosperity, I do not want to have it attributed to such men as Socrates. Leonora Vivian Gobb, Bolison's Forks, Arizona Yes, you can turn the front breaths, let out the tucks and the side plating, and based on New Dagon, where you caught the oyster stew in your lap at the party. You could also get trusted for a new dress, perhaps, but that is a matter of taste. Some dealers are wearing their open accounts long this winter, and some are not. Do as you think best about cleaning the dress. Benzene will sometimes eradicate an oyster stew from dress goods. It will also eradicate everyone in the room at the same time. I have known a pair of rejuvenated kid gloves to break up a funeral that started out with every prospect of success. Benzene is an economical thing to use, but socially it is not up to the standard. Another idea has occurred to me, however. Why not rip-wrap the skirt, caulk the salvages, readjust the box plaits, cat-stitch the crown sheet, file down the gores, sandpaper the gaiters, and discharge the dolman? You could then wear the garment anywhere in the evening, and half the people wouldn't know anything had happened to it. James Awatona, Minnesota You can easily teach yourself to play on the tuba. You know what Shakespeare says, tuba or not tuba? That's the question. How true this is? It touches every heart. It is as good a soliloquy as I have ever read. P.S. Please do not swallow the tuba while practicing and choke yourself to death. It would be a shame for you to swallow a nice new tuba and cast a gloom over it so that no one else would ever want to play on it again. Florence. You can stimulate your hair by using castor oil three ounces, brandy one ounce. Put the oil on the sewing machine and absorb the brandy between meals. The brandy will no doubt fly right to your head and either greatly assist your hair or it will reconcile you to your lot. The great attraction about brandy as a hair tonic is that it should not build up the thing. If you wish, you may drink the brandy and then breathe hard on the scalp. This will be difficult at first, but after a while it will not seem irksome. Great Sacrifice of Bric-a-Brac Parties desiring to buy a job lot of garden tools will do well to call and examine my stock. These implements have been but slightly used and are comparatively as good as new. The lot consists in part of the following. One three-cornered hoe, gothic in its architecture and in good running order. It is the same one I erroneously hoed up the carnation with and may be found, I think, behind the barn where I threw it when I discovered my error. Original cost of hoe, six bits. Will be closed out now at two bits to make room for new goods. Also, one garden rake, almost as good as new. One front tooth needs filling, and then it will be as good as ever. I sell this weapon not so much to get rid of it, but because I do not want it any more. I shall not garden any next spring. I do not need to. I began it to benefit my health, and my health is now so healthy 
that I shall not require the open air exercise incident to gardening any more. In fact, I am too robust, if anything. I will, therefore, acting upon the advice of my royal physician, close this rake out since the failure of the Northwestern Car Company at fifty cents on the dollar. Also, one lawn mower, only used once. At that time, I cut down what grass I had on my lawn and three varieties of high-priced rose bushes. It is one of the most hardy open-air lawn mowers now made. It will outlive any other lawn mower and be firm and unmoved when all the shrubbery has gone to decay. You can also mow your peony bed with it if you desire. I tried it. This is also an easy running lawn mower. I would recommend it to any man who would like to soak his lawn with perspiration. I mowed my lawn and then pushed a street car around in the afternoon to relax my overstrained muscles. I will sacrifice this lawn mower at three quarters of its original cost, owing to depression in the stock of the New Jerusalem gold mine, of which I am a large owner and cashier at large. We'll also sell a bright new spade, only use two hours spading for angleworms. This is a good, early-blooming, and very hardy angleworm spade, built in the Doric style of architecture. Persons desiring a spade flush and lacking one spade to fill will do well to give me a call. No trouble to show the goods. I will also part with a small chest of carpenter's tools, only slightly used. I had intended to do a good deal of amateur carpenter work this summer, but as the presidential convention occurs in June, and I shall have to attend to that, and as I have already sawed up a Queen Anne chair and thoughtlessly sawed into my leg, I shall probably sacrifice the tools. These tools are all well made, and I do not sell them to make money on them, but because I have no use for them. I feel as though these tools would be safer in the hands of a carpenter. I'm no carpenter. My wife admitted that when I sawed a board across the piano stool and sawed the what-do-you-call-it all out of the cushion. Anyone desiring to monkey with a carpenter's trade will do well to consult my catalog and price list. I will throw in a white holly corner bracket, put together with fence nails, and a rustic settee that looks like the Cincinnati riot. Young men who do not know much, and invalids whose minds have become affected, are cordially invited to call and examine goods. For a cash trade, I will also throw in arnica, court plaster, and salve enough to run the tools two weeks if ordinary care be taken. If properly approached, I might also be wheedled into sacrificing an easy-running domestic wheelbarrow. I have Section 79 of Remarks. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Remarks by Bill Nye. Section 79. A Convention. The officers and the members of the Home for the Disabled Butter and Hoary Hatted Hotel Hash met at their mosque last Saturday evening, and after the roll call, reading of the moments of the preceding meeting by the secretary, singing of the ode and examination of all present to ascertain if they were in possession of the quarterly passport, explanation, and signs of distress, the most esteemed Tuli Mukahi, having reached the order of communications and new business and good of the order, stated that the society was now ready to take action, or at least to discuss the feasibility of holding a series of entertainments at the rank. These entertainments have been proposed as a means of propping up the tottering finances of the society and procuring much-needed funds for the purpose of purchasing new regalia for the most esteemed duke of the district and the most esteemed hired men, each of whom have been wearing the same red calico collar and cheesecloth sash since the organization of the society. Funds were also necessary to pay for the brother who had walked through a railroad trestle into the shoreless sea of eternity, and whose window had a policy of $135.25 against the society on the life of her husband. Various suggestions were made. Among them was the idea, advanced by the most highly esteemed inside door slammer that, as the society's object was, of course, to obtain funds, would it not be well to consider, in the first place, whether it would not be as well for the most esteemed Tuli Mukahi to appoint six brethren in good standing 
to arm themselves with great care, gird up their loins, and muzzle the pay car as it started out on its mission. He simply offered this as a suggestion, and as it was a direct method of securing the coin necessary, he would move that such a committee be appointed by the chair to wait on the pay car and draw on it at sight. The most esteemed keeper of the corkscrew seconded the motion in order, as he said, to get it before the house. This brought forward very hot discussion, pending which the presiding officer could see very plainly that the motion was unpopular. A visiting brother from Yellowstone Park Creamery No. 17 stated that in their society, an entertainment of this kind had been given for the purpose of pouring a flood of wealth into the coffers of the society, and it had been fairly successful. Among the attractions, there had been nothing of an immoral or lawless nature whatever. In the first place, a kind of farewell oyster gorge had been given, with cove oysters as a basis and two dollars a couple as an afterthought. A can of cove oysters entertained thirty people and made thirty dollars for the society. Besides, it was found that the party had broken out that, owing to the adhesive properties of the oysters, they were not eaten. But the juice, as it were, had been scooped up and puckered and corrugated gizzards of the sea have been preserved. Acting upon the suggestion, the society had an oyster padded debauch the following evening at two dollars a couple. Forty suckers came and put their means into the common fund. We didn't have enough oysters to quite go around, so some of us caught a dozen out of an old bootleg, and the entertainment was a great success. We also had other little devices for making money, which worked admirably and yielded much profit to the society. Those present also said that they had never enjoyed themselves so much before. Many little games were played, which produced great merriment and considerable coin. I can name a dozen devices for your society, if desired, by which money could be made for your treasury without the risk or odium necessary resulting from robbing the pay car or a bank and yet the profit will be nearly as great in proportion to the work done. Here, the gravel of the most esteemed Chuli Makahi fell with a sickly thud, and the visiting brother was told at the time, assigned to communications, new business, and good of the order had expired, but that the discussion would be taken up at the next session in one week, at which time was the purpose of the chair to hear and note all suggestions relative to an entertainment to be given at a future date by the society for the purpose of obtaining the evanescent scat and for the successful flesh of the reluctant boodle. Comeback Personal Well, the young woman who used to cook in her family and who went away 10 pounds of sugar and 5.5 and pounds of tea ahead of the game, please come back and all will be forgiven. If she cannot return, will she please write, stating her present address, and also gave her reasons for shutting up the cat in the refrigerator when she went away. If she will only return, we'll try to forget the past and think only of the glorious present and the bright, bright future. Come back, Sarah, and jerk the waffle iron for us once more. Your manners are peculiar, but we yearn for your donuts, and your salad of straight cake suits us exactly. You may keep the handkerchiefs and the collars, and we will not refer to the dead past. We have arranged it so that when you snore, it will not disturb the night police, and if you do not like our children, we will send them away. We realize that you do not like our children very well, and our children especially gave you much pain because they were not so refined as you were. We have often wished for your sake that we had never had any children, but so long as they are in our family, the neighbors will rather expect us to take care of them. Still. If you insist upon it, we will send them away. We don't want to seem overbearing with our servants. We would be willing also to give you more time for a mental relaxation than you had before. The intellectual strain incident to the life of one who makes gravy for a lost and undone world must be very great, and tired nature must at least succumb. We do not want you to succumb. If anyone has got to succumb, let us do it. All we ask is that you will let us know when you are going away and leave the crackers and cheese where we can find them. It was rather rough on us to have you go away when we had guests in the house, but if you had not taken the key to the cooking department, we could have worried along. 
You ought to let us have company at the house sometimes. If we will let you have company when you want to, still you know best. Perhaps you are older than we are, and you have seen more of the world. We miss your gentle admonitions and your stern reproof sadly. Come back and reprove us again. Come back and admonish us once more. At so much per admonish in groceries, we will agree to let you select a tender part of the steak. And such fruit as seems to strike you favorably, just as we did before. We did not like it when you were here, but that's because we were young and did not know what the custom was. If a lifetime devoted to your welfare can obliterate the injustice we have done you, we will be glad to yield it to you. If you could suggest a good place for us to send the children, where they would be well taken care of. And where they would not interfere with some other cook who is a friend of yours, we will be glad to have you write us. My wife says she hopes you will feel perfectly free to use the piano whenever you are lonely or sad, and when you or the bread feel depressed, you will be welcome to come into the parlor and lean up against either one of us and sob. We all know that when you were with us before, we were a little reserved in our manner towards you. But if you come back, it will be different. We will introduce you to more of our friends this time, and we hope you will do the same by us. Young people are apt to get above their business, and we admit that we were wrong. Come back and oversee our freighter borough once more. Take the portfolio of our interior department. Section eighty of remarks. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Remarks by Bill Nye. Section eighty. A new play. The following letter was written recently in reply to a dramatist who proposed the matter of writing a play jointly. Hudson, Wisconsin, November thirteenth, eighteen eighty-six. Scott Marble, Esquire. Dear sir, I have just received your favor of yesterday, in which you asked me to unite with you in the construction of a new play. This idea has been suggested to me before, but not in such a way as to inaugurate the serious thought which your letter has stirred up in my seething mass of mind. I would like very much to unite with you in the erection of such a dramatic structure that people would cheerfully come to this country, from Europe and abroad with us for months, in order to see this play every night. You will surely agree with me that someone ought to write a play. Why it has not been done long ago, I cannot understand. A well-known comedian told me a year ago that he hadn't been able to look into a paper for sixteen months. He could not even read over the proof of his own press notices and criticisms to ascertain whether the printer had set them up, as he wrote them or not, simply because it took all his spare time off the stage to examine the manuscript of plays. That have been submitted to him, but I think we can arrange it so that we might together construct something in that line which would at least attract the attention of our families. Would you mind telling me, for instance, how you write a play? You have been in the business before, and you could tell me, of course, some of the salient points about it. Do you write it with a typewriter, or do you dictate your thoughts to someone who does not resent being dictated to? Do you write a play and then dramatize it, or do you write the drama and then play on it? Would it not be a very good idea to secure a plot that would cost very little, and then put the kibosh on it, or would you put up the lines first and then hang the plot or drama or whatever it is on the lines? Is it absolutely necessary to have a prologue? If so, what is a prologue? Is it like a catalogue? I have a great many crude ideas, but you see, I'm not practical. One of my crude ideas is to introduce into the play an artist studio. This would not cost much, for we could borrow the studio evenings and allow the artist to use it daytimes. Then we would introduce into the studio scene the artist living model. Everybody would be horrified, but they would go. They would walk over each other to attend the drama, and we would do well. Our living model in the studio act would be made of uncommon wax. 
and if it worked well, we would discharge other members of the company and substitute wax. Gradually, we could get it down to where the company would be wax, with the exception of a janitor with a feather duster. Think that over. But seriously, a play, it seems to me, should embody an idea. Am I correct in that theory or not? It ought to convey some great thought, some maxim, or aphorism, or some such a thing as that. How would it do to arrange a play with the idea of impressing upon the audience that the fool and his money are soon parted? Are you using a hero or a heroine in your plays now? If so, would you mind writing their lines for them while I arrange the details and remarks for the young man who is discovered to sleep on a divan? When the curtain rises and it sleeps on through the play with his mouth slightly ajar till the close, the close of the play, not the close of his mouth, when it's discovered that he is dead, he then plays the cold remains in the closing tableau and fills a new-made grave at nine dollars per week. Could also write the lines I think for the young man who comes in wearing a light summer cane and a seer soccer coat so tight that you can count his vertebrae. I could write what he would say without great mental strain. I think I must avoid mental strain, or my intellect might split down the back, and I would be a mental wreck, good for nothing but to strew the shores of time with myself. Various other crude ideas present themselves to my mind, but they need to be clothed. You will say that this is unnecessary. I know you will at once reply that for the stage, the less you clothe an idea, the more popular it will be. But I cannot consent to have it in a bare thought of mine make an appearance night after night before a cultivated audience. What do you think of introducing a genuine case of smallpox on stage? You say in your letter that what the American people clamor for is something catchy. That will be catchy, and it would also introduce itself. I wish you would also tell me what kind of diet you confine yourself to while writing a play. And how you go to work to procure it? Do you live in a mixed diet, or are new relatives? Would you soak your head while writing a play, or would you soak your overcoat? I desire to know all these things because, Mister Marble, to tell you the truth, I'm as ignorant about this matter as the babe unborn. In fact, posterity would have to get up early in the morning to know less about playwriting than I have succeeded in knowing. If we are to make a kind of comedy, my idea will be to introduce something facetious in the middle of the comedy. No one will expect it, you see, and it will tickle the audience almost to death. A friend of mine suggests that it would be a great hit to introduce, or rather, to reproduce, the Hellgate explosion. Many were not able to be there at the time, and would willingly go a long distance to witness the reproduction. I wish that you would reply to this letter at an early date, telling me what you think the scheme suggested. Feel perfectly free to express yourself fully. I'm not too proud to receive your suggestions. The silver dollar. It would seem at this time, while so little is being said on the currency question, and especially by the men who really control the currency, that a word from me would not be out of place. Too much talking has been done by those only who have a theoretical knowledge of money and its eccentric habits. People with a mere smattering of knowledge regarding national currency have been loquacious, while those who have made a matter of study have been kept in the background. At this period in the history of our country, there seems to be a general stringency, and many are in the stringency business who were never that way before. Everything seems to be demonetized. The demonetization of groceries is doing as much toward the general weekly policy of trade as anything I know of. But I may say, in alluding briefly to the silver dollar, that there are worse calamities than the silver dollar. Other things may occur in our lives which, in the way of sadness and three-cornered gloom, make the large, robust dollar look like an old-fashioned half dime. I met a man the other day who, two years ago, was running a small paper at Larrabee Slough. He was then in his meridian as a journalist, and his paper was frequently quoted by such widely read publications as *The Night of Labor at Work*, a humorous semi-monthly journal. He boldly assailed the silver dollar, and with his trenchant pen, he wrote such burning words of denunciation that the printer had to set them on ice before he could use the copy. 
Friends came in very kindly and told me where to attack. They would neglect their own business in order to tell me of corruption in somebody else. I went on that way for some time in a defiant mood, attacking anything that happened to suggest itself. Finally, I thought I would attack the silver dollar. I did so. I thought that friends would come to me and praise me for my manly words, and that I could afford to lose the friendship of dollar, provided I could win friends. In six months, I took an unexpired annual pass over a Larrabee Slough narrow gauge or orphan road, and with nothing else but the clothes I wore, I told the plaintiff how to jerk the old Washington press and went away. The dear old Washington press that had more than once squatted my burning words into the pure white page, the dear old towel in which I had wiped my soiled hands for years until it had almost become a part of myself, the dark. Blue Gordon Press, with its large flywheel and intermittent shadow mortgage, a press to which I had contributed the first joint of my front finger, the editor's chair, the samples of large business cards printed in green with an inflamed red border, which showed that we could do colored work at Larrabee Slough just as well as they could in the large cities, the files of our paper. The large wilted potato that Mr. Alonzo G. Pinkham of Erin Corners kindly laid on our table all, all had to go. I fled out into the great, hollow, mocking world of people who had requested me to aggress. They were people who had called my attention to various things which I ought to attack. I had attacked those things. I had also attacked the Larrabee Slough narrow gauge railroad. But the manager did not see the attack, and so my pass was good. What could I do? I had attacked everything, and more especially the silver dollar, and now I was homeless. For fourteen weeks, I rode up the narrow gauge road one day and back to the next, subsisting solely on the sample of nice pecan meat that the newsboy puts in each passenger's lap. You look incredulous, I see. But it is true. I feel differently toward the currency now, and I wish I could undo what I have done. Were I called up again to jerk the Archimedean lever, I would not be so aggressive, especially as regards the currency. Whether it is inflated or not, silver dollars, paper certificates of deposit, or silver bullion, it does not matter to me. I yearn for two or three adult donuts and one of those thick. Dappled slabs of gingerbread, or slat of pie with gooseberries in it. I presume that I could write a scathing editorial on the abuses of our currency yet, but I am not so much in the scath business as I used to be. I wish you would state, if you will, through some great metropolitan journal, that my views in relation to the silver coinage and the currency question have undergone a radical change. And that any plan whatever by which to make the American dollar less skittish will meet my hearty approval. If I have done anything at all through my paper to endure or repress the flow of our currency, and I fear I have, I now take. Section number eighty-one of Remarks. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Remarks by Bill Nye. Section eighty-one. Polygamy as a religious duty. During the past few years in the history of our republic, we have had leprosy, yellow fever, and the dude, and it seemed as though each one would wreck the whole national fabric at one time. National and international troubles of one kind and another have gradually risen, been met and mastered, but the great national abscess known as the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints still obstinately refuses to come to a head. I may be a radical monogamist and a rash enthusiast upon this matter, but I still adhere to my original motto: one country, one flag, and one wife at a time. Matrimony is a good thing, but it can be overdone. We can excuse the man who becomes a collection of rare coins, stamps, or autographs, but he who wears out his young life making a collection of wives should be looked upon with suspicion. 
After all, however, this matter has always been, and still is, treated with too much levity. It seems funny to us, at a distance of sixteen hundred miles, that a thick-necked patriarch in the valley of the Jordan should be sealed to thirteen or fourteen low-browed, half-human females, that the whole mass of humanity should live and multiply under one roof. Those who see the wealthy polygamists of Salt Lake City do not know much of the horrors of trying to make polygamy and poverty harmonize in the rural districts. In the former case, each wife has a separate residence or suite of rooms, perhaps, but in the latter is the aggregation of vice and depravity. Doubly horrible because, instead of the secluded character which wickedness generally assumes, here it is in the common heritage of the young and at once fails to shock or horrify. Under the all-seeing eye, in the beehive, and the motto, Holiness to the Lord, with a bogus Bible and a red-nosed prophet who couldn't earn thirteen dollars per month pounding sand, this so-called church hanging onto the horns of the altar, as it were, defies the statutes, and in while an open rebellion against the laws of God and man, refers to the Constitution of the United States as protecting in its religious belief. In a poem, the patient Mormon in the picturesque valley of the great salt lake, where he has made the desert blossom as the rose, looks well. With the wonderful music of the great organ at the tabernacle sounding in your ears, and the lofty temple nearby towering to the sky, you say to yourself, there is, after all, something solemn and impressive in all this, but when a greasy apostle in an alpaca duster takes his place behind the elevated desk, and with bad grammar and slangy sentences asks God in a business-like way to bless this buzzing mass of unclean, low-browed, barbarous scum of all foreign countries, and the white trash and criminals of our own, you find no reverence and no religious awe. The same mercenary, heartless lunacy that runs through the sickly plagiarism of the Book of Mormon pervades all this, and instead of the odor of sanctity, you notice the flavor of bilge water and the immigrant's own hailing sign, the all-pervading fragrance of the steerage. Education is the foe of polygamy, and many of the young who have had the means by which to complete their education in the East are apostate, at least so far as polygamy is concerned. Still, to the great mass of the poor and illiterate of Mormondom, this is no benefit. The rich of the Mormon church are rich because their influence with this great fraud has made them so, and it would, as a matter of business, enjoy their prospects to come out and bolt the nomination. Illustration, the family wash. Utah, even with the Edmonds bill, is hopelessly Mormon. All adjoining states and territories are already invaded by them, and the delegate in Congress from Wyoming is elected by the Mormon vote. I believe that I am moderately liberal and free upon all of religious matters, but when a man's confession of faith involves from three to twenty-seven old corsets in the backyard every spring, and a clothesline every Monday morning that looks like a bridal trousseau emporium struck by a cyclone, I must admit that I am a little bit inclined to be sectarian in my views. It's bad enough to be slapped across the features by one pair of long, wet hose on your way to the barn, but to have a whole bankrupt stock of cold, wet garments every week fold their damp arms around your neck as you dodge under the clothesline to drive the cow out of the yard is wrong. It is not good for man to be alone, of course, but why should he yearn to fold a young lady's seminary to his bosom? Why should this morbid sentiment prompt him to marry a female suffrage mass meeting? I do not wish to be considered an extremist in religious matters, but the doctrine that requires me to be sealed to a whole immigrant train seems unnatural and inconsistent. The Newspaper An address delivered before the Wisconsin State Press Association at Whitewater, Wisconsin, August 11, 1886. Mr. President and Gentlemen of the Press of Wisconsin, I am sure that when you so kindly invited me to address you today, you did not anticipate a lavish display of genius and gestures. I accepted the invitation because it afforded me an opportunity to meet you and get acquainted with you, and tell you personally that for years I have been a constant reader of your valuable paper, and I like it. You are running it just as I like to see a newspaper run. I need not elaborate upon the wonderful growth of the press in our country, or we'll refer to the great power which journalism welds in the development of the new world. I need not ladle out statistics to show you how the newspaper has encroached upon the field of oratory and how pale and the silent man, while others sleep, compiles the universal history of a day and tells his mighty audience what he thinks about it before he goes to bed. Of course, this is but the opinion of one man, but who has a better opportunity to judge than he who sits with his finger on the electric pulse of the world, judging the actions of humanity at so much per judge, invariably in advance? I need not tell you all this, for you certainly know it if you read your paper, and I hope you do. 
A man ought to read his own paper, even if he cannot endorse all its sentiments. So necessary has the profession of journalism become to the progress and education of our country that the matter of establishing schools where young men may be fitted for an active newspaper life has attracted much attention and discussion. It has been demonstrated that our colleges do not fit a young man to walk at once into the active management of a paper. He should at least know the difference between a vile contemporary and a gothic scoop. It is difficult to map out a proper course for the student in a school of journalism. There are so many things connected to the profession which the editor and his staff should know and know hard. The newspaper of today is a library. It is an encyclopedia, a poem, a biography, a history, a prophecy, a directory, a timetable, a romance, a cookbook, a guide, a horoscope, an art critic, a political resume, a multiman parvo. It is a sermon, a song, a circus, an obituary, a picnic, a shipwreck, a symphony in solid breviere, a melody of life and death, a grand aggregation of man's glory and his shame. It is, in short, a bird's-eye view of all of the magnanimity and meanness, the joys and griefs, the births and deaths, the pride and poverty of the world, and all for two cents, sometimes. I could tell you some more things that the newspaper of today is if you had time to stay here and your business would not suffer in your absence. Among others, it is a long-felt want, a nine-column paper in a five-column town, a lying sheet, a feeble effort, a financial problem, a tottering wreck, a political tool, and a sheriff's sale. If I were to suggest a curriculum for the young man who wished to take a regular course in a school of journalism, preferring that to the actual experience, I would say to him, devote the first two years to meditation and prayer. This will prepare the young editor for the surprise and consequent temptation to profanity which in a few years he may experience when he finds that the name of the deity in his double-leaded editorial is spelled with a little g, and the peroration of the article is locked up between a death notice and the advertisement of a patent mustache coaxer, which is to follow pure reading matter every day in the week and occupy the top of column on Sunday, TF. The ensuing five years should be devoted the, to the peculiar orthography of the English language. Then put in three years with the dumbbells, sandbags, slung shots, and tomahawk. In my own journalistic experience, I have found more cause for regret over my neglect of this branch than anything else. I usually keep on my desk during a heated campaign a large paperweight, weighing three or four pounds, and in several instances I have found that I could feed that to a constant reader of my valuable paper instead of a retraction. Fewer people lick the editor, though, now, than did so in years gone by. Many people in the last two years have gone across the street to lick the editor and never returned. They intended to come right back in a few moments, but they are now in a land where a change of heart and a palm leaf fan is all they need. Fewer people are robbing the editor nowadays, too, I notice with much pleasure. Only a short time ago, I noticed that a burglar succeeded in breaking into the residence of a Dakota journalist, and after a long, hard struggle, the editor succeeded in robbing him. After the primary course mapped out already, an intermediate course of ten years should be given to learning the typographical art, so that when visitors come in and ask the editor all about the office, he can tell them of the mysteries of making a paper, and how delinquent subscribers have frequently been killed by a well-directed blow with a printer's towel. Five years should be devoted to a study of the art of proofreading. In that length of time, the young journalist can perfect himself to such a degree that it will take another five years for the printer to understand his corrections and marginal notes. Fifteen years should then be devoted to the study of American politics, especially civil service reform, looking at it from a nonpartisan standpoint. If possible, the last five years should be spent abroad. London is the place to go if you wish to get a clear, concise view of American politics, and Chicago or Milwaukee would be a good place for the young English journalist to go and study the political outlook of England. The student should then take a medical and surgical course so that he may be able to attend to contusions, fractures, and so forth, which may occur to himself or the party who may come to his office for a retraction and by mistake get his spinal column double-leaded. Ten years should then be given to the study of law. No thorough metropolitan editor wants to enter upon the duties of his profession without knowing the difference between a writ of mandamus and other styles of profanity. He should thoroughly understand the entire system of American jurisprudence, so that in case a certiorari should break out in his neighborhood, he would know just what to do for it. The student will, by this time, begin to see what is required of him and enter with a great zeal upon the further study of his profession. He will now enter upon a theological course of ten years and fit himself thoroughly to speak intelligently of the various creeds and religions of the world. Ignorance or the part of an editor is almost a crime, 
and when he closes a powerful editorial with the familiar quotation, it is the early bird that catches the worm and attributes it to St. Paul instead of Deuteronomy, it makes me blush for the profession. The last ten years may be profitably devoted to the acquisition of a practical knowledge of cutting cordwood, baking beans, making shirts, lecturing, turning double handsprings, being shot out of a catapult at a circus, learning how to make a good adhesive paste that will not sour in hot weather, grinding scissors, punctuating, capitalization, condemnation, syntax, plain sewing, music and dancing, sculpting, etiquette, prosody, how to win the affections of the opposite sex and evade a malignant case of breach of promise, the Ten Commandments, every man has his own tutor on the flute, croquet, rules of the prize ring, rhetoric, parlor magic, calisthenics, penmanship, how to run a jack from the bottom of the pack without getting shot, civil engineering, decorative art, calcimining, bicycling, baseball, hydraulics, botany, poker, international law, high-low jack, drawing and painting, Pharaoh, vocal music, driving, breaking team, 15-ball pool, how to remove grease spots from last year's pantaloons, horsemanship, coupling freight cars, riding on a rail, riding on a pass, feeding threshing machines, how to wean a calf from the parent stem, teaching school, bullwhacking, plastering, waltzing, vaccination, autopsy, how to win the affections of your wife's mother, every man has his own washerwoman, or how to wash under clothes so they will not shrink, etc., etc., but time forbids anything like a thorough list of what a young man should study in order to fully understand all that he may be called upon to express an opinion about in his actual experience as a journalist. There are a thousand little matters which every editor should know, such, for instance, as the construction of roller composition. Many newspaper men can write a good editorial on Asiatic cholera, but their roller composition is not fit to eat. With the course of study that I have mapped out, the young student would emerge from the College of Journalism at the age of 95 or 96, ready to take off on his coat and write an article on almost any subject. He would be a little giddy at first, and the office boy would have to see that he went to bed at a proper time each night, but aside from that, he would be a good man to feed a waste paper basket. Actual experience is the best teacher in this peculiarly trying profession. I hope some day to attend a press convention where the order of exercise will consist of five-minute experiences from each one present. It would be worth listening to. My own experience was a little peculiar. It was my intention at first to practice law when I went to the Rocky Mountains, although I had been warned by the authorities not to do so. Still, I did practice in a surreptitious kind of way, and might have been practicing yet if my client hadn't died. When you have become attached to a client and respect and like him, and then when, without warning, like a bolt of electricity from a clear sky, he suddenly dies and takes the bread right out of your mouth, it is rough. Then I tried the practice of criminal law, but my client got into the penitentiary, where he was no use to me financially or politically. Finally, when the judge was in a hurry, he would appoint me to defend the pauper criminals. They all went to the penitentiary until people got to criticizing the judge, and finally they told him that it was a shame to appoint me to defend an innocent man. My first experience in journalism was in a western town, in which I was a total stranger. I went there with 35 cents, but I had it concealed in the lining of my clothes so that no one would have suspected it if they had met me. I had no friends, and I noticed that when I got off the train, the band was not there to meet me. I entered the town just as any other American citizen would. I had not fully decided whether to become a stage robber or lecturer on phrenology. At that time, I got a chance to work on a morning paper. It used to go to press before dark, so I always had my evenings to myself, and I liked that part of it first rate. I worked on that paper a year and might have continued if the proprietors had not changed it to an evening paper. Then a company incorporated itself and started a paper, of which I took charge. The paper was published in the loft of a livery stable. That is the reason they called it a stock company. You could come up the stairs into the office, or you could twist the tail of the iron gray mule and take the elevator. It wasn't much of a paper, but it cost $16,000 a year to run it, and it came out six days in the week, no matter what the weather was. We took the Associated Press news by telegraph part of the time, and part of the time we relied on Cheyenne morning papers, which we got off the conductor on the early morning freight. We got a great many special telegrams from Washington in that way, and when the freight train got in late, I had to guess at what Congress was doing and fix up a column of telegraph the best I could. There was a rival evening paper there, and sometimes it would send a smart boy down to the train and get hold of our special telegrams, and sometimes the conductor would go away on a picnic and take our Cheyenne paper with him. All these things are annoying to a man who is trying to supply a long-felt want. There was one conductor in particular who used to go away into the foothills shooting sage hens and take our cablegrams with him. This threw too much strain on me. 
I could guess at what Congress was doing and make up a pretty readable report, but foreign powers and Reichstags and crowned heads and dynasties always mixed me up. You can look over what Congress did last year and give a pretty good guess at what it will do this year, but you can't rely on a dynasty or an effete monarchy in a bad state of preservation. It may go into executive session, or it may go into bankruptcy. Still, at one time, we used to have considerable local news to fill up with. The North and Middle Parks for a while used to help us out when the mining camps were new. Those were the days when it was considered perfectly proper to kill off the Board of Supervisors if their action was distasteful. At that time, a new camp generally located a cemetery and wrote an obituary. Then the boys would start out to find a man whose name would rhyme with the rest of the verse. Those were the days when the cemeteries of Colorado were still in their infancy, and the song of the six-shooter was heard in the land. Sometimes the Indians would send us in an item. It was generally in the obituary line. With the Sioux on the north and the peaceful Utes on the south, we were pretty sure of some kind of news during the summer. The parks used to be occupied by white men winters and Indian summers. Summer was really the pleasantest time to go into the parks, but the Indians had been in the habit of going there at that season, and they were so clannish that the white men couldn't have much fun with them, so they decided they would not go there in the summer. Several of our best subscribers were killed by the peaceful Utes. There were two daily and three weekly papers published in Laramie City at that time. There were between two and 3,000 people, and our local circulation ran from 150 to 250, counting deadheads. In our prospectus, we stated that we would spare no expense whatever in ransacking the universe for fresh news, but there were times when it was all we could do to get our paper out on time. Out of the express office, I mean. One of the rival editors used to write his editorials for the paper in the evening, jerk the Washington hand press to work them off, go home and wrestle with juvenile Kolick and his family until daylight, and then deliver his papers on the street. It is not surprising that the great mental strain incident to this life made an old man of him and gave a tinge of extreme sadness to the funny column of his paper. In an unguarded moment, this man wrote an editorial once that got all his subscribers mad at him, and the same afternoon he came around and wanted to sell his paper to us for $10,000. I told him that the whole outfit wasn't worth 10,000 cents. I know that, said he, but it is not the material I am talking about. It is the goodwill of the paper. We had a rising young horse thief in Wyoming in those days, who got into jail by some freak of justice, and it was so odd for a horse thief to get into jail that I alluded to it editorially. This horse thief had distinguished himself from the common vulgar horse thieves of his time by wearing a large mouth, a kind of full dress, eight-day mouth. He rarely smiled, but when he did, he had to hold the top of his head on with both hands. I remember that I spoke of this in the paper, forgetting that he might criticize me when he got out of jail. When he did get out again, he stated that he would shoot me on sight, but friends advised me not to have his blood on my hands, and I took their advice, so I haven't got a particle of his blood on either of my hands. For two or three months, I didn't know, but he would drop into the office any minute and criticize me, but one day a friend told me that he had been hung in Montana. Then I began to make... Section 82 of Remarks. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Remarks by Bill Nye. Section 82. Wrestling with the Maisie. Very soon now, I shall be strong enough on my cyclone leg to resume my lessons in waltzing. It is needless to say that I look forward with great pleasure to that moment. Nature intended that I should glide in the mazy. Tall, live, bald-headed, genial, limber in the extreme, suave, soulful, frolicsome at times, yet dignified and reserved toward strangers, light on the foot, on my own foot, I mean, gentle as a woman at times, yet irresistible as a tornado when insulted by a smaller i am peculiarly fitted to shine in society those who have observed my polished brow when under a strong electric light say they never saw a man shine so in society as i do my wife taught me how to waltz she would teach me on saturdays and repair her skirts during the following week i told her once that i thought i was too brainy to dance she said she hadn't noticed that, but she thought I seemed to, to run too much to legs. 
my wife is not timid about telling me anything that she thinks will be for my good when i make a mistake she's perfectly frank with me and comes right to me and tells me about it so that i won't do so again i had just learned how to reel around a ballroom to a little waltz music when i was blown across the state of mississippi in september last by a high wind and broke one of my legs which i use in waltzing when this accident occurred i had just got where i felt at liberty to choose a glorious being with starry eyes and fluffy hair and magnificently modelled form to steer me around the rink to the dreamy music of strauss one young lady with whom i had waltzed a good deal when she heard that my leg was broken began to attend every dancing party she could hear of although she had declined a great many previous to that i asked her how she could be so giddy and so gay when i was suffering she said she was doing it to drown her sorrow but her little brother told me on the quiet that she was dancing while i was sick because she felt perfectly safe a friend of mine says i have a pronounced and distinctly original manner of waltzing and that he never saw anybody with one exception who waltzed as i did and that was jumbo he claimed that either one of us would be a good dancer if he could have the whole ring to himself he said that he would like to see jumbo and me waltz together if he were not afraid that i would step on jumbo and hurt him you can see what a feeling of jealous hatred it arouses in some small minds when a man gets so that he can mingle in good society and enjoy himself i could waltz more easily if the rules did not require such constant change of position i'm sedentary in my nature slow to move about so that it takes a lady of great strength of purpose to pull me around on time anecdotes of the stage years ago before laramie city got a handsome opera house everything in the theatrical and musical line of a high order was put on the stage of blackburn's hall other light dramas on the stage and thrilling murders in the audience used to occur at alexander's theatre on front street here you could get a glass of laramie beer made of glucose alkali water plug tobacco and paris green by paying two bits at the bar and as a prize you drew a ticket to the olio specialties and low gags of the stage the idea of inebriating a man at the box office so that he will endure such a sham is certainly worthy of serious consideration i have seen shows at alexander's and also at mcdaniel's in cheyenne however where the bar should have provided an ounce of chloroform with each ticket in order to allay the suffering here you could sit down in the orchestra and take the chances of getting hit when the audience began to shoot at the pianist or you could go up into the boxes and have a quiet little conversation with the timid beer jerkers the beer jerker was never too proud to speak to the most humble and if she could sell a grub staker for five dollars a bottle of real piper heidsick made in cheyenne and warranted to remove the gastric coat pants and vest from a man's stomach in two minutes she felt pleased and proud a roommate of mine whose name i will not give simply because he was and still is the best fellow in the united states came home from the theatre one night with his hair parted in the middle he didn't wear it that way generally so it occasioned talk in social circles he still has a natural parting of the hair about five inches long that he acquired that night he said it was accidental so far as he was concerned but unless the management could keep people from shooting the holders of reserved seats between the acts or any other vital spot he would withdraw his patronage and he was right about it i think that any court in the land would protect a man who had purchased a seat in good faith and with his hat on and both feet on the back of the seat in front of him sits quietly in said seat smoking a colorado maduro cigar and watching the play several such accidents occurred at the said theater among them was a little tableau in which joe walker and centennial bob took the leading parts bob went to the penitentiary and joe went to his reward with one of his lungs in his coat pocket 
there was a little difference between them as to the regularity of a draw and showdown so bob went home from the theatre and loaded a double-barrel shotgun with a lot of scrap iron and after he had introduced the collection into joe's front breadth the latter system was so lacerated that it wouldn't retain ground feed there were other little incidents like that which occurred in and around the old theatre some growing out of the lost love of a beer jerker some from an injudicious investment in a bobtail flush that never got ripe enough to pick and some from the rarefied mountain air united with an epidemic known as mania rot gutty a funny incident of the stage occurred not long ago to a friend of mine who is traveling with a play in which a stage cow appears he's using what is called a profile cow now which works by machinery last winter this cow ran down while in the middle of the stage and forgot her lines the prompter gave the string a jerk in order to assist her this broke the cow in two and the four quarters walked off to the left into one dressing room while the behind quarters and porterhouse steak retired to the outer dressing room the audience called for an encore but the cow felt as though she had made a kind of bull of the part and would not appear those who may be tempted to harshly criticize this last remark are gently reminded that the intense heat of the past month is liable to affect anyone's mind remember gentle reader that your own brain may some day soften also and then you will remember how harsh you were toward me prior to the profile cow the company ran a wickerwork cow that was hollow and admitted of two hired men who operated the beast at a moderate salary these men drilled a long time on what they called a heifer dance a beautiful spectacular and highly moral and instructive quadruped clog sirloin shuffle and cow gallop to the music of a pianoforte the rehearsals had been crowned with success and when the cow came on the stage she got a bouquet and made a bran mash on one of the ushers she danced up and down the stage perfectly self-possessed and with that perfect grace and abandon which is so noticeable in the self-made cow finally she got through the piano sounded a wild wagnerian bang and the cow danseuse ambled off she was improperly steered however and ran her head against a wing where she stopped in full view of the audience talent inside of the cow thought they had reached the dressing room and ran against the wall so they felt perfectly free to converse with each other the cow stood with her nose jammed up against the wing wrapped in thought finally from her thorax the audience heard a voice say jim you blamed galoot that ain't the step we took at rehearsal no more than nothing if you're going to improvise a new cow duet i wish you wouldn't take the four quarters by surprise next time it is not now known what the reply was for just then the prompter came on the stage rudely twisted the tail of the cow rousing her from her lethargy and harshly kicking her in the pit of the stomach he drove her off the stage the audience loudly called for a rep Section 83 of Remarks. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Remarks by Bill Nye. Section 83. George the Third. George the Third was born in England, June 4th, 1738, and ran for king in 1760. He was a son of Frederick, Prince of Wales, and held the office of king for sixty years. He was a natural-born king, and succeeded his grandfather, George the Second. Look as you will adown the long page of English history, and you will not fail to notice the scarcity of self-made kings. How few of them were poor boys, and had to skin along for years with no money, no influential friends, and no fun. 
Ah, little does the English king know of hard times, and carrying two or three barrels of water to a tired elephant in order that he may get into the afternoon performance without money. When he gets tired of being prince, all he has to do is just to be king all day, at good wages, and then at night take off his high-priced crown, hang it up on the hat-rack, put on a soft hat, and take in the town. George the Third quit being prince at the age of twenty-two years, and began to hold down the English throne. He would reign along for a few years, taking it kind of quiet, and then all at once he would declare war, and pick out some people to go abroad and leave their skeletons on some foreign shore. That was George's favorite amusement. He got up the Spanish War in two years after he come to the throne, then he had an American Revolution, a French Revolution, an Irish Rebellion, and a Napoleonic War. He dearly loved carnage, if it could be prepared on a foreign strand. George always wanted imported carnage, even if it came higher. It was in 1765 and early in George's reign that the American Stamp Act passed the legislature and the goddess of liberty began to kick over the dashboard. George was different from most English kings, morally. When he spit on his hand and grasped the scepter, he took his scruples with him right on to the throne. He was not talked about half so much as other kings before or since his time. Nine o'clock most always found George in bed with his scepter under the window-sash so that he could get plenty of fresh air. As it got along toward nine o'clock, he would call the hired girl, tell her to spread a linen lap robe on the throne till morning, issue a royal ukase directing her to turn out the cat, and instructing the cook to set the pancake batter behind the royal stove in the council chamber. Then he would wind the clock and retire. Early in the morning, George would be up and dressed, have all his chores done, and the throne dusted off ready for another hard day's reign. George the Third is the party referred to in the Declaration of Independence, the present King of Great Britain, and of whom many bitter personal remarks were made by American patriots. On this side of the water, George was not highly esteemed. If he had come over here to spend the summer with friends in Boston, during the days of the Stamp Act excitement, he could have gone home packed in ice, no doubt, and with a Swiss sunset under each eye. George's mind was always a little on the bias, and in 1810 he went crazy for the fifth time. Always before that he had gone right ahead with his reign, whether he was crazy or not, but with the fifth attack of insanity, coupled with suggestion of the brain and blind staggers, it was decided to tie him up in the barn and let someone else reign a while. The historian says that blindness succeeded this attack, and in 1811 the Prince of Wales became regent. George the Third died at Windsor in 1820, with the consent of a joint committee of both Houses of Congress, at the age of eighty-two years. He made the longest run as king without stopping for feed or water of any monarch in English history. Sixty years is a long time to be a monarch, and look under the bed every night for a nihilist, loaded with a cut-glass bomb and Paris green. Sixty years is a long while to jerk a scepter over a nation and keep on the right side politically all the time. George was of an inventive turn of mind, and used to be monkeying with some kind of patent evenings after he had peeled his royal robes. Most of his patents related to land, however, and some of the most successful soil in Massachusetts was patented by George. He was always trying some scheme to make a pile of money easy, so that he wouldn't have to work. But he died poor and crazy at last in England. He was not very smart, but he attended to business all the time, and did not get up much of a reputation as a moral leper. He said that as King of Great Britain, and General Superintendent of Cork, he did not aim to make much noise, but he desired to attract universal attention by being so moral that he would be regarded as eccentric by other crowned heads. THE CELL NEST to the members of the Academy of Science at Rin Prairie, Wisconsin. Gentlemen, I beg leave to submit herewith my microscopic report on the several sealed specimens of proud flesh and other mementos taken from the roof of Mr. Flannery's mouth. As Mr. Flannery is the mayor of Erin Prairie, and therefore has a world-wide reputation, I deemed it sufficiently important to the world at large, and pleasing to Mr. Flannery's family, to publish this report in the medical journals of the country, and have it telegraphed to the leading newspapers at their expense. 
knowing that the world at large is hungry to learn how the laudable pus of an eminent man appears under the microscope, and what a pleasure it must be to his family to read the description after his death. I have just opened a new box of difficult words, and herewith transmit a report which will be an ornament not only to the scrapbook of Mr. Flannery's immediate family after his death, but a priceless boon to the reading public at large. Removing the seals from the jars, as soon as I had returned from the express office, I poured off the alcohol and recklessly threw it away. A true scientist does not care for expense. The first specimen was in a good state of preservation on its arrival. I never saw a more beautiful or robust proliferation epithelial cell nest in my life. It must have been secured immediately after the old epithelial had left the nest, and it was in good order on its arrival. The whole lobule was looking first-rate. You might ride for a week and not run across a prettier lobule, or a more artistic aggregation of cell-nests outside a penitentiary. Only one cell-nest had been allowed to dry up on the way, and this looked a good deal fatigued. In one specimen I noticed a carneous degeneration, but this is really no reflection on Mr. Flannery personally. While he has been ill, it is not surprising that he should allow his cell-nests to carneously degenerate. Such a thing might happen to almost any of us. One of the scrapings from the sore on the right posterior fossus I found on its arrival had been seriously injured and therefore not available. I return it herewith. From an examination which has been conducted with great care, I am led to believe that the right posterior rafter of Mr. Flannery's mouth is slightly indurated, and it is barely possible that the northeast duplex and parotid gable end of the roof of his mouth may become involved. I wish you would ask Mr. Flannery's immediate relatives if you can do so without arousing alarm in the breast of the patient. If there has ever been a marked predisposition on the part of his ancestors to tubercular gumboil, I do not wish to be understood as giving this diagnosis as final at all, but from what I have already stated, taken together with other clinical and pathological data within my reach, and the fact that minute tabulated gumboil bactinae were found floating through some of the cell nests, I have every reason to fear the worst. I would be glad to receive from you, for microscopic examination, a fragment of Mr. Flannery's Malpighian layer, showing evidences of cell proliferation. I only suggest this, of course, as practical in case there should be a Malpighian layer which Mr. Flannery is not using. Do not ask him to take a Malpighian layer off her cell nest just to please me. From one microscopic examination I hardly feel justified in giving a diagnosis, nor care to venture any suggestion as to treatment, but it might be well to calcimine the roof of Mr. Flannery's mouth with gum arabic, white lime, and glue in equal parts. There has already been some extravitations and a marked multiformity. I also noticed an inflamed and angry color to the stroma with trimmings of the same. This might only indicate that Mr. Flannery had kept his mouth open too much during the summer and sunburned the roof of his mouth, were it not that I also discovered traces of gumboil microbes of the squamous variety. This leads me to fear the worst for Mr. Flannery. However, if the gentlemanly, courteous, and urbane members of the Academy of Science, of Erin Prairie, to whom I am already largely indebted for past favors, will kindly forward to me, prepaid, another scraping from the mansard roof of Mr. Flannery's mouth next week, I will open another keg of hard words, and trace this gumboil theory to a successful termination, if I have to use up the whole ceiling of the patient's mouth." Yours, with great sincerity, profundity, and verbosity. Bill Nye, Microscopist, Lobulist, and Microbist. Section 84 of Remarks This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Remarks by Bill Nye Section 84 Parental Advice The past fifty years have done much for the newspaper and periodical readers of the United States. 
that period has been fruitful of great advancement and a great reduction in price but these are not all fifty years and less have classified information so that science and sense are conveniently found and humor and nonsense have their proper sphere all branches are pretty full of lively and thoroughly competent writers who take hold of their own special work even as the thorough quick-eyed mechanic takes hold of his line of labor and acquits himself in a creditable manner the various lines of journalism may appear to be crowded but they are not there may be too much vagabond journalism but the road that is travelled by the legitimate labourer is not crowded the clean caucasian journalist as he climbs the hill is not crowded very much he can make out to elbow his way toward the front if he tries very hard there may be too much james crow science and too much editorial vandalism and gush and too much of the journalism for revenue only there may be too much ringworm humor also but there is still a demand for the scientific work of the true student there is still a good market for honest editorial opinion reliable news and fearless and funny paragraph work and character sketches as the song and dance men would say all this however points in one direction it all has one hoarse voice and in the tones of the culverin whatever that is it says that to the young man who is starting out with the intention of filling the tomb of a millionaire learn to do something well lots of people rather disliked the famous british hangman and though he hadn't made a great record for himself but he performed a duty that had to be done by someone and no one ever complained much about marwood's work he warranted every job and told everyone that if they were dissatisfied he would refund their money at the door no man ever came back to Marwood and said, "'Sir, you broke my neck in an unworkmanlike manner.' "'It is better to be a successful hangman "'than to be the banished, abused, and heartbroken, "'cast-off husband of a great actress. "'Learn to take hold of some business and jerk it bald-headed. "'Learn to dress yourself first. "'This will give you self-assurance, "'so that you can go away from home "'and not be dependent on your mother.' Teach yourself to be accurate and careful in all things. It is better to turn the handle of a sausage grinder and make a style of sausage that is free from hydrophobia than to be the extremely hence cashier of a stranded bank fighting horseflies in the solemn hush of a Canadian forest. People have wrong ideas of the respective merits of different avocations. It is better to be the successful driver of a dray than to be the unsuccessful inventor of a stillborn motor. I would rather discover how to successfully wean a calf from the parent stem without being boosted over a nine-rail fence than to discover a new star that had never been used, and the next evening find that it had made an assignment." boys oh boys how i wish i could take each of you by the ear and lead you away by yourselves and show you how many ruins strew the road to success and how life is like a mining boom we only hear of those who strike it rich the hopeful industrious prospector who failed to find the contact and finally filled a nameless grave is soon forgotten when he is gone but a million tongues tell to forty million listening ears of a man who struck it rich and went to europe Therefore, make haste to advance slowly and surely. I am aware that your ears ache with the abundance wherewith ye are advised, but if ye seek not to brace up while yet it is called to-day, and file away information for future reference, and cease to look upon the fifteen-ball pool game when it moveth itself aright, at such time as ye think not ye shall be in pecuniary circumstances, and there shall be none to endorse for you, nay, not one. Early Day Justice Footnote From the Chicago Rambler End footnote Those were troublesome times indeed. All wool justice in the courts was impossible. The Vigilance Committee, or Salvation Army as it called itself, didn't make much fuss about it. But we all knew that the best citizens belonged to it and were in good standing. It was in those days when young Stuart was short-handed for a sheep-herder, and had to take up with a sullen, hairy vagrant, called by the other boys Esau. Esau hadn't been on the ranch a week before he made trouble with the proprietor, and got the red-hot blessing from Stuart he deserved. Then 
Esau got madder and sulked away down the valley among the little sage brush hummocks and white alkali wasteland to nurse his wrath. When Stuart drove into the corral at night from town, Esau raised up from behind an old sheep dip tank, and without a word except what may have growled around in his black heart, he raised a leveled spencer and shot his young employer dead. That was the tragedy of the week only. Others had occurred before, and others would probably occur again. It was getting too prevalent for comfort. So as soon as a quick cayuse and a boy could get down into town, the news spread, and the authorities began in the routine manner to set the old legal mill to running. Someone had to go down to the Tivoli and find the prosecuting attorney, then a messenger had to go to the Alhambra for the justice of the peace. The prosecuting attorney was full— and the judge had just drawn one card to complete a straight flush, and had succeeded. In the meantime, the Salvation Army was fully halfway to Clugston's ranch. They had started out, as they said, to see that Esau didn't get away. They were going out there to see that Esau was brought into town. What happened after they got there I only know from hearsay, for I was not a member of the Salvation Army at that time but I got it from one of those present that they found Esau down in the sagebrush on the bottoms that lie between the abrupt corner of Sheep Mountain and the little Laramie River. They captured him, but he died soon after, as it was told to me from the effects of opium taken with suicidal intent. I remember seeing Esau the next morning, and I thought there were signs of opium, as there was a purple streak around the neck of the deceased, together with other external phenomena not peculiar to opium. But the great difficulty with the Salvation Army was that it didn't want to bring Esau into town. A long, cold night ride with a person in Esau's condition was disagreeable. Twenty miles of lonely road with a deceased murderer in the bottom of the wagon is depressing. Those of my readers who have tried it will agree with me that it is not calculated to promote hilarity. So the Salvation Army stopped at Watley's Ranch to get warm, hoping that someone would steal the remains and elope with them. They stayed some time and managed to give away the fact that there was a reward of five thousand dollars out for Esau, dead or alive. The Salvation Army even went so far as to betray a great deal of hilarity over the easy way it had nailed the reward, or would, as soon as said remains were delivered up and identified. Mr. Watley thought that the Salvation Army was having a kind of walk-away, so he slipped out at the back door of the ranch, put Esau into his own wagon, and drove away to town. Remember, this is the way it was told to me. Mr. Watley hadn't gone more than half a mile when he heard the wild and disappointed yells of the Salvation Army. He put the buckskin on the backs of his horses without mercy, driven on by the enraged shouts and yells of his infuriated pursuers. He reached town about midnight, and his pursuers disappeared. But what was he to do with Esau? He drove around all over town, trying to find the official who signed for the deceased. Mr. Watley went from house to house like a vegetable man, seeking sadly for the party who would give him a $5,000 check for Esau. Nothing could be more depressing than to wake up one man after another out of a sound sleep and invite him to come out to the buggy and identify the remains. One man went out and looked at him. He said he didn't know how others felt about it, but he allowed that anybody who would pay five thousand dollars for such a remains as Esau's could not have had very good taste. Gradually it crept through Mr. Watley's wool that the Salvation Army had been working him, so he left Esau at the engine house and went home. On his ranch he nailed up a large board on which he had been painted in antique characters with a paddle and tar, the following stanzas. Vigilance committees, salvation armies, morgues, or young physicians who may have deceased people on their hands are requested to refrain from conferring them on to the undersigned. People who contemplate shuffling off their own or other people's mortal coils will please not do so on these grounds. The Salvation Army of the Rocky Mountains is especially hereby warned to keep Section 85 of Remarks. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, 
please visit LibriVox.org. Remarks by Bill Nye, Section 85 The Indian Orator I like to read of the Indian orator in the old school books. Most everyone does. It is generally remarkable that the American Demosthenes so far has dwelt in the teepee and lived on the debris of the deer and the buffalo. I mean to say that the school readers have impressed us with the great magnetism of the crude warrior who dwelt in the wilderness and ate his game, feathers and all, while he studied the art of swaying the audience by his oratorical powers. I am inclined to think that Black Hawk and Logan must have been fortunate in securing mighty, able private secretaries, or that they stood in with the stenographers of their day. At least the blue Juniata warriors of our time, from Little Crow, Red Iron, Standing Buffalo, Hole in the Day and Sitting Bull, to Victoria, Colorado, Douglas, Persume, Captain Jack, and Shivano, seem to do better as lobbyists than they do as orators. They may be keen, logical, and shrewd, but they are not eloquent. In some minds, Black Hawk will ever appear as the Patrick Henry of his people. But I prefer to honor his unknown, unhonored, and unsung amanuensis. Think what a godsend such a man would have been to Senator Tabor. The Indian orator of today is not scholarly and grand. He is soiled, ignorant, and sedentary in his habits. An orator ought to take care of his health cannot overload his stomach and make a bronze Daniel Webster of himself. He cannot eat a raw buffalo for breakfast and at once attack the question of tariff for revenue only. His brain is not clear enough. He cannot digest the mammalia of North America and seek out the delicate intricacies of the financial problem at the same time. All scientists and physiologists will readily see why this is true. It is quite popular to say that the modern Indian has seen too much of civilization. This may be true. Anyhow, civilization has seen too much of him. I hope the day will never come when the pale face and the white father will have to stay on their reservation, whether the red man does or not. Indian eloquence, toned down by the mellow haze of a hundred years, sounds very well, but... The clarion voice of the red orator has died away. The stony figure, the eagle eye, the matchless presence, have all ceased to palpitate. He does not say, I am an aged hemlock. I am dead at the top. The forest is filled with the ghosts of my people. I hear their moans on the night winds and in the sighing pines. He does not talk in the blank verse of a century ago. He uses a good many blanks, but it is not blank verse. Even the Indian's friend would admit that it was not blank verse. Perhaps it might be called blankety verse. Once he pleaded for the land of his fathers. Now he howls for grub, guns, and fixed ammunition. I tried to interview a big crow chief once. I had heard some Sioux and learned a few irrelevant and disconnected Ute phrases. I connected these with some Spanish terms, and hoped to get a reply, and keep up a kind of running conversation that might mislead a friend who was with me into the belief that I was as familiar with the Indian tongue as with my own. I began conversing with him in my polyglot manner. I did not get a reply. I conversed with him some more in a desultory way, for I had heard that he was a great orator in his tribe, and I wanted to get his views on national affairs. Still he was silent. He would not even answer me. I got hostile and used some badly damaged Spanish on him. Then I used some sprained and dislocated German on him, but he didn't seem to what whereof I spoke. Then my friend, with all the assurance of a fresh young manhood, began to talk with the great warrior in the English language, and incidentally asked him about a new Indian agent, who had the name of being a bogus Christian with an eye to the main chance. My friend talked very loud. 
with the idea that the chieftain could understand any language if spoken so that you could hear it in the next territory. At the mention of the Indian agent's name, the Crow statesman brightened up and made a remark. He simply said, Ugh, too much God and no flower. You hear me, Sa? Colonel Vischer of Denver, who is delivering his lecture, Sixty Minutes in the War, tells a good story on himself of an episode or something of that nature, that occurred to him in the days when he was the amanuensis of George D. Prentice. Vischer, in those days, was a fair-haired young man, with pale blue eyes and destitute of that wealth of brow and superficial area of polished dome which he now exhibits on the rostrum. He was learning the lesson of life then, and every now and then he would bump up against an octagonal mass of cold-pressed truth of the never-dying variety that seemed to kind of stun and concuss him. One day, Mr. Vischer wandered into a prominent hotel in Louisville, and, observing with surprise and pleasure that boiled lobster was one of the delicacies on the bill of fare, he ordered one. He had never seen lobster, and a rare treat seemed to be in store for him. He breathed in what atmosphere there was in the dining room and waited for his bird. At last it was brought in. Mr. Vischer took one hasty look at the great scarlet mass of voluptuous limbs and oceanic nippers and sighed. The lobster was as large as a doormat and had a very angry and inflamed appearance. Vischer ordered in a powerful cocktail to give him courage, and then he tried to carve off some of the breast. The lobster is ornery even in death. He is eccentric and trifling. Those who know him best are the first to evade him and shun him. Vischer had failed to straddle the wishbone with his fork properly, and the talented bird of the deep rolling sea slipped out of the platter waved itself across the horizon twice, and buried itself in the bosom of the eminent and talented young man. The eminent and talented young man took it in his napkin, put it carefully on the table, and went away. As he passed out, the head waiter said, Mr. Vischer, was there anything the matter with your lobster? Vischer is a full-blooded Kentuckian, and answered in the courteous dialect of the bluegrass country, Anything the matter with my lobster, sir? No, sir. The lobster is very vigorous, sir. If you had asked me how I was, sir, I should have answered you very differently, sir. I am not well at all, sir. If I were as well and as ruddy and as active as that lobster, sir, I would live forever, sir. You hear me, sir? Why, of course... I am not familiar with the habits of the lobster, saw, and do not know how to kiove the bosom of the bloomin' peri of the summer sea, but that's no reason why the inflamed reptile should get up on his hind feet and nestle up to me, saw, in that earnest and forthwith manner, saw. I love dumb beasts, saw, and they love me, saw. But when they are dead, sir, and I undertake to kiove them, sir, I desire, sir, that they should remain as the undertaker left them, sir. You doubt. Section 86 of Remarks. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Remarks by Bill Nye. Section 86. Plato. Plato was a Greek philosopher who flourished about 426 B.C. and kept on flourishing for 81 years after that, when he suddenly ceased to do so. He early took to poetry, but when he found that his poems were rejected by the Greek papers, he ceased writing poetry and went into the philosophy business. 
at the time greece had no regular philosopher and so plato soon got all he could do plato was a pupil of socrates who was himself no slouch of a philosopher Many and many a day did Socrates take his little class of kindergarten philosophers up the shady banks of the Elysus and sit all day discoursing to his pupils on deep and difficult doctrines while his unsandaled feet were bathed in the genial tide. Many happy hours were thus spent. Socrates would take his dinner or tell some wonderful tale to his class whereby he would win their dinner himself. Then, in the deep Athenian shade, with his bare Gothic feet in the clear, calm waters of the Elysus, he would eat the Grecian doughnut of his pupils, and while he spoke in poetic terms of his belief, he would dig his heel in the mud and heave a heartbroken sigh. Such was Socrates, the great teacher. He got a small salary and went barefoot till after Thanksgiving. He was a great tutor and boarded around teaching in the open air, while the mosquitoes bit his bare feet. No tutor ever tutored with a more unselfish purpose or a smaller salary. Plato maintained, among other things, that evil is connected with matter, and aside from matter we do not find evil existing. That is true, at least such evil as we might find apart from matter, would be outside the jurisdiction of a police court. I think Plato was correct, Evil and matter are inseparable. That's what's the matter. It is quite common for us to say that virtue is its own reward. Plato held that while it was better to be virtuous as a matter of economy and ultimate peace than not to be virtuous at all, he believed in being virtuous for a higher reason. Probably it was notoriety. He would rather be right than be president. He believed in being good just for the excitement of it and the notice it would attract, and not because it paid. Plato was a great virtuoso. Socrates would have been called a crank if he had lived in our day and age, and if Plato were to go into London or New York and talk of organizing a society for the encouragement of virtue among adult male taxpayers, he would have a lonesome time of it. Be virtuous and you will be happy was a favorite motto with Plato. The legend is still quoted by those who love to ransack the dead past. Pluto was quite another party, and some get him mixed up with Plato. They were not related in any way, Pluto being a son of Saturn and Rhea, who flourished at about the same time as Plato. Pluto was a brother of Jupiter and Neptune, and when the estate of Saturn was wound up, Jupiter wanted the earth and he got it. Neptune wanted the codfish conservatory and the mermaid's home. So he took the deep, deep sea, and even yet he rides around in a gold-spangled stone boat on the pale green billows of the summer sea, jabbing a pickerel ever and anon with a three-pronged fork. He leads a gay life, going to picnics with the mermaids in their coral caves or attending their full evening dress parties clad in a trident and a fall beard. He loves the sea the lone blue sea, and those who have seen him turning handsprings on a sponge lawn, or riding in his water-tight chariot with his feet over the dashboard beside a slim young mermaid with Paris green hair and dressed in a tight-fitting low-neck dorsal fin, say he is a lively old party. But Pluto was different. He stood around till the estate was all closed up, and it looked as though he had got left. Just then the administrator says, why, here's Pluto. He is going to come out of the little end of the horn. He will have to hustle for himself. Pluto resented this and clinched with the administrator. They fought till each had a watch pocket of the brow and an Irish sunset symphony in green under the eye. While Jupiter and Neptune stood by and encouraged the fight, Jupiter rather took sides with his brother, and Neptune stood in with the administrator. In the midst of the confusion, Jupiter speaks up and says, Swat him under the ear, Pluto. Whereupon Neptune says to the administrator, Give him hail. The administrator paused and said, That was a good suggestion. He would do so. And so he forgave Pluto and gave him Sheol. The Expensive Word much that is annoying in this life is occasioned by the use of a high-priced word where a cheaper one would do. 
in these days of failure, shortage at both ends, and financial stringency generally, I often wonder that some people should go on day after day using just as extravagant language as they did during the flush times. When I get hard up, the first thing I do is to economize in my expressions in everyday conversation. If there is a marked stringency in business, I lay aside first my French, then my Latin, and finally my German. Should the times become greatly depressed and failures and assignments become frequent, I begin to lop off the large words in my own language, beginning with incomprehensibility, unconstitutionally, etc., etc. Julius Caesar's motto used to be, Avoid an unusual word as you would rock at sea. And Jewel is right about that, too. Large and unusual words, especially in the mouths of ignorant people, are worse than rough-on-rats in a boarding-house pie. Years ago, there used to be a pompous cuss in southern Wisconsin who was a self-made man. Extremely so. Those who used to hear him assert again and again that he was a self-made man always felt renewed confidence in the Creator. He rose one evening in a political meeting and, swelling out his bosom, as his eagle eye rested on the chairman, he said, Mr. Chairman, I move you that the cheer do appoint a committee of three to attend to the matter under discussion, and that said committee be clothed by the cheer with omniscient and omnipotent powers. The motion was duly seconded and the chairman said he guessed that it wouldn't be necessary to put it to a vote. I guess it will be all right, Mr. Pinkham. I guess there'll be no declivity to that. And so the committee was appointed and clothed with omniscient and omnipotent powers, there being no declivity to it. We had a self-made lawyer at one time in the northern part of the state, who would rather find a seventy-five-cent word and use it in a speech where it did not belong and to eat a good square meal. He was more fatal to the king's English than O'Dynamite Rosa. One day he was telling how methodical one of the county officials was. Why, said he, I never saw a man do so much and do it so easy. But the secret of it is plain enough, you see. He has a regular rotunda of business every day. If he meant anything, I suppose he meant a routine of business. But a man would have to be a mind-reader to follow him some days when he had about six fingers of cough medicine aboard and began to paw around in the dark and musty garret of his memory for moth-eaten words that didn't mean anything. A neighbor of mine went to Washington during the Guto trial and has been telling us about it ever since. He is one of those people who don't want to be close and stingy about what they know. He likes to go through life shedding information right and left. He likes to get a crowd around him and tell them how he was in Washington at the time of the post-mortis examination. Boys, you may talk all year on mine too, but the greatest thing I saw in Washington, said he, was Dr. Mary Walker on the street every morning riding on one of these philosophers. He painted the top of his fence green last year, so it would kind of combinate with his blinds. If he would make his big words combinate with what he means a little better, he would not attract so much attention. But he don't care. He hates to see a big fat word loafing around with nothing to do, so he throws one in occasionally for exercise, I guess. In the Minnesota legislature in 1867, they had under discussion a bill to increase the per diem of members from $3 to $5. A member of the lower house who voted for the measure was hauled over the coals by one of his constituents and charged with corruption in no unmeasured terms. To all this the legislator calmly answered that when he got down to the capital and found out the awful price of bread, he concluded that his per diadem ought to be increased, and so he supported the measure. Then the belligerent constituent said, I beg your pardon and acquit you of all charges of corruption. For a legislator who does not know the difference between a crown of glory and the price of
Section 87 of Remarks. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Remarks by Bill Nye. Section 87. Petticoats at the Poles. There have been many reasons given, first and last, why women should not vote. But I desire to say, in the full light of a ripe experience, that some of them are fallacious. I refer more particularly to the argument that it will degrade women to go to the polls and vote like a little man. While I am not, and have never been a howler for female suffrage, I must admit that it is much more of a success than prohibition and speculative science. My wife voted eight years with my full knowledge and consent, and to-day I cannot see but that she is as docile and as tractable as when she won my trusting heart. Now, those who know me best will admit that I am not a ladies' man, and therefore what I may say here is not said to secure favor and grateful smiles. I am not attractive, and I am not in politics. I believe that I am homelier this winter than usual. There are reasons why I believe that what I may say on this subject will be sincere and not sensational or selfish. It has been urged that good women do not generally exercise the right of suffrage when they have the opportunity, and that only those whose social record has been tarnished a good deal go to the polls. This is not true. It is the truth that a good full vote always shows a list of the best women and the wives of the best men. A bright day makes a better showing of lady voters than a bad one, and the weather makes a more perceptible difference in the female vote than the male. But when things are exciting, and the battle is red-hot, and the tocsin of war sounds anon, the wife and mother puts on her armor and her sealskin sack, and knocks things cross-eyed. It is generally supposed that the female voter is a pantalunatic, a half-horse, half-alligator kind of woman, who looks like Dr. Mary Walker, and has the appearance of one who has risen hastily in the night at the alarm of fire, and dressed herself partially in her own garments and partially in her husband's. This is a popular error. In Wyoming, where female suffrage has raged for years, you meet quiet, courteous, and gallant gentlemen, and fair, quiet, sensible women at the polls, where there isn't a loud or profane word, and where it is an infinitely more proper place to send a young lady unescorted than to the post-office in any city in the Union. You can readily see why this is so. The men about the polls are always candidates and their friends. That is the reason that neither party can afford to show the slightest rudeness toward a voter. The man who on Wednesday would tell her to go and soak her head, perhaps, would stand bareheaded to let her pass on Tuesday. While she holds a smashed ballot shoved under the palm of her gray kid glove, she may walk over the candidate's prostrate form with impunity and her overshoes if she chooses to. Weeks and months before election in Wyoming, the party with the longest purse subsidizes the most livery stables and carriages. Then, on the eventful day, every conveyance available is decorated with a political placard and driven by a polite young man who is instructed to improve the time. Thus, every woman in Wyoming has a chance to ride once a year at least. Lately, however, many prefer to walk to the polls, and they go in pairs, trios, and quartets, voting their little sentiments and calmly returning to their cookies and crazy quilts, as though politics didn't jar their mental poise a minute. It is possible, and even probable, that a man and his wife may disagree on politics as they might on religion. The husband may believe in Andrew Jackson and a relentless hell, while his wife may be a stalwart and rather liberal on the question of eternal punishment. If the husband manages his wife as he would a clothes-wringer, and turns her through life by a crank, he will, no doubt, work her politically. But if she has her own ideas about things, she will naturally act upon them while the man who is henpecked in other matters till he can't see out of his eyes will be henpecked, no doubt, in the matter of national and local politics. These are a few facts about the actual workings of female suffrage, and I do not tackle the great question of the ultimate results upon the political machinery if woman suffrage were to become general. I do not pretend to say as to that. I know a great deal, but I do not know that. 
there are millions of women no doubt who are better qualified to vote and yet cannot than millions of alleged men who do vote but no one can tell now what the ultimate effect of a change might be so far as wyoming is concerned the territory is prosperous and happy i see also that a murderer was hung by process of law there the other day that looks like the onward march of reform whether female suffrage had anything to do with it or not and they're going to hang another in march if the weather is favorable and executive clemency remains dormant as i think it will all these things look hopeful we can't tell what the territory would have been without female suffrage but when they begin to hang men by law instead of by moonlight the future begins to brighten up when you have to get up in the night to hang a man every little while and don't get any per diem for it you feel as though you were a good way from home the sedentary hen though generally cheerful and content with her lot the hen at times becomes moody sullen and taciturn we are often called upon to notice and profit by the genial and sunny disposition of the hen and yet there are times in her life when she is morose cynical and the prey of consuming melancholy at such times not only her own companions but man himself shuns the hen at first she seems to be preoccupied only she starts and turns pale when suddenly spoken to then she leaves her companions and seems to be the victim of hypochondria then her mind wanders at last you come upon her suddenly some day seated under the currant bushes you sympathize with her and you seek to fondle her she then picks a small memento out of the back of your hand you then gently but firmly coax her out of there with a hoe and you find that she has been seated for some time on an old croquet ball trying to hatch out a whole set of croquet balls this shows that her mind is affected you pick up the croquet ball and find it hot and feverish so you throw it into the shade of the woodshed anon you find your demented hen in the loft of the barn hovering over a doorknob and trying by patience and industry to hatch out a hotel when a hen imagines that she is inspired to incubate she at once ceases to be an ornament to society and becomes a crank she violates all the laws and customs of nature and society in trying to hatch a conservatory by setting through the long days and nights of summer on a small flower pot man may win the affections of the tiger the lion or the huge elephant and make them subservient to his wishes but the setting hen is not susceptible to affection you might as well love the manitoba blizzard or try to quell the cyclone by looking calmly in its eye the setting hen is filled with hatred for every living thing she loves to brood over her wrongs or anything else she can find to squat on i once owned a hen that made a specialty of setting she never ceased to be the proud anonymous author of a new warm egg but she yearned to be a parent she therefore seated herself on a nest where other hens were in the habit of leaving their handiwork for inspection she remained there during the summer hatching steadily on while the others laid until she filled my barnyard with little orphaned henlets of different ages she remained there day and night patiently turning out poultry for me to be a father to i brought up on the bottle about one hundred that summer that had been turned out by this morbidly maternal hen all she seemed to ask in return was my kind regards and esteem i fed her upon the nest and humored her in every way every day she became a parent and every day added to my responsibility one day i noticed that she seemed weak and there was a far away look in her eye for the first time the horrible truth burst upon my mind i buried my face in the haymow and i am not ashamed to say that i wept strong man as i am i am not too proud to say that i soaked that haymow through with unavailing tears my hen was dying even then her breath came hot and quick like the swift rush of a hot ball that caves in the shortstop and speeds away to center field the next morning one hundred chickens of various sizes were motherless and if anything had happened to me they would have been fatherless for many years i have made a close study of the setting hen but i am still unsettled as to what is best to do with her she is a freak of nature a disagreeable anomaly a fussy phenomenon logic rhetoric and metaphor are all alike to the setting hen you might as well go down into the bosom
Section 88 of Remarks. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Remarks by Bill Nye. Section 88. A Bright Future for Pugilism. The recent prominence of Mr. John E. Dempsey, better known as Jack Dempsey of New York, brings to mind a four days trip taken in his company from portland oregon to st paul over the northern pacific there were three pugilists in the party besides myself viz dempsey dave campbell and tom cleary we made a grand triumphant tour across the country together and i may truthfully state that i never felt so free to say anything i wanted to to other passengers as i did at that time i wish i could afford to take at least one pugilist with me all the time in travelling about the country lecturing a good pugilist would be of great assistance i would like to set him on the man who always asks where do you go to from here mr nye he does not ask because he wants to know for the next moment he asks right over again i do not know why he asks but surely it is not for the purpose of finding out well, throughout our long journey across the state of Oregon and the territories of Idaho, Montana, and Dakota, and the state of Minnesota, it was one continual ovation. Dempsey had a worldwide reputation, I found, co-extensive with the horizon, as I may say, and bounded only by the zodiac. In my great forthcoming work, entitled Half Hours with Great Men, or Eminent People Which I Have Saw, I shall give a fuller description of this journey. The book will be a great boon. Mr. Dempsey is not a man who would be picked out as a great man. You might pass by him two or three times without recognizing his eminence, and yet, at a scrapping matinee or swatting recital, he seems to hold his audiences at his own sweet will, also his antagonist. Mr. Dempsey does not crave notoriety. He seems, rather, to court seclusion. This is characteristic of the man. See how he walked around all over the state of New York last week, in the night, too, in order to evade the crowd. His logic, however, is wonderful. Though quiet and unassuming in his manner, his arguments are powerful and generally make a large protuberance wherever they alight. Nothing is more pleasing than the sight of a man who has risen by his own unaided effort, fought his way up, as it were, and yet who is not vain. Mr. Dempsey conversed with me frequently during our journey, and did not seem to feel above me. I opened the conversation by telling him that I had seen a number of his works. Nothing pleases a young author so much as a little friendly remark in relation to his work. I had seen a study of his one day in New York last spring. It was an italic nose with quotation marks on each side. It was a very happy little bon mot on Mr. Dempsey's part, and attracted a good deal of notice at the time. Mr. Dempsey is not a college graduate, as many suppose. He is a self-made man. This should be a great encouragement to our boys who are now unknown, and whose portraits have not as yet appeared in the sporting papers. But Mr. Dempsey's great force as a debater is less, perhaps, in the matter than in the manner. His delivery is good, and his gestures cannot fail to convince the most skeptical. Striking in appearance, aggressive in his nature, and happy in his gestures, he is certain to attract the attention of the police, and he cannot fail to rivet the eye of his adversary. I saw one of his adversaries not long ago, whose eye had been successfully riveted in that way. And yet, John E. Dempsey was once a poor boy. He had none of the advantages which wealth and position bring, but, confident of his latent ability as a middleweight convincer, he toiled on, ever on, sitting up until long after other people had gone to bed, patiently knocking out those who might be brought to him for that purpose. He never hung back because the way looked long and lonely. And what is the result? Today, in the full vigor of manhood, 
he is sought out and petted by everyone who takes an interest in the onward march of pugilism it is a wonderful record though brief it shows what patient industry will accomplish unaided had john e dempsey hesitated to enter the ring and said that he would rather go to school where he would be safe he might today be an educated man but what does that amount to here in america where everybody can have an education he would have lost his talent as a slugger and drifted steadily downward perhaps till he became a schoolteacher or a narrow-chested editor writing things day after day just to gratify the morbid curiosity of a sin-cursed world in closing i would like to say that i hope i have not expressed an opinion in the above that may hereafter be used against me do not understand me to be the foe of education education and refinement are good enough in their places but how shall we attract attention by trying to become refined and educated in a land where as i say education and refinement seem almost to run rampant heretofore in america pugilism has been made subservient to the common schools pugilism and polygamy have both been crowded to the wall now pugilism is about to assert itself the tin ear and the gory nose will soon come to the front and the day is not far distant when progressive pugilism and the prize ring will take the place of the poorly ventilated common school and the enervating prayer meeting the snake indian there are about five thousand snake or shoshone indians now extant the greater part being in utah and nevada though there is a reservation in idaho and another in wyoming the shoshone indian is reluctant to accept of civilization on the european plan he prefers the ruder customs which have been handed down from father to son along with other heirlooms i use the word heirlooms in its broadest sense there are the shoshones proper and the utes or utahs to which have been added by some authorities the comanches and moquis of new mexico and arizona the natellas and other tribes of california the shoshone wherever found is clothed in buckskin and blanket in winter but dressed more lightly in summer wearing nothing but an air of intense gloom in august to this he adds on holidays a necklace made from the store teeth of the hardy pioneer the snake or shoshone indian is passionately fond of the game known as poker among us and which i learn is played with cards it is a game of chance though skill and a thorough knowledge of firearms are of great use the indians enter into this game with great zeal and lend to it the wonderful energy which they have preserved from year to year by abstaining from the debilitating effects of manual labor all day long the red warrior sits in his skin boudoir nursing the sickly and reluctant flush patient silent and hopeful through the cold of winter in the desolate mountains he continues to hope on hope ever that he will draw to fill far away up the canyon he hears the sturdy blows of his wife's tomahawk as she slaughters the grease wood and the sagebrush for the fire in his gilded hell where he sits and woos the lazy goddess of fortune with the shoshone poker is not alone a relaxation the game wherewith to wear out a long and listless evening but it is a passion a duty and a devotion he has a face designed especially for poker it never shows a sign of good or evil fortune you might as well try to win a smile from a railroad right-of-way the full hand the fours threes pairs and bobtail flushes are all the same to him if you judge by his face when he gets hungry he cinches himself a little tighter and continues to wrestle with fate you look at his smoky old copper scent of a face and you see no change you watch him as he coins the last buckshot of his tribe 
and later on when he goes forth a pauper and the corners of his famine breeding mouth have never moved his little black smoke-inflamed eyes have never lighted with triumph or joy he is the great aboriginal stoic and sylvan dude he does not smile he does not weep it certainly must be intensely pleasant to be a wild free a lawless irresponsible natural-born fool the shoshones proper include the bannocks which are again subdivided into the cool sitakara or buffalo eaters on wind river the tukarika or mountain sheep eaters on salmon or suabe ivers the shoshokas or white knives sometimes called diggers of the humboldt iver and the great salt lake basin probably the hokandikas yahoo skins and wallpapes are subdivisions of the digger tribe i am not sure of this but i shall not suspend my business till i can find out about it if i cannot get at a great truth right off i wait patiently and go right on drawing my salary the shoshones live on the government and other small game they will eat anything when hungry from a buffalo down to a wood tick the shoshone does not despise small things he loves insects in any form he loves to make pets of them and to study their habits in his home life formerly when a great shoshone warrior died they killed his favorite wife over his grave so that she could go to the happy hunting grounds with him but it is not so customary now i tried to impress on an old shoshone brave once that they ought not to do that i tried to show him that it would encourage celibacy and destroy domestic ties in his tribe since then there has been quite a stride toward reform among them instead of killing the widow on the death of the husband the husband takes such good care of his health and avoids all kinds of intellectual strain or physical fatigue that late years there are no widows but widowers just seem to swarm in the shoshone tribe the woods are full of them now if they would only kill the widower over the grave of the wife the indian's future would assume section eighty nine of remarks this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Remarks by Bill Nye, Section 89 Roller Skating I have once more tried to ride a pair of roller skates. That is the reason I got down on the rink and down on roller skates. That is the reason several people got down on me. That is also the reason why I now state in a public manner, to a lost and undone race, that unless the roller rink is at once abolished, the whole civilized race will at once be plunged into Arnica. I had tried it once before, but had not carried my experiments to a successful termination. I made a trip around the rink last August, but was ruled out by the judges for incompetency, and advised to skate among the people who were hostile to the government of the united states while the proprietors repaired the rink on the ninth of june i nestled in the bosom of a cyclone to excess and it has required the bulk of the succeeding months for nature to glue the bone of my leg together in proper shape that is the reason i have not given the attention to roller skating that i should a few weeks ago i read what mr talmage said about the great national vice it was his opinion that if we skated in a proper spirit we could leave the rink each evening with our immortal souls in good shape somehow it got out that on thursday evening i would undertake the feat of skating three rounds in three hours with no protection to my scruples for one half the gate money talmage rules so there was quite a large audience present with opera glasses 
some had umbrellas especially on the front rows these were worn spread in order to ward off fragments of the rink which might become disengaged and set in motion by atmospheric disturbances in obedience to a wild wagnerian snort from the orchestra i came into the arena with my skates in hand i feel perfectly at home before an audience when i have my skates in hand it is a morbid desire to wear the skates on my feet that has always been my bete noire will the office boy please give me a brass check for that word so that i can get it when i go away my first thought after getting myself secured to the skates was this am i in the proper frame of mind am i doing this in the right spirit am i about to skate in such a way as to lift the fog of unbelief which now envelops a sinful world or shall i deepen the opaque night in which my race is wrapped just then that end of the rink erupted in a manner so forthwith and so tout ensemble that i had to push it back in place with my person i never saw anything done with less delay or less languor the audience went wild with enthusiasm and i responded to the encore by writing my name in the air with my skates this closed the first seance and my trainer took me in the dressing-room to attend a consultation of physicians after the rink carpenter had jacked up the floor a little i went out again i had no fears about my ability to perform the mechanical part assigned me but i was still worried over the question of whether it would or would not be of lasting benefit to mankind those who have closely scrutinized my frame in repose have admitted that i am fearfully and wonderfully made students of the human frame say that they never saw such a wealth of looseness and limberness lavished upon one person they claim that nature bestowed upon me the hinges and joints intended for a whole family and therefore when i skate the air seems to be perfectly lurid with limbs i presume that this is true though i have so little leisure while skating in which to observe the method itself the plot or animus of the thing as it were that my opinion would be of little value to the scientist i am led to believe that the roller skate is certainly a great civilizer and wonderful leveller of mankind if we so skate that when the summons comes to seek our ward in the general hospital where each shall heal his busted cuticle within the walls where rinkists squirm we go not like the moral wreck morally paralyzed but like a hired man taking his medicine and so forth we may skate with perfect impunity or any one else to whom we may be properly introduced by our cook no more frontier the system of building railroads into the wilderness and then allowing the wilderness to develop afterward has knocked the essential joy out of the life of the pioneer at one time the hardy hewer of wood and drawer of water gave his lifetime willingly that his son might ride in the varnished cars now the pullman palace car takes the new yorker to the threshold of the sea or to the boundary line between the united states and the british possessions it has driven out the long-handled frying pan and the flapjack of twenty years ago and introduced the condensed milk and canned fruit of commerce along the highways where once the hopeful hundreds marched with long-handled shovel and pick and pan cooking by the way thin salt pork and flapjacks and slum gullion now the road is lined with empty beer bottles and peach cans that have outlived their usefulness no landscape can be picturesque with an empty peach can in the foreground any more than a lion would look grand in a red monogram horse blanket and false teeth the modern camp is not the camp of the wilderness it wears the half-civilized and shabby genteel garments of a sawed-off town you know that if you ride a day 
you will be where you can get the daily papers and read them under the electric light that robs the old canyons of their solemn isolation and peoples each gulch with the odor of codfish balls and civilization civilization is not to blame for all this and yet it seems sad civilization could not have done all this alone it had to call to its aid the infernal fruit can that now desolates the most obscure trail in the heart of the mountains you walk over chaos where the hydraulic has ploughed up the valley like a convulsion or you tread the yielding path across the deserted dump and on all sides the rusty neglected and humiliated empty tin can stares at you with its monotonous dude-like stare an old-timer said to me once i've about decided bill that the west is a matter of history when we cooked our grub over a sage brush fire we could get fat and fight indians but now we fill our digesters with the cold pizen and pewter of the canned peach we go to a big tavern and stick a towel under our chins and eat pie with a fork and heat up our carcasses with antichrist coal and what do we amount to nothing i used to chase injuns all day and eat raw salt pork at night because i dasn't build a fire and still i felt better than i do now with a wad of tin can solder in my stomach and a homesick feeling in my weather-beaten breast no we don't have the fun we used to we have more soirees and sciatica and one bloomin' thing and another of that kind but we don't get one snort of pure air and appetite in a year they're bringing in their blamed telephones now and malaria and agwe and old sledge and fun might as well skip out there ain't no frontier any more all we've got left is the old-fashioned trantler jews and rheumatiz of forty-nine behind the red squaw's cayuse plug the hand-car roars and raves and pie-plant pies are now produced above the indian graves i hear the oaths of pioneers the caucus yet to be the first low hum we're soon Section 90 of Remarks. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by S. K. Edison, New Jersey. Remarks by Bill Nye. Section 90. A Letter of Regrets. My dear Princess Beatrice, I received your kind invitation to come up to Whippingham on the 23rd instant and see you married, but I have not been able to get there. The weather has been so hot this month that, to tell you the truth, Beatrice, I haven't been going anywhere to speak of. At first I thought I would go anyhow, and even went so far as to pick out a nice corner bracket to take along for a wedding present, not so much for its intrinsic value, of course, but so you would have something with my name to it on a card that you could show to those English dudes and let them know that you had influential friends, even in America. But when I thought what a long, hard trip it would be, and how I would probably mash that bracket on the cars before I got halfway there, I gave it up. I am not personally acquainted with your inner Marato, if that's all right, never having met him in our set. But I understand you have done well and that your husband is a rising young man of good family, and that he will never allow you to put your hands into dishwater. I hope this is true, and that he does not drink. Rum has certainly paralyzed more dukes in such things than war has. I attribute this to the fact that princes and dukes are generally more reckless about exposing themselves to the demon rum than to the rude alarums and one thing another of war. If you keep a girl, I hope you will get a good one who knows her business. 
A green girl in the house of a newly married princess is a great source of annoyance. A friend of mine who got married last winter got a girl whose mind had been eaten by cutworms and she had not discovered it. All the faculty that had been spared her was that power of the mind which enabled her to charge dollar three a week. She lubricated the buckwheat pancake griddle for a week with soap grease and a dash of castor oil, and when she was discharged, she wept bitterly because capital with the iron heel ground the poor servant girl into the dust. Probably you will take a little tour after the wedding is over. They are doing that way a good deal in Boston this season. I thought you would like a pointer in the very lumtumest thing to do, and so I write this. So long as you have the means to do this thing right, I think you ought to do so. You may never be married again, princess, and now is the time to paint the British Isles red. You can also get more concessions from your husband now, while he is a little rattled and temporarily knocked silly by the pomp and pageant of marrying into your family. And if you work it right, you can maintain this supremacy for years. Treat him with a gentle firmness, and do not weep on his bosom if you detect the aroma of beer and bologna sausage on his young breath. Bologna and royalty do not seem to harmonize first rate, but remember, you can harass your husband if you choose, so that he will fall to even lower depths than Bologna and Milwaukee beer. Do not aggravate him when he comes home tired, but help him do the chores and greet him with a smile. I'd just as soon tell you, Beatrice, that this smile racket is not original with me. I read it in a paper. This paper went on to say that a young wife should always greet her husband with a smile on his return. I showed the article to my wife and suggested that it was a good scheme and hoped she would try it on me sometime. She said if I would like to change off a while and take my smile when I got home instead of taking it downtown, we would make the experiment. The trouble with the average woman of the age in which we live, Beatrice, is that she is above her business. She tries to be superior to her husband, and in many instances she succeeds. That is the bane of wedded life. Do not strive to be superior to your husband, Beatrice. If you do, it is goodbye, John. Treat him well at all times, whether he treats you well or not. Then, when your mother gets tired of raining and wants to come down and spend the hot weather with you, she will be kindly greeted by her son-in-law. Do not allow the fact that you belong to the royal family to interfere with your fun, Beatrice. If you want to wear a Mother Hubbard dress on the throne during hot weather, or mash a mosquito with your mother's scepter, do so. Conventionality is a humbug and a nuisance. And I'd just as soon tell you right here that if I could have gone to your wedding and worn a linen coat and a perspiration, I would have gone. But to stand around there all day in a tight black suit of clothes, in a mixed crowd of dukes and counts and princes of high degree, most of whom are total strangers to me, is more than I can stand. I wish you would give my love to your mother and tell her just how it was. Make it as smooth as you can and break it to her gently. Tell her that the royal family is spreading out so that I can't leave my work every time one of its members gets married. Remember me to the Waleses, the Darmstadts, Princess Irene and Victoria, Mr. and Mrs. Prince Alexander of Bulgaria, and also Prince Francis of Battenberg and the Countess Erbach Stromberg. They will all be there probably, and so will Lord Latham and Lord Edcombe. I know just how Edcombe will snort around there when he finds that I can't be there. Give my kind regards to any other lords, dukes, duchesses, dowagers, or marchionesses who may inquire for me, and tell them all that I will be in London next year if the Prince of Wales will drop me a line stating that the moral tone of the city is such that it would be safe for me to come. End of A Letter of Regrets Venice We arrived in Venice last evening, latitude 45 degrees, 25 minutes north, longitude 12 degrees, 19 minutes east. Venice is a home of the Venetian, and also where the gondola has its nest and rears its young. 
It is also the headquarters for the paint known as Venetian Red. They use it in painting the town on festive occasions. This is the town where the Merchant of Venice used to do business, and the home of Shylock, a broker who shared the Venetian lamp at the corner of the Rialto and the Grand Canal. He is now no more. I couldn't even find an old neighbor near the Rialto who remembered Shylock. From what I can learn of him, however, I am led to believe that he was pretty close in his deals, and liked to catch a man in a tight place, and then make him squirm. Shylock, during the Great Panic in Venice many years ago, it is said, had a chattel mortgage on more lives than you could shake a stick at. He would loan a small amount to a merchant at 3% a month, and secure it on a pound of the merchant's liver, or by a cutthroat mortgage on his respiratory apparatus. Then, when the paper matured, he would go up to the house with a pair of scales and a pie knife and demand a foreclosure. Venice is one of the best water towns in Europe. You can hardly walk a block without getting your feet wet unless you ride in a gondola. The gondola is a long, slim hack without wheels and is worked around through the damp streets by a brunette man whose breath should be a sad framing to us all. He is called the gondolier. Sometimes he sings in a low tone of voice and in a foreign tongue. I do not know where I have met so many foreigners as I have here in Europe, unless it was in New York at the Poles. Wherever I go, I hear a foreign tongue. I do not know whether these people talk in the Italian language just to show off or not. Perhaps they prefer it. London is the only place I visited where the Boston dialect is used. London was originally settled by adventurers from Boston. The blood of some of the royal families of Massachusetts may be found in the veins of London people. Well, the young ladies in Venice do not run away with the coachmen. There are no coaches, no coachmen, and no horses in Venice. There are only four horses in Venice, and they are made of copper and exhibited at St. Mark's as curiosities. The Accademia del Bel Arti of Venice is a large picture store where I went yesterday to buy a few pictures for Christmas presents. A painting by Titian, the Italian prang, pleased me very much, but I couldn't beat down the price to where it would be any object for me to buy it. Besides, it would be a nuisance to carry such a picture around with me all over the Alps, up the Rhine, and through St. Lawrence County. I finally decided to leave it and secure something less awkward to carry and pay for. The Italians are quite proud of their smoky old paintings. I have often thought that if Venice would run less to art and more to soap, she would be more apt to win my respect. Art is all right to a certain extent, but it can be run in the ground. It breaks my heart to know how lavish nature has been with water here, and yet how the Venetians scorn to investigate its benefits. When a gondolier gets a drop of water on him, he swoons. Then he lies in a kind of coma till another gondolier comes. Section 91 of Remarks. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Remarks by Bill Nye. Section 91. She kind of coaxed him. I never practiced law very much, but during the brief period that my sheet-iron sign was kissed by the Washoe Zephyr, I had several odd experiences. I'm sure that lawyers who practice for forty years, especially on the frontier or in new country, could write a large book that would make mighty interesting reading. One day I was figuring up how much a man could save in ten years, paying forty dollars a month in rent, and taking in $2.50 per month, when a large man with a sad eye and an early purple tumor on the side of his head 
came in and asked me if my name was Nye. I told him it was, and I asked him to take a chair and spit on the stove a few times and make himself entirely at home. He did so. After answering in a loud, tremulous tone of voice that we were having rather a backward spring, he produced a red cotton handkerchief and took out of it a deed which he submitted to my ripe and logical legal mind. I asked him if that was his name that appeared in the body of the deed as grantor. He said it was. I then asked him why his wife had not signed it, as it seemed to be the homestead, and her name appeared in the instrument with that of her husband, but her signature wasn't at the foot, though his name was duly signed, witnessed, and acknowledged. Well, said he, there's where the gazelle comes in. He then took a bite off the corner of a plug of tobacco about as big as a railroad land grant and laid two twenty-dollar gold pieces on the desk near my arm. I took them and tapped them together like the cashier of the Bank of England and, disguising my annoyance over the little episode, told him to go on. Well, said the large man, fondling the wen which nestled lovingly in his faded Titian hair. My wife has conscientious scruples against signing that deed. We have been married about a year now, but not actively for the past eleven months. I'm kind of ex officio husband, as you might say. After we'd been married about a month, a little incident occurred which made a riffle, as you might say, in our domestic tide. I was division master on the U.P., and one night I got an order to go down toward Sydney and look at a bridge. Of course, I couldn't get back till the next evening. So I sighed and switched off to the superintendent's office, expecting to go over on number four and look at the bridge. At the office, they told me that I needn't go till Tuesday. So I strolled uptown and got home about nine o'clock, went in with a latch key, just as a mutual friend went out through the bedroom window, taking a sash that I paid two dollars for. I didn't care for the sash, because he left a pair of pantaloons worth twelve dollars and some silver in the pockets but I thought it was such odd taste for a man to wear a sash without his uniform. Well, as I had documentary evidence against my wife, I told her she could take a vacation. She cried a good deal, but it didn't count. I suffered a good deal, but tears did not avail. It takes a good deal of damp weather to float me out of my regular channel. She spent the night packing her trousseau, and in the morning she went away. Now, I could get a divorce and save all this trouble of getting her signature, but I'd rather not tell this whole business in court, for the little woman seems to be trying to do better, and if it wasn't for her blamed old hyena of a mother, would get along tip-top. She's living with her mother now, and if a lawyer would go to the girl and tell her how it is, and that I want to sell the property and want her signature in place of getting a divorce, I believe she'd sign. Would you mind trying it? I said, if I could get time, I would go over and talk with her and see what she said. So I did. I got along pretty well, too. I found the young woman at home and told her the legal aspects of the case. She wouldn't admit any of the charges, but after a long parley, agreed to execute the deed and save trouble. She came to my office an hour later and signed the instrument. I got two witnesses to the signature and had just put the notarial seal on it when the girl's mother came in. 
She asked her daughter if she had signed the deed, and was told that she had. She said nothing, but smiled in a way that made my blood run cold. If a woman were to smile on me that way every day, I should certainly commit some great crime. I was just congratulating myself on the success of the business, and was looking at the two twenty-dollar gold pieces, and trying to get acquainted with them, as it were, after the two women had gone away. When they returned, with the husband and the son-in-law at the head of the procession, he looked pale and careworn to me. He asked me in a low voice if I had a deed there executed by his wife. I said yes. He then asked me if I would kindly destroy it. I said I would. I would make deeds and tear them up all day at forty dollars apiece. I said I liked the conveyancing business very much, and if a client felt like having a grand warranty deed debauch, I was there to furnish the raw material. I then tore up the deed, and the two women went quietly away. After they had gone, my client, in an absent-minded way, took out a large quid that had outlived its usefulness, lay it tenderly on the open page of Estes pleadings, and said, You doubtless think I am a singular organization, and that my ways are past finding out. I wish to ask you if I did right a moment ago. Here he took out another twenty dollars and put it under the paperweight. When I went downstairs, I met my mother-in-law. She always looked to me like a firm woman, but I did not think she was so unswerving as she really was. She asked me in a low, musical voice to please destroy the deed and then she took one of them Smith & Wesson automatic advance agents of death out from under her apron, and kind of wheedled me into saying I would. Now, did I do right? I want a candid legal opinion, and I'm ready to pay for it. I said he did perfectly right. Answering an Invitation Hudson, Wisconsin, January 19th, 1886. Dear friend, I have just received your kind and cordial invitation to come to Washington and spend several weeks there among the eminent men of our proud land. I would be glad to go, as you suggest, but I cannot do so at this time. I am passionately fond of mingling with the giddy whirl of good society. I hope you will not feel that my reason for declining your kind invitation is that I feel myself above good society. I assure you I do not. Nothing pleases me better than to dress up and mingle among my fellow men, with a sprinkling here and there of the other sex. It is true that the most profitable study for mankind is man, but we should not overlook woman. Woman is now seeking to be emancipated. Let us put our great, strong arms around her and emancipate her. Even if we cannot emancipate but one, we shall not have lived entirely for naught. I am told by those upon whom I can rely that there are hundreds of attractive young women throughout our joyous land who have arrived at years of discretion and yet who have never been emancipated. I met a woman on the cars last week who was lecturing on this subject, and she told me all about it. Now the question at once presents itself, how shall we emancipate woman unless we go where she is? We must go right into society and take her by the hand and never let go of her hand till she is properly emancipated. Not only must she be emancipated, but she must be emancipated from her present thraldom. 
thraldom of this kind is liable to break out in any community. And those who are now in perfect health may pine away in a short time and flicker. My course, while mingling in society's mad whirl, is to first open the conversation with a young lady by leading her away to the conservatory, where I ask her if she has ever been the victim of thraldom, and whether or not she has ever been ground under the heel of the tyrant man. I then time her pulse for thirty minutes so as to strike a good average. The emancipation of woman is destined at some day to become one of our leading industries. You also ask me to kindly leave the German while there. I would cheerfully do so, but owing to the wobbly eccentricity of my cyclone leg, it would be sort of a broken German. But I could sit nearby and watch the game with a furtive glance and fan the young ladies between the acts, and converse with them in low, earnest, passionate tones. I like to converse with people in whom I take an interest. I was conversing with a young lady one evening in a recherche ball in my faraway home in the free and unfettered West, a very brilliant affair, I remember, under the auspices of Who's Company Number 2. I was talking in a loud and earnest way to this liquid-eyed creature, a little louder than usual, because the music was rather forte just then, and the bass viola virtuoso was bearing on rather hard at the moment. The music ceased with a sudden snort, and so did my wife, who was just waltzing past us. If I had ceased to converse at the same time that the music shut off. All might have been well, but I did not. Your remark that the President and Cabinet would be glad to see me this winter is ill-timed. There have been times when it would have given me much pleasure to visit Washington, but I did not vote for Mr. Cleveland, to tell the truth, and I know that if I were to go to the White House and visit even for a few days— he would reproach me and throw it up to me. It is true I did not pledge myself to vote for him, but still I would hate to go to a man's house and eat his popcorn and use his smoking tobacco after I voted against him and talked about him as I have about Cleveland. No, I can't be a hypocrite. I am right out, open and above board. If I talk about a man behind his back, I won't go and gorge myself with his victuals. I was assured by parties in whom I felt perfect confidence that Mr. Cleveland was a moral leper, and replying on such assurances from men in whom I felt that I could trust, and not being at that time where I could ask Mr. Cleveland in person whether he was or was not a moral leper as aforesaid, I assisted in spreading the report that he had been exposed to moral leprosy, and as near as I could learn, he was liable to come down with it at any time. So, that even if I go to Washington, I shall put up at a hotel and pay my bills just as any other American citizen would. I know how it is with Mr. Cleveland at this time. When the legislature is in session there, people come in from around Buffalo with their butter and eggs to sell, and stay overnight with the president. But they should not ride a free horse to death. I may not be well educated, but I am high strung till you can't rest. Groceries are just as high in Washington as they are in Philadelphia. I hope that you will not glean from the foregoing that I have lost my interest in national affairs. God forbid. Though not in the political arena myself, my sympathies are with those who are. I am willing to assist the families of those who are in the political arena, trying to obtain a precarious livelihood thereby. I was once an official under the federal government myself 
as the curious student of national affairs may learn if he will go to the treasury department at washington d c and ask to see my voucher for nine eighty five covering salary as united states commissioner for the second judicial district of wyoming for the year eighteen eighty two it was at that time that a vile contemporary characterized me as a corrupt and venal federal official who had fattened upon the hard-wrung taxes of my fellow citizens and gorged myself for years at the public crib. This was unjust. Section 92 of Remarks. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Remarks by Bill Nye. Section 92. Streetcars and Curiosities. There is an institution in Boston which the Pilgrim Fathers did not originate. That is the streetcar. There is a streetcar parade all day in Washington Street, and a red light procession most of the night. People told me that I can get into a car and go anywhere I wanted to. I tried it. There was a point in Boston, I learned, where there were some more relics that I hadn't seen. Parties told me where I could find some more fragments of the Mayflower, and an old chair in which Josiah Quincy had sat down to think. There were also a few more low-priced flintlock guns and tomahawks that no man who visited Boston could afford to miss. Besides, there was said to be the lock that used to be on the door of a room in which General Washington had a good notion to write his farewell address. All these things were in the collection which I started out to find, and there were others also. For instance, there was a specimen of the lightning that Franklin caught in his demijohn out of the sky, and still in a good state of preservation. Also, some more clothes in which he was baptized. More swords of Bunker Hill, and a little shirt which John Hancock put on as soon as he was born. Hancock was a perfect gentleman from his birth, and it is said that the first thing he did was to excuse himself for a moment and then put on this shirt. His manners were certainly very agreeable, and he was very much polished. I heard, too, that there was an acorn from the tree in which Benedict Arnold had his nest while he was hatching treason. I did not believe it, but I had an idea I could readily discover the fraud, if I can only see the acorn, for I am a great historian and researcher from a way back. I was told that in this collection there was a suspender button shed by Patrick Henry during his memorable speech in which he raised up to his full height on his hind feet and permitted the war to come in italics, also in small caps and in large caps with three astonishers on the end. So I wanted to find this place, and as I had plenty of means, I decided to ride in a streetcar. Therefore, I aimed my panic price keen at the driver of a cream-colored car with a blue stomach and remarked, Hi there. Before I go any further, and in order to avoid ambiguity, let me say that it was the car that had the blue stomach. He, the driver, twisted the brake, and I went inside, clear to the farther end, and sat down by the side of a young woman who filled the whole car with sunshine. I was so happy that I gave the conductor half a dollar and told him to keep the change. If by chance she sees this, I hope she still remembers me. Pretty soon a very fat woman came into the car and aimed for our quarter. She evidently intended to squat between this fair girl and myself. But, ah, I thought to myself in a low tone of voice, I will fool thee. So I shoved my person along in the seat toward the sweet girl of the Bay State. 
the corpulent party whose name i did not learn had in the meantime backed up to where she had detected a slight vacancy and where i had seen fit to place myself at that moment she heaved a sigh of relief and assisted by the motion of the car which just then turned a corner she sat down in my lap and nestled in my bosom like a tired baby elephant dear reader if i were to tell you that the crystal of my watch was picked out from under my shoulder blades the next day you would not believe it would you i will not strain your faith in me by making the statement but that was the heaviest woman i ever held while all this was going on i lost track of my location the car began to squirm all over boston and finally the conductor came back and wanted more money i said no i would get off and try a dark red car with a green stomach for a while so i did i rode on that till i had seen a great deal of new scenery and then i asked the conductor if he passed number clankety clank blank street he said he did not but if i would go down two blocks further and take a maroon car with a plaid stomach it would take me to the corner of what do you call it and what's his name streets where if i took a seal brown car with squished huckleberry trimmings it would take me to where i wanted to go so i tried it i do not know just where i missed my train but when i found the seal brown car with the squunched huckleberry trimmings it was going the other way and it was late so i went into a cafe and refreshed myself when i came out i discovered that it was too late to see the collection even if i could find it for at six o'clock they take the relics in and put them into a refrigerator till morning i was now weary and somewhat disappointed so i desired to get back to my headquarters wherein i could rest and where i could lock myself up in my room so no prize fat woman could enter i hailed one of those sawed-off landos consisting of two wheels one door behind and a bill for two bits i told the college graduate on the box where i wanted to go gave him a quarter and got in i sat down and heaved a chaste sigh the sigh was only half hove when the herdic backed up to my destination which was about three hundred feet from where i got in as the crow flies when i go to boston again i'm going in charge of the police the street railway system of boston is remarkably perfect fifty cars pass a given point on washington street in an hour and yet there are no blockades you can take one of those cars if you are a stranger and you can get so mixed up that you will never get back and all for five cents i felt a good deal like the man who was full and who stepped on a man who was not full the sober man was mad and yelled out see here condemn it can't you look where you're walking bet your life says the inebriate but trouble is to walk where i'm looking the poor blind pig i have just been over to the falls of minnehaha in fact i have been quite a tourist and summer resorter this season having saturated my system with nineteen different styles of mineral water in wisconsin alone and try to win the attention of nineteen different styles of head waiters at these summer hotels i may add in passing that the summer hotels of wisconsin and minnesota have been crowded full the past season and more room will have to be added before another season comes around the motto of the summer hotel seems to be unless ye shall feed the waiter behold ye shall in no wise be fed many waiters at these places by a judicious system of blackmail and starvation have reduced the guest to a sad state the mineral water of wisconsin ranks high as a beverage many persons are using it during the entire summer in place of rum 
the water of waukesha does not appear to taste of any mineral although an analysis shows the presence of several kinds of groceries in solution the water at palmyra springs also tastes like any other pure water but at kankana on the fox river they have a style of mineral water which is different almost as soon as you taste it you discover that it is extremely different Colonel Wartress of the Milwaukee Sunday Telegraph took some of it. I saw him afterward. He looked depressed and told me that he had been deceived. Several Kinkana people had told him that this was a living water. He had discovered otherwise. He hated to place his confidence in people and then find it misplaced. A favorite style of Kankana revenge is to drink a quart of this water, and then, on meeting an enemy, to breathe on him and wither him. One breath produces syncope, and blind staggers. Two breaths induce coma, and metallic casket for one. Minnehaha is not mineral water. It is just plain water, giving itself away, day after day, like a fresh young man in society. If you want pure water, you get it at the spring near the foot of the fall. And if you want it flavored, with something that will leave a blazed road the whole length of your alimentary canal, you go to the blind pig, a few rods away from the falls. The blind pig draws many people to the falls through sympathy. To be blind must indeed be a sad plight. Let us pause and reflect on this proposition. By good fortune, I have had the chance to watch the rum problem in all its phases this summer, beginning in Maine, where the most ingenious methods of whipping the devil around the stump are adopted, then going through northern Iowa and tasting her exhilarating pop, and at last paying ten cents to see the blind pig in Minnehaha. I feel like one who has wrestled with the temperance problem in a practical way, and I have about decided that a high license is about the only way to make the sale of whiskey odious. Prohibition is too abrupt in its methods, and one generation can hardly wipe out the appetite for liquor that has been planted and fostered by fifty preceding generations. For fear that a few of my lady readers do not know what the Minnehaha blind pig looks like, and that they may be curious about it, I will just say that it is a method of evading the law, and consists of a dumbwaiter, wherein, if you pay ten cents, you get a glass of stimulants without the annoyance of conversation. Many ladies who visit the falls and who have heard incidentally about the blind pig, express a desire to see the poor little thing, but their husbands generally persuade them to refrain. Minnehaha is a beautiful waterfall. It is not so frightfully large and grand as Niagara, but it is very fine. And if the state of Minnesota would catch the man who nails his signs on the trees around there, and choke him to death near the falls on a pleasant day, a large audience would attend with much pleasure. I believe that the fence board advertiser is not only, as a rule, wicked, but he also lacks common sense. Who ever bought a liver pad or a corset because he read about it on a high board fence? No one. Who ever purchased a certain kind of pill or poultice, because the name of that pill or poultice was nailed on a tree, to disfigure a beautiful landscape. I do not believe that any sane human being ever did so. If everyone feels as I do about it, people would rather starve to death for pills and freeze to death in a perfect wilderness of liver pads than by of the man who daubs the fair face of nature with names of his alleged goods. I saw a squaw who seemed to belong in the picture of the poetic little waterfall. I did not learn her name. 
it was one of these long corduroy sioux names that hang together with hyphens like a lot of sausage the salaried humorist of the party said he never saw such a name before translated into our tongue it meant Section 93 of Remarks. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Remarks by Bill Nye. Section 93. Daniel Webster. I presume that Daniel Webster was as good an offhand speaker as this country has ever produced. Massachusetts has been well represented in Congress since that time, but she has had few who could successfully compete with Daniel Webster, Esquire, attorney and counselor at law, Boston, Mass. I have never met Mr. Webster, but I have seen a cane that he used to wear, and since that time I have felt a great interest in him. It was a heavy winter cane, and was presented to him as a token of respect. This reminds me of an inscription on a gravestone in the 280-year-old churchyard at La Pointe on Lake Superior, where I was last week. It shows what punctuation has done for a lost and undone race. I copy the inscription exactly as it appears. Louis Roche de Jew, shot as a mark of esteem by his brother. Daniel Webster had one of the largest and most robust brains that ever flourished in our fair land. It was what we frequently call a teeming brain, one of those four-horse teeming brains, as it were. Mr. Webster wore the largest hat of any man then in Congress, and other senators and representatives used to frequently borrow it to wear on the 2nd of January, the 5th of July, and after other special occasions, when they had been in executive session most all night and endured great mental strain. This hat matter reminds me of an incident in the life of Benjamin F. Butler, a man well known in Massachusetts, even at the present time. One evening at a kind of reception or some such dissipation as that, while Jim Nye was in the Senate, the latter left his silk hat on the lounge with the opening turned up, and while he was talking with someone else, Mr. Butler sat down in the hat with so much expression that it was a wreck. Everyone expected to see James W. Nye walk up and smite Benjamin F. Butler, but he did not do so. He looked at the chaotic hat for a minute more in sorrow than in anger, and then he said, Benjamin, I could have told you that hat wouldn't fit you before you tried it on. Daniel Webster's brain was not only very large, but it was in good order all the time. Sometimes nature bestows large brains on men who do not rise to great prominence. Large brains do not always indicate great intellectual power. These brains are large, but of an inferior quality. A schoolmate of mine used to wear a hat that I could put my head and both feet into with perfect ease. I remember that he tied my shirt one day while I was laying my well-rounded limbs in the mill pond near my childhood's home. I was mad at the time, but I could not lick him, for he was too large. All I could do was to patiently untie my shirt while my teeth chattered, then fling a large three-cornered taunt in his teeth and run. He kept on poking fun at me, I remember, till I got dressed, and alluded incidentally to my small brain and abnormal feet. This stung my sensitive nature, and I told him that if I had such a wealth of brain as he had, and it was of no use to think with, I would take it to a restaurant and have it breaded. Then I went away. But we were speaking of Mr. Webster. Many lawyers of our day would do well to read and study the illustrious example of Daniel Webster. 
He did not sit in court all day with his feet on the table and how we object, and then down his client for fifty dollars just because he had made a noise. I employed a lawyer once to bring suit for me to recover quite a sum of money due me. After years of assessments and toilsome litigation, we got a judgment. He said to me that he was anxious to succeed with the case, mainly because he knew I wanted to vindicate myself. I said, yes, that was the idea exactly. I wanted to be vindicated. So he gave me the vindication and took the judgment as a slight testimonial of his own sterling worth. When I want to be vindicated again, I will do it with one of those self-cocking vindicators that you carry in a pocket. Looking over this letter, I am amazed to see the amount of valuable information relative to the life of Mr. Webster that I have succeeded in using. There are, of course, some minor details of Mr. Webster's life which I have omitted, but nothing of real importance. The true history of Mr. Webster is epitomized here and told in a pleasing and graceful manner, a style that is at once accurate and just and still elegant, chaste and thoroughly refined, while at the same time there are little gobs of sly humor in it that are real cute. Two Ways of Telling It I remember one sunny day in summer we were sitting in the boomerang office, I and the city editor, and he was speaking enviously of my salary of $150 per month as compared with his of $80, and I had just given him the venerable minstrel witticism that of course my salary was much larger than his, but he ought not to forget that he got his. Just then there was a revolver shot at the foot of our stairs, and then another. The printers rushed into the stairway from the composing room, and to save time, I ran out on the balcony that hung over the sidewalk, and which gave me a bird's-eye view of the murder. The next issue of the paper contained an account about like this. Cold-blooded murder, yesterday between twelve o'clock and one o'clock, in front of this office on Second Street, James McKeon, in a manner almost wholly unprovoked, shot James Smith, commonly known as Windy Smith. Smith died at two o'clock this morning of his wounds. Wendy Smith was not a bad man, but, as his nickname would imply, he was a kind of noisy, harmless fellow, and McKeon, who was a gambler and professional bad man, can give no good reason for the killing. There was a determined effort on foot to lynch the murderer. This account was brief, but it seemed to set forth the facts pretty clearly, I thought, and I felt considerably chagrined when I saw an account of the matter later on, as written up, by the prosecuting attorney. I may be inaccurate as to the dates and some other points of detail, but as nearly as I can remember, his version of the matter was like this. The Territory of Wyoming, County of Albany, that is to say, in Justice Court before E. W. Nye Esquire, Justice of the Peace. The Territory of Wyoming, Plaintiff versus James McKeon, Defendant, complaint. The above-named defendant, James McKeon, is accused of the crime of murder for that he, the said defendant, James McKeon, at the town of Laramie City in the county of Albany and Territory of Wyoming, and on the 13th day of July, Anno Domini, 1880, then and there being, he, the said defendant, James McKeon, did willfully, maliciously, feloniously, wickedly, unlawfully, criminally, illegally, unjustly, premeditatedly, coolly, and murderously, by means of a certain deadly weapon, commonly called a Smith & Wesson revolver, or revolving pistol, so constructed as to revolve upon itself and to be discharged by means of a spring and hammer, and with six chambers thereto, and known commonly as a self-cocker, the same loaded with gunpowder and leaden bullets, and in the hands of him, the said defendant, James McKeon, level at, to, upon, by, contiguous to, and against the body of one James Smith, commonly called Windy Smith, in the peace of the commonwealth then and there being, and that, by means of said deadly weapon, commonly called a Smith & Wesson revolver, 
or revolving pistol so constructed as to revolve upon itself and to be discharged by means of a spring or hammer and with six chambers thereto and known commonly as a self-cocker the same loaded with gunpowder and leaden bullets and in the hands of him the said defendant james mckeon held at to upon by contiguous to and against the body of him the said james smith commonly called windy smith he the said james mckeon did willfully maliciously feloniously wickedly fraudulently virulently unlawfully criminally illegally brutally unjustly premeditatedly coolly and murderously of his malice aforethought with the deadly weapon aforesaid held in his right hand of him the said defendant james mckeon to at against etc the body of him the said james smith commonly called windy smith he the said defendant james mckeon at the said town of laramie city in the said county of albany and in the heretofore enumerated territory of wyoming and on the here and before mentioned thirteenth day of july anno domini eighteen eighty did inflict to at upon by contiguous to adjacent to adjoining over and against the body of him the said james smith commonly called windy smith one certain deadly mortal dangerous and painfully wound to wit over against to at by upon contiguous to near adjacent to and bisecting the intestines of him the said james smith commonly called windy smith by reason of which he the said james smith commonly called windy smith did in great agony linger and lingering did die on the fourteenth day of july anno domini eighteen eighty at two o'clock in the forenoon of said day contrary to the statutes in such case made and provided and against the peace and dignity of the territory of wyoming i am now convinced that although the published account was correct it was not as full as it might have been perhaps the tendency of modern journalism is to epitomize too much in the hurry of daily newspaper work and the press of matter upon our pages very likely we are fatally Section 94 of Remarks. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Remarks by Bill Nye. Section 94. All About Menials. The subject of meals, lunch counters, dining cars, and buffet cars came up the other day, incidentally. I had ordered a little breakfast in the buffet car, not so much because I expected to get anything, but because I like to eat in a car and have all the other passengers glaring at me. I do not know which affords me the most pleasure, to sit for a photograph and be stabbed in the cerebellum with a cast-iron prong, or to be fed in the presence of a mixed company of strangers, or to be called on without any preparation to make a farewell speech on the gallows. However, I got my breakfast after a while. The waiter was certainly the most worthless, trifling, half-asleep combination of Senegambian stupidity and poor white trash indolence and awkwardness that I ever saw. He brought in everything except what I wanted, and then wound up by upsetting the little cream pitcher in my lap. He did not charge for the cream. He threw that in. So all the rest of the journey I was trying to eradicate a cream dado from my pantaloons. It made me mad, because those pantaloons were made for me by request. Besides, I haven't got pantaloons to squander in that way. To some, a pair of pantaloons more or less is nothing, but it is much to me. There was a porter on the same train who was much the same kind of furniture as the waiter. He slept days and made up berths all night. Truly he began making up berths at Jersey City, 
and when he got through about daylight it was time to begin to unmake them again all night long i can hear opening and shutting the berths like a concertina he sang softly to himself all night you must camp a little in the wilderness and then we'll all go home he played his own accompaniment on the berths when in repose he was generally asleep with a whisk broom in one hand and the other hand extended with the palm up waiting for a dividend to be declared he generally slept with his mouth open so that you could read his innermost thoughts and when i complained to him about the way my bunk felt he said he was sorry and wanted to know which cell i was in i rode years ago over a new stage line for several days it was through an almost trackless wilderness and the service hadn't been expedited then it was not a star route anyhow the government seemed to think that the man who managed the thing ought not to expect help so long as he had been such a fool asterisk it five minutes intermission for those who wished to be chloroformed the stage consisted of a buckboard it was one of the first buckboards ever made and the horse was among the first turned out also the driver and myself were the passengers when it got to be about dinner time i asked him if we were not pretty near the dinner station he grunted he hadn't said a word since we started he was a surly morose and taciturn man i was told that he had been disappointed in love a half-breed woman named no way no had led him to believe that she loved him and that if it had not been for her husband she would gladly have been the driver's bride so the driver assassinated the disagreeable husband of no way no then he went to the ranch to claim his bride but she was not there she had changed her mind and married a cattleman who had just moved on to the range with a government mule and a branding iron intending to slowly work himself into the stock business so this driver was a melancholy man he only made one remark to me during that long forty-mile drive through the wilderness about dinner time he drove the horse under a quaking asp tree tied a nose-bag of oats over its head and took a wad of bread and bacon from his greasy pocket the bacon and bread had little flakes of smoking tobacco all over it because he carried his grub and tobacco in the same pocket for a moment he introduced one corner of the bacon and bread in among his whiskers then he made the only remark that he uttered while we were together he said partner dinner is now ready in the dining car a powerful speech i once knew a man who was nominated by his fellow citizens for a certain office and finally elected without having expended a cent for that purpose he was very eccentric but he made a good officer when he heard that he was nominated he went up as he said into the mountains to do some assessment work on a couple of claims he got lost and didn't get his bearings until a day or two after election then he came into town hungry greasy and ragged but unpledged he found that he was elected and in answer to a telegram started off for frisco to see a dying relative he did not get back till the first of january then he filed his bond and sailed into the office he fired several sedentary deputies who had been in the place twenty years just because they were good workers that is they were good workers at the polls they saved all their energies for the campaign and so they only had vitality enough left to draw their salaries during the balance of the two years this man raised the county script from sixty to ninety-five in less than two years and still they busted him in the next convention he was too eccentric one delegate asked what in sam hill would become of the country if every candidate should skin out during the campaign and rusticate in the mountains while the battle was being fought says he i am a delegate from the precinct of rawhide butts and i calculate i know what i'm talking about 
gentlemen of the convention, just suppose that everybody from the President of the United States down was to get the nomination and then light out like a house of fire and never come back till it was time to file his bond. What's going to become of us common drunkards to whom election is an oasis in the Badlands, an orange grove in the Alkali Flats? Mr. Chairman, there's millions of dollars in this broad land waiting for the high tide of election day to come and float them down to where you and I, Mr. Chairman, as well as other parched and patriotic inebriates, can get a hold of them. Gentlemen, we talk about stringency and shrinkage of values and all such funny business as that, but that's something I don't know a blame thing about. What I can grapple with is this. If our county offices are worth $30,000, and there are little after-claps and soft snaps and walkovers worth, say, $10,000, and the boys, say, are willing to do the fair thing, say, blow in 15% to that central committee and what they feel like on the outside, then politics, instead of a burden and a reproach, becomes a pleasing duty, a joyous occasion, and a picnic to those whose lives might otherwise be a dreary monotone. Mr. Chairman, the past two years has wrecked four campaign saloons, and a tenor who socked his wife's fortune into campaign torches is now in a land where torchlight is no good. Overcome by a dull market, a financial depression, and a reserved central committee, he ate a package of rough on rats and passed up the flume. He is now at rest over yonder. Such instances would be common if we encouraged the eccentric economy of official cranks. It is an evil that is gnawing at the vitals of the Republic. We must squench or get left. There are millions of dollars in this country, Mr. Chairman, that if we keep it out of the campaign, will get into the hands of the working classes. And then you and I, Mr. Chairman, and gentlemen of the convention, can starve to death. Keep the campaign money away from the soulless hired man, gentlemen, or goodbye, John. Mr. Chairman, excuse my emotions. It is almighty seldom that I make a speech, but when I do, I strive to get there with both feet. We must either work the campaign funds into their legitimate channels, or every blamed patriot within the sound of my voice will have to fasten on a tin bill and rustle for angleworms amongst the hens. You hear me? Terrific. Section 95 of Remarks. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Remarks by Bill Nye. Section 95. A Goat in a Frame. Laramie has a seal-brown goat with iron-gray chin whiskers and a breath like new-mown hay. He has not had as hard a winter as the majority of stock on the Rocky Mountains, because he is of a domestic turn of mind and tries to make man his friend. Though social in his nature, he never intrudes himself on people after they have intimated, with a shotgun, that they are weary of him. When the world seems cold and dark to him, and everybody turns coldly away from him, he does not steal away by himself and die of corroding grief. He just lies down on the sidewalk in the sun and fills the air with the seductive fragrance of which he is the sole proprietor. One day, just as he had eaten his midday meal of boot heels and cold sliced atmosphere and kerosene barrel staves, he saw a man going along the street with a large looking-glass under his arm. The goat watched the man, and saw him set the mirror down by a gate, and go inside the house after some more things that he was moving. Then the goat stammered with his tail a few times, and went up to see if he could eat the mirror. When he got pretty close to it, he saw a hungry-looking goat apparently coming toward him, so he backed off a few yards and went for him. 
there was a loud crash and when the man came out he saw a full-length portrait of a goat with a heavy black walnut frame around it going down the street with a great deal of apparent relish then the man said something derogatory about the goat and seemed offended about something goats are not timid in their nature and are easily domesticated there are two kinds of goat the cashmere goat and the plain goat the former is worked up into a cashmere shawl and cashmere bouquet the latter is not the cashmere bouquet of commerce is not made of the common goat it is a good thing that it is not a goat that has always been treated with uniform kindness and never betrayed may be taught to eat out of the hand also out of the flour barrel or the ice cream freezer to a married man adelbert g grimes writes as follows i am a young man not twenty-two years of age i am said to be rather attractive in appearance and a fluent conversationalist three years ago i foolishly married and settled on a tree claim in dakota where we have three children consisting of one pair of twins and an ordinary child born by itself we are a considerable distance from town and to remain at home during the winter with no company besides my wife and children is very irksome especially as my wife has never had the advantages that i have in the way of society her conversational powers are very inferior and i cannot bear to remain at home very much so i go to town where i can meet my equals and enjoy myself i fear that this will lead to an estrangement for when i return at night my wife's nose is so red from snivelling all day that i can hardly bear to look at her if there is anything in this world that i hate it is a red-eyed red-nosed woman who sheds tears on all occasions of course all this makes me irritable and i say sharp things to her as i have a wonderful command of language at such times she surely cannot expect a young man twenty-two years old to stay at home day after day and listen to squalling children when he is still in the heyday of life with joy beaming in his eye of course i do say things to my wife that i am afterwards sorry for but i made a great mistake in marrying the woman i did and although some of my lady friends told me so at the time i did not believe it do you think i ought to bury myself on a tree claim with a woman far my inferior while i have talents that would shine in the best of society i am greatly distressed and would willingly seek a legal separation if i knew how to go about it will you kindly advise me what do you think of my penmanship i hardly know how to advise you adelbert you have got yourself into a place where you cannot do much but remain and take your medicine unfortunately there are too many such young men as you are adelbert you are young and handsome and smart you casually admit this in your letter i see you have a social nature and would shine in society you also reluctantly confess this this does not help you in my estimation adelbert if you are a bright and shining light in society you are probably a brunette fizzle as a husband when you resolve to take a tree claim and make a home in dakota why didn't you put your swallow-tail coat under the bed and retire from the giddy whirl and mad rush of society the way your wife had to i dislike very much to speak to you in a plain blunt way adelbert being a total stranger to you but when you convey the idea in your letter that you have made a great mistake in marrying at the age of nineteen and marrying far beneath yourself i am forced to agree with you if instead of marrying a young girl who didn't know any better than to believe that you were a man instead of a fractional one you had come to me and borrowed my revolver and blown out the fungus growth which you refer to as your brains you would have bit it even now it is not too late you can still come to me and i will oblige you 
you cannot do your wife a greater favor at this time than to leave her a widow, and the sooner you do, the less orphans there will be. Did it ever occur to you, Adelbert, that your wife made a mistake also? Did it ever bore itself through your adamantine skull that it is not an unbroken round of gaiety for a young girl to shut herself up in a lonesome house for three years, gradually acquiring children, and meantime being sassed by her husband because she is not a fluent conversationalist? Wherein you offend me, Adelbert, is that you persist in breathing the air which human beings and other domestic animals more worthy than yourself are entitled to. There are too many such imitation men at large. There should be a law that would prohibit your getting up and walking on your hind legs and thus imposing on other mammals. If I could run the government for a few weeks, Adelbert, I would compel your style of zoological wonder to climb a tree and stay there. So you married a woman who was far your inferior, did you? How did you do it? Where did you go to find a woman who could be your inferior and still keep out of the menagerie? Adelbert, I fear you do your wife a great injustice. With just barely enough vitality to hand your name down to posterity, and blast the fair future of Dakota by leaving your trademark on future generations, you snivel and whine over your blasted life. If your life had been blasted a little harder twenty years ago, the life of your miserable little wife would have been less blasted. If you had acquired a little more croup twenty years ago, Dakota would have been ahead. Why did you go on, year after year, permitting people to believe you were a man, when you could have undeceived them in two minutes by crawling into a hollow log and remaining there? Your penmanship is very good. It is better than your chances for a bright immortality beyond the grave. Write to me again whenever you feel lonesome or want advice. I was a young married man myself once, and I know what they have to endure. Up to the time of my marriage, I had never known a harsher tone than a flute note. My early life ran quiet as the clear brook by which I sported, and so on. I was a great belle in society also. I attended all the swell balls and parties in our county for years. Wherever you found fair women and brave men tripping the light bombastic toe, you would also find me. Section 96 of Remarks This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Remarks by Bill Nye, Section 96. To an Embryo Poet. The following correspondence is now given to the press for the first time, with the consent of the parties. William Nye, Esquire. Dear Sir, I am a young man, twenty years of age, with fair education and a strong desire to succeed. I have done some writing for the press, having written up a very nice article on progressive euchre, which was a great success and published in our home paper. But it was not copied so much in other papers as I would like to have sought. And I take my pen in hand at this time to write and ask you what there is in the article enclosed that prevents its being copied abroad, all over our broad land. I write just as I hope you would feel perfectly free to write me at any time. I think that writers ought to aid each other. Yours with kind regards, Algernon L. Tui, P.O. Box 202. I have carefully read and pondered over the dissertation on progressive euchre which you send me, Algernon and I cannot see why it should not be ravenously seized and copied by the press of the broad, wide land referred to in your letters. If you have time, 
perhaps it would be well enough to go to the leading journalists of our country and ask them what they mean by it you might write till your vertebrae fell out of your clothes on the floor and it would not do half so much good as a personal conference with the editors of america first prepare your article then go personally to the editors of the country and call them one by one out into the hall in a current of cold air and explain the article to them in that way you will form pleasant acquaintances and get solid with our leading journalists you have no idea algernon how lonely and desolate the life of a practical journalist is your fresh young face and your fresh young ways and your charming grammatical improvisations would delight an editor who has nothing to do from year to year but attend to his business do not try to win the editors of america by writing poems beginning now the merry goatlet jumps and the trifling yowler dog with the tin can madly humps like an acrobatic frog at times you will be tempted to write such stuff as this and mark it with a large blue pencil and send it to the papers of the country but that is not a good way to do seriously algernon i would suggest that you make a bold dash for success by writing things that other people are not writing thinking things that other people are not thinking and saying things that other people are not saying you will say that this advice is easier to give than to take and i agree with you but the tendency of the age is to wear the same style of collar and coat and hat that every other man wears and to talk and write like other men and to be frank with you algernon i think it is an infernal shame if you will look carefully about you you will see that the preacher who is talking mostly to dusty pew cushions is also the preacher who is thinking the thoughts of other men he is upending his barrel of sermons annually and they were made in the first place from sermons of a man who also upended his barrel annually go where the preacher is talking to full houses and you will discover that his sermons are full of humanity and originality they are not written in a library by a man with interchangeable ideas an automatic cogwheel thinker but they are prepared by a man who earnestly and honestly studies the great aching heart of humanity and full of sincerity originality and old-fashioned christianity appeals to your better impulses how is it with our poetry as a fellow traveller and seasick tourist across life's tempestuous tide i ask you algernon who is writing the poetry that will live is it the man who is sawing out and sandpapering stanzas of the same general dimensions as some other poet in which he bewails the fact that he loved a tall well-behaved accomplished girl sixteen hands high who did not require his love ah no he is not the poet whose terracotta statue will stand in the cemetery wearing a laurel wreath and a lumpy brow show me the poet who is intimate with nature and who studies the little joys and sorrows of the poor who smells the clover and writes about live healthy people with ideas and appetites he is my poet i apologize for speaking so earnestly algernon but i saw by your letter that you felt kindly toward me and rather invited an expression of opinion on my part so i have written more freely perhaps than i otherwise would we are both writers measurably so at least you write on progressive euchre and i write on anything that i can get a hold of so let us agree here and promise each other that whatever we do we will not think through the thinker of another man the great ruler of the universe has made and placed upon the earth a good many millions of men but he never made any two of them exactly alike we may differ from every one of the countless millions who have preceded us and still be safe even you and i algernon may agree in many matters and yet be very dissimilar 
at least I hope so, and I presume you do also. Eccentricities of Genius Alfonso Quanternit Dowdell, Frumenti, Ohio, writes to know something of the effects of alcohol on the brain of an adult, being evidently apprehensive that some day he may become an adult himself. He says, I would be glad to know whether or not you think that liquor stimulates the brain to do better literary work. I have been studying the personal history of Edgar A. Poe, and learned through that medium that he was in the habit of drinking a good deal of liquor at times. I also read that George D. Prentice, who wrote The Closing Year and other nice poems, was a hearty drinker. Will you tell me whether this is all true or not, and also what the effect of alcohol is on the brain of an adult? It is said on good authority that Edgar A. Poe ever and anon imbibed the popular beverages of his day and age, some of which contained alcohol. We are led to believe these statements because they remain, as yet, undenied. But Poe did a great deal of good in that way, for he set an example that has been followed ever since, more or less, by quite a number of poets' apprentices who emulated Poe's great gift as a drinker. These men, thinking that Posey and Delirium Tremens went hand in hand, became fluent drunkards early in their career, so that finally, instead of issuing a small blue volume of poems, they punctuated a drunkard's grave. So we see that Poe did a great work aside from what he wrote. He opened up a way for these men which eradicated them, and made life more desirable for those who remained. He made it easy for those who thought genius and inebriation were synonymous terms to get to the hospital early in the day, while the overworked waste basket might secure a few hours of much-needed rest. George D. Prentice has also done much toward weeding out a class of people who otherwise might have become disagreeable. It is better that these men who write under the influence of rum should fall into the hands of the police as early as possible. The police can handle them better than the editor can. Do not try, Alfonso, to experiment in this way, because Mr. Poe and Mr. Prentice could write beautiful and witty things between drinks. Do not, oh, do not imagine that you can begin that way and succeed at last. The effect of alcohol on the brain of an adult is to congest it finally. Alcohol will sometimes congest the brain of an adult under the most trying and discouraging circumstances. I have frequently known it to scorch out and paralyze the brain in cases where other experiments had not been successful in showing the presence of a brain at all. That is the reason why some people love to fool with this great chemical. It revives their suspicions regarding the presence of a brain. The habits of literary men vary a good deal, for no two of them seem to care to adopt the same plan. I have taken the liberty of showing here my own laboratory and methods of thought. This is from a drawing made by myself and represents the writer in his study in the act of thinking about a poem. Last summer I wrote a large poem entitled Moanings of the Moist Malarious Sea. I have it still. The back of it has memoranda on it in blue pencil from the leading editors of our broad land, but otherwise it is just as I wrote it. The engraving represents me in the act of thinking about the poem and what I will do with the money when I get it. I am now preparing a poem entitled The Umbrella. It is a dainty little bit of verse, and my hired man thinks it is a gem. I called it The Umbrella so that it would not be returned. By looking at the drawing, you will see the rapid change of expression on the face as the work goes on. I give the drawing in order also to show the rich furniture of the room. 
all poets do not revel in such gaudy trappings as i do but i cannot write well in a bare and ill-furnished room in these apartments there is also a window which does not show in the engraving i have tried over and over again to write a poem in a room that had no window in it but i cannot say that i ever wrote one under such circumstances that i thought i would live you can do as you think best about furnishing your room as i have mine you might of course succeed as well by writing in a plainer apartment but i could not all my poetical work that was done in the cramped and plainly furnished room that i formerly occupied over nadler's livery stable was ephemeral i got it into a few of the leading autograph albums of the country but it never got into the papers i would not use alcohol however poe and prentice could use it but i never could after a long debauch i could always work well enough on the street 